Ladies and gentlemen, if I could please ask those of you standing to please find your seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd go ahead and take your seats, please. Good morning and welcome to the 2021 International Conference on World War II's pre-conference symposium, Pearl Harbor at 80. Isn't it wonderful to be back in person again? We were talking earlier this morning about how wonderful it is to see so many of our friends back again, and uh, also very happy to see so many new people join us. So this is, it's wonderful. My name is Pete Crane, and I'm the Vice President of Education and Access here at the National World War II Museum. And it's a great pleasure for us to be hosting this event and having you all with us today. In addition to, the, to those of you loyal supporters of the museum and enthusiasts uh, who are here, at the, in New Orleans. I'd like to welcome those of you watching us at home online and also on C-SPAN. For those of you at home, we're all gathered in the Madeline and Paul Hilliard Conference Center at the museum's own beautiful Higgins Hotel. Before we get to the program, it's my privilege to continue our tradition of recognizing the people for whom this museum exists. So do we have any World War II veterans, home front workers, or Holocaust survivors in the audience. If you are, please stand or wave to be recognized. And of course, we have one right here. How about veterans of any other period? Uh, if you've ever served in the armed forces, please uh, stand or wave to be recognized. Thank you for your service to our country. I'd like to specially recognize a friend who is here with us today, Roberto Bravo, from the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, our great partners uh, and sponsor of the, uh, of the conference coming up. So thank you, Roberto. As many of you know, the idea of pro adding an additional day of programming came up in 2013 when the museum asked the question, how could we enhance an already great conference and our guests' overall experience? 
Well, we recognize that many of our, of our guests, including many of you here in the audience, were so devoted to the institution and the topic that you wanted a deeper dive, you wanted more. Uh, so we, we wanted to offer an additional day of programming and particularly dive into subjects, and so the pre-conference symposium was born. When planning this year's program, the theme of the symposium was obvious. With next month's commemoration of the 80th anniversary, yes, 80th anniversary, of the attack on Pearl Harbor, we wanted to highlight the road to Pearl Harbor as well as its impact on America then and also how we remember it today. I'm proud of this audience, all of you here this morning, for wanting to be here for this program and to continue to learn about World War II, but also to put it into a broader context. We've got a great program and lineup of speakers, not just for today, but for the whole weekend. I'm happy to start this year's conference by making an important introduction. To guide us through these three days as our, concert, as our conference master of ceremonies will be the museum's new executive director of the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, Dr. Mike Bell. Mike recently left the Department of Defense and joined the museum just a few busy weeks ago, so it's trial by fire today, folks. Following graduation from West Point, uh, Mike was commissioned in the Army's Armor Corps, uh, and having served our nation for 33 years in uniform, he retired as a full colonel. He's a combat veteran, a strategist, uh, who served the country at every level from platoon leader through Army theater. As well as U.S. Army Central Command, he was on the Joint Staff, he was seconded to the State Department, and also the White House. Mike served as Dean of Faculty and Academic Programs at the National War College, and as Chancellor of the National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs. No slacker. Mike is also a historian with a Ph.D. from the University of Maryland and his book on General John J. Pershing and the creation of the, Ar of the American staff system in World War I is forthcoming from Army Mu University Press. So, with all of that, you know Mike is gonna ride, run a tight ship and keep us on schedule throughout the whole day and weekend. But before I relinquish the podium to Mike, I just wanted to say that I look forward to engaging with all of you here. As one of you in the audience enjoying great presentations on stage and, con and conversations during the breaks. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, RMC, Dr. Mike Bell. Mike, take it away. Well, well Pete, thanks for that introduction and uh, you know, to the, to the folks here, you know, I look forward to meeting each and every one of you and, you know, over the course of this event and over the course of uh, future events. So uh, welcome to this first panel on our sy symposium celebrating the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, and uh, the event that brought the United States entry into the Second World War, an event that, that really changed the trajectory of world history. Now, I wanted to start today to, by showcasing uh, one of the jewels uh, in the museum's collection of authentic voices. I mean, you know, over these panels, we're going to hear, hear historians and authors talk about that, but we want to ensure that we capture the voices of the participants as well. So we have a, an oral history of Kermit Tyler. Uh, Kermit was among those uh, manning a radar station on December 7th. Uh, so with that, uh, please roll the video. Uh, this is not in the written record here, but uh, the, the Elliot was, the, the two of them decided to stay on, and they were supposed to be off at, at seven, actually, but, uh, and their, their uh, meal truck was late getting there, so they decided to, to uh, operate the equipment. And, Lockhart would, was somewhat experienced, so he was teaching uh, the other one what he knew about this thing. And almost immediately they had a, a, a huge blip indicating a large number of airplanes. And 
the, he thought his equipment was breaking down or something because it was so large. He didn't say how many airplanes it might be, however. And uh, they talked a bit of it about back and forth whether they should report it. So they finally agreed that they would call it in. And that, that's when I got the call at 7.15. Well, I, I, I had a friend who was a bomber pilot, and, uh, and uh, every periodically, well, they would send B-17s, like in bunches of about a dozen airplanes, to the Far East, and these were, and uh, so I thought, well, uh, this is bigger than he's ever had an opportunity to see, so it makes sense to that they must be the B-17s. As a matter of fact, I mean, although I didn't draw it out at the time, if they were as little as three degrees off their course, well, they would be where the plot appeared. In other words, it's a very slender, slender line, and for traveling uh, 14 hours, it's easy enough to, to drift off that much. So it was, I thought, well, this is, these are the B-17. As a matter of fact, the base operations officer was in the tower at, at uh, Hickam, and the base commander was down there with various other officers awaiting the arrival of the B-17s. So that was even before the, well before they arrived. However, uh, so as I sized all this up, I thought, uh, has to be the B-17s. And so I said, don't worry about it. Uh, as far as I was concerned, and, uh, nothing happened until, well, at, at around eight, 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 five after eight, I walked outside uh, and uh, looked over toward Pearl Harbor and I saw puffs of smoke, it looked like, and a, a few air, airplanes diving, dive bombing. And uh, I thought, you know, I guess the Navy must be having practice on a practice uh, alert of some kind. I mean, communication wasn't all that great between, or cooperation wasn't all that great. So, uh, at about five after eight, I got a call from Sergeant Starry at uh, Wheeler Field that the field was under attack. So I called him, told him to call in all of the plotters and resume operations. So, so as Tyler said, uh, must be B-17s or Maybe the Navy's having an exercise, you know, moment of, uh, of uh, strategic dislocation. So for many of these sessions over the next couple days, we'll be featuring other uh, oral histories in the museum's phenomenal collection. Uh, our intent is to show those a couple minutes before the start time in the program. Uh, so the announcer will say, hey, start taking your seats about five minutes before. We'll show this while we're assembling and then we'll start uh, per the calendar uh, in the schedule. So. Great opportunity to, to hear those voices and understand their perspectives uh, uh, in this process. So uh, in the interest of, uh, our, you know, Pete said I have to keep a type ship, which is kind of a joint uh, piece there. Maybe hard for an Army guy, but we're gonna ask our, our first panel to take the stage, and I can talk about them briefly uh, as they come on up. So we're. We're excited, uh, this panel, because we get to feature two of our own uh, from the museum here. The chair will be Dr. Adam Givens. He's the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency Research Partner Fellow with the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. Uh, joining him on stage is our own Dr. Rob uh, Satino. He's the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian. Certainly many of you uh, know Rob quite well. He previously also was dual-hatted as the executive director of the Institute prior to my joining this great team. 
And his claim to fame was he had the longest title of anybody at the museum. <laughs> We're also joined on the stage by longtime friend of the museum, historian Rich Frank. Rich, welcome. Allow me, though, to just to say a couple things about Adam, to introduce him uh, to the team here. Adam earned his PhD in military history from Ohio University in 2019. Uh, he joined the museum just over a year ago. He's got some great background in uh, Rand and, and other uh, places. But here at the museum, Adam's expertise is employed to augment our U.S. government effort and capabilities. Those efforts are devoted to fulfilling our nation's obligation to maximize the number of missing people that we account for. Uh, at the same time, trying to ensure that we have timely, accurate information that's provided to families. So it's really an incredible uh, service to our country, our veterans, uh, uh, and to their families. Adam's chairing this panel on the grand geopolitical military strategy in the buildup to Pearl Harbor. And this one's from the American perspective. We'll offer some other perspectives uh, throughout the day. Uh, I know this will be an interesting discussion, and so with that, I'm going to turn to Adam and say, take it away. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Mike. It's my honor to be up here today with these two accomplished scholars. Um, for a full bio of each of them, please see the conference program, but I will give them brief introductions. Thanks, Rich. Um, sitting next to me is Rich Frank. Rich has written widely on the Asia-Pacific War, most recently, and the masterful Tower of Skulls, the first volume in a trilogy on the history of the Asia-Pacific War. Rich has also been a great friend and advisor to the museum for a long time. He was a founding member of the presidential counselors. Every year he serves on the conference planning committee. He was gotcha. the okay. chief historical advisor for the Road to Tokyo Gallery here at the museum. Rich has also been a summer teacher institute professor, uh, in addition to being an integral part of many of our tours. Uh, leading things off today is Dr. Rob Satino at the end of the table. Rob will be familiar to many in the audience. He is the museum's Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian. Now, um, I assure you that title is not indicative of his age or his energy. <laughs> it takes plenty of energy to author 10 books and accumulate countless awards and accolades as Rob has. Testament to his achievements is the fact that Rob is the 2021 recipient of the Society for Military History's Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize, an award given in recognition of an entire career of contributions to the field of military history. Please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rob Satino. Thanks. Thank you so much, Adam. The, um, the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize from the uh, Society for Military History highlighted my professional career, but I would mention I th I'm here in the room. I think Con Crane is here somewhere, but I can't quite see where he There he is, way in the back. Con is also a recipient and a holder of that distinguished prize, too. So Con and I have elevated conversation when we're together. <laughs> Um, I wonder if, uh, thank you, so if we can start the slides. I think Rich and I are going to address the uh, symposium, if, if you will, from the, uh, from the table today. Um, I had to sort of think about this topic. Um, we've been talking a lot about Pearl Harbor here at the museum for the last few months because we've had this 80 days to Pearl Harbor uh, a series of, of postings on our website. And so it's been every day that we've been thinking about Pearl Harbor now for a couple of, uh, uh, for at least uh, three months. And just trying to put things into perspective and look at new, new perspectives on it has, has been in some ways a, a challenge. You never know how hard it's going to be until you do that deep, really deep dive. So um, let me begin uh, just by saying, and, and we'll put up the, the sort of classic uh, slide of, of Pearl Harbor as a bolt out of the blue, the explosion of the USS Shaw. Um, Rich knows everything about everything and can tell you a lot more about this slide than I can. The fact that the ship was in dry dock, Rich, correct? Right, At the time, right. Being, being repaired. Um, Let's just leave that one up as kind of a backdrop for a moment. I, I, I'll start with this. I don't believe in any way, shape, or form in the concept of historical inevitability. And I, I don't think many historians should believe in it. Human beings have free will. Even if they have to exercise that free will against a backdrop of, of sometimes very powerful forces. I especially don't believe in inevitability when it comes to discussing diplomacy and war. Since war is a complex and unpredictable and often chaotic phenomenon, you know, I really am a believer in the uh, teachings of the great philosopher of war, the Prussian Karl von Clausewitz. 
Uh, I, I've heard a few people say, now Rob's probably familiar to you. So if you've heard me speak before, you've heard the name Clausewitz, and you can sort of play a Clausewitz drinking game over the next few days, <laughs> I, I, I would say, at least, at least as long as I'm on, on stage, so go right ahead. Um, war, Clausewitz said, is the domain of uncertainty and unpredictability. A space where you can only assess probabilities, almost never declare a sure thing. And, and why is that? Well, because it's such a complex phenomenon. It's a mixture of raw violence, passion, and politics. And as such, it's always going to be something of a, of a gamble. You know, war, in many ways, is about as rational as a bar brawl. If you've ever been in a bar and two guys usually start going at it, and then fr from there, it's just best to get under the table because you have no idea what's going to follow next. So Clausewitz put it a little more elegantly. No other human activity, he said, is so continuously or universally bound up with chance. That's war. So to say that anything is inevitable in the highly complex environment of diplomacy and war seems uh, like a bit of a stretch to me. Now, having said that, uh, given the situation in 1941, the strategic imperatives of both the US and the Japanese Empire it is hard to see how the two countries could have avoided a war. I don't necessarily mean that Pearl Harbor in the way, shape, and form that it transpired was necessarily inevitable, but some American-Japanese war for mastery of the Pacific. And I think we can identify the point of no return, uh, beyond which there was no real avoiding a conflict, and it's the month of June 1940. So consider this kind of a short fuse analysis of Pearl Harbor leading us up to the event over oh, the last 18 months or so before it uh, transpired. So in that month, um, the people I normally write about, the German Wehrmacht, overran France and the rest of Western Europe in a lightning campaign that the US military establishment is still studying to this, to this day. Now, the President of the United States at the time, Franklin Roosevelt, was a liberal internationalist to the core, a believer in the sanctity of treaties and international cooperation. He was not, and maybe some of you may disagree, and we can, that's the beauty of Q&A, he was not pursuing a, a war policy. In his famous speech at Chautauqua, New York, and let's just advance this slide, and there he is. I, I happen to think Franklin Roosevelt is the GOAT which when I was growing up was a bad thing, the person who dropped the fly ball in the ninth inning or the person who threw the crucial interception. But now, of course, everyone knows it's Tom Brady. It's the greatest of all time. In his famous speech at Chautauqua, New York in August 1936, FDR reminded his listeners that he had seen war. It's easy to talk about when you haven't seen it. You know, I have seen blood running from the wounded. I have seen men coughing out their gassed lungs. I have seen the dead in the mud. He concluded, I hate war, as anyone should. You know, but he had long come to see Nazi Germany as a real danger to U.S. security, and June of 1940 uh, crystallized that sense. At the same time, he was trying to dissuade Japan from aggression uh, through, uh, in China through a, a series of economic sanctions. In October 1937, he had called for a quarantine versus aggressors in a Chicago speech. The peace, the freedom, and the security of 90% of the population of the world, FDR said, is being jeopardized by the remaining 10%. He went on. When a physical disease spreads, this is a very apropos talk for our own day, isn't it? The community approves and joins in a quarantine of the patients in order to protect the health of the community against the spread of the disease. Today, FDR would be reminding us to socially distance and wear our masks, I, I suppose. So he had embargoed weapon sales to Japan in uh, 1938, uh, but he knew he had to move cautiously on that front since the American people were not yet lined up behind him. And, and June 1940 changes all of that. Uh, and I would say for, uh, for essentially two reasons. It is now clear that there is a real danger to U.S. strategic interests globally. Consider it a Europe under Nazi domination, and if not outright conquest, Japanese predominance in China and thus in mainland Asia. The great land masses of Asia and Europe in unfriendly hands. 
it is an existential threat to the U.S. Global trade, access to markets, a preponderance of the world's raw materials all closed off. And that accounts, I think, for the flurry of presidential action in the next 12 months. He starts in July broadening the embargoes against Japan to include scrap iron, the basis of the Japanese uh, steelmaking industry, and aviation fuel. But he also invites the president of General Motors, William Knudsen, to the White House to discuss conversion of the U.S. economy to a wartime footing. In the fall, uh, there's, there's the Japanese rampaging through uh, China, North China, and there's the, the move uh, into uh, France and eventually into the Soviet Union on the part of the, uh, uh, part of the Germans. And there is big Bill Knudsen, uh, the, the man on the left, the tallest of the three gentlemen there, uh, the president of General Motors at the time. He's invited to the White House to discuss conversion of the U.S. economy to a wartime footing. Um, I was going to say legend has it, but it's not legend. It's, it's, an, it's a flat-out truth. Roosevelt asked uh, Mr. Knudsen, how long will it take to convert our economy to wartime production from civilian? And uh, Knudsen pulled out the, the, his computer, which in 1940 was a pencil and a scrap of paper. <laughs> That's how we did computations in those days. And, and he said, well, Mr. President, it looks like 18 months. So that would be, you know, if you're counting, that's June of 1940 to December of 1941. Knudsen said the country would essentially have its economy on a wartime footing. Now, in the fall, he really gets going. He reinstates the draft for one year only while assuring Americans your boy is not going to be sent into any foreign wars. And there's really the money quote from that fall 1940 speech. And it's a promise that Roosevelt will keep, although it seems unusual to say that, but we'll, we can talk about that when we talk about the actual attack. He decides to stage the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet from its home port in San Diego, California, to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, to project, project strength against Japan in the Pacific. And against all U.S. political traditions, st we're still reeling from this one, he decides to run for a third term as President of the United States. His opponent is a Republican, of course, Wendell Wilkie. And the campaign sees very little disagreement over foreign policy. The danger to the country is real, both candidates agree. Um, well, in a, in a battle between two candidates who are saying the same thing, I think the more effective communicator and politician wins handily, and that, of course, would be FDR, uh, carrying 38 of 48 states in the fall 1940 elections. He'll be president, I don't have to tell this gathering, literally, for the rest of his life. Now, in a December 29th speech, he rings out the old year by declaring that the time has come to take a stand. The U.S. must become the great arsenal of democracy against the dictatorships, ready to come to the aid of any free people fighting for their liberty. No man can tame a tiger, Roosevelt tells the American people, by stroking it. Democracy's fight against world conquest depends upon American rearmament. You know, the capper is, uh, you, you, everyone can take their own temperature on this. For me, the capper is the passage of the Lend-Lease Act in March of 1941. Uh, let's just leave that there for a moment. Uh, here is FDR, the great communicator, at the peak of his game, uh, talking to the American people. Let me give you an illustration, he says. Suppose my neighbor's home catches fire, and I have a length of garden hose uh, four or 500 feet away. If he can take my garden hose and connect it uh, up with his hydrant, I may help him to put out his fire. I don't say to him, hey, neighbor, my garden hose cost me $15. You have to pay me $15 for it. You know, your, house, your neighbor's house is on fire. Guess what's about to happen? Your house is going to be on fire. You may not be looking for war. As Trotsky once famously said, war may be looking for you. War may be interested in you. And Roosevelt is saying much the same sort of thing here. It's one of his classic formulations, and for my money, one of his greatest speeches. So, after June of 1940, U.S. strength is beginning to, uh, to wax. Japan's strategic position, by contrast, is deteriorating. And I'm going to say a few words about Japan. Uh, we're going to delve into that, I suppose, a bit in this panel and in other panels, but I try not to step on too many toes. Just my own thoughts. Japan's strategic position is deteriorating. Uh, China has become a quagmire, the Q word, dreaded Q word in military affairs. What was supposed to be a quick victory 
is tying up over one million Japanese troops. It's an unsustainable burden on Japan's economy. Japan needs resources to fight its war. And that's precisely why June of 1940 is such a signal moment. An apparently heaven-sent opportunity has provided itself. With the collapse of France, with Britain fighting for its life, Japan has a chance to seize the wealthy Western colonies of Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. Uh, the strategic riches of Asia beckon. For Westerners, it, it used to be spices, but, but it's not spices anymore. It's strategic military commodities. The rubber of Indochina, the tin of Malaya, oil from the Dutch East Indies, and especially that last. But Japan's first move in that direction, the occupation of the southern half of Indochina in the summer of 1941, brings a dramatic U.S. reaction this time. A freeze on Japanese assets in the U.S., and thus a de facto embargo on oil. Japan has no way to purchase American oil. It's not sometimes said an oil embargo. My reading of it, it's not technically an oil embargo. It's a freezing of assets. Japan has another strategic alternative, I suppose. And that is a mainland war with the USSR to seize resources in Siberia. But that seems out of the question to Japanese planners. Why? They had already tried it. Fighting in Inner Mongolia in August 1939 versus the Soviet army that ended in disaster for the Japanese at Nomonhan. I do love this slide. It's, it's Japanese troops marching from one piece of nowhere to another piece of, of nowhere, but really marching off to their own destruction, I, I think is, is really more to the point. And there's the actual map location. So let me, let me finish up uh, with a bit of theoretical talk, and then I'll turn it over uh, back to Adam to turn it back over to Rich. <laughs> you know, we usually think a country goes to war when it, when it thinks it can win. And, and that's intuitive, and that, that makes sense to us, and I, I, I would like to believe that's true. But I think we need to add a corollary. Uh, I'd call it the Satino corollary if 150,000 other analysts hadn't already come up with it in previous analyses. But the corollary is you go to war we, not when you think your situation is ideal, but when it looks like it's getting worse, when next year will present more serious problems than this year, when the present looks better than the future. Now, I studied German military history for a living and look no further than 1914. Germany did not think it necessarily had the 100% had, had the chance of winning the war of 1914 when it launched it, but it knew it was going to have a much more difficult time winning a war in 1915, especially as Russian rearmament got underway, and 1916 was going to be impossible. I mean, that's that said outright within the councils of the German army in 1914, and I think it applies here for the Japanese as well. And here I think we arrive at a kind of strategic inevitability. With all due respect to my mentor, Clausewitz, I see people jotting that down. Remember, we're playing a game here. Um, <laughs> here's a recipe for war. Drink, drink. <laughs> down the hatch. <laughs> here's a recipe for war. Take Japan's strong determination to win its war uh, in China. <laughs> Sensible. And FDR's equally strong determination to stop it. Add in the lure of those wealthy Western colonial empires, seemingly ripe for the picking. And as the final ingredient, and I think maybe this is the one we have neglected, be sure to add a mercilessly ticking clock, each minute representing a gain in US strength and a diminution in Japanese strength. I, I think you inevitably get a dish uh, called war. Uh, it may be called Pearl Harbor uh, as well. Um, it, it may even. It may even uh, uh, have generated the need for the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan can't match up man for man, pound for pound, ton for ton with US production and manpower, but perhaps surprise can be somewhat of an equalizer. So maybe it does add up to Pearl Harbor specifically. So arguing this or that detail, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to do it, and details is where we all live as historians. Theory can get you into some pretty treacherous waters. Uh, Detail usually comes out in, in the bar after a couple of strong adult beverages, and then people are arguing some real, you know, getting really into the weeds. But, but arguing this or that detail, I think, well, let us say the precise wording of the Hull note sent by our Secretary of State to the Japanese at the end of November. It's sometimes called an ultimatum, and it's often said that it drove the Japanese to war. But arguing that, or arguing other details of the Pearl Harbor attack, whether or not the Hull note was an ultimatum, I think it can take our eye off the true state of world affairs in late 1941. And I think what happens is we do get to this bolt out of the blue 
or not a bolt out of the blue at Pearl Harbor in December. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Um, please welcome our second speaker, Mr. Rich Frank. I'm not getting uh, any advance on my slides. Load it. They said they're loading it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, my subject is the U.S. commanders at Pearl Harbor. But before I get to the spe specifics about the uh, commanders, I need to place them in uh, important context. The first involves getting the fleet uh, to Pearl Harbor, and the second involves uh, the nature of the surprise the Japanese achieve in their attack. Uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered the Pacific Fleet to switch its base from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, first tentatively in April 1940. The purpose was the deterrence of Japan. The date is extremely significant because this was before Hitler overran Western Europe between April and June 1940 completely upsetting the world strategic balance. Roosevelt then made the movement of the fleet permanent. The commander of the Pacific Fleet at that time was Admiral J.O. Richardson. He objected to the move most vigorously. But the whole basis for his objection was that the fleet would be far more effective as a deterrent of Japan if it was left on the west coast where much superior facilities would permit a much higher degree of readiness. And contrary to later assertions, Richardson at no point raised the issue of the vulnerability of the fleet to attack while it was at Pearl Harbor, and in the extensive uh, post-war hearings about the Pearl Harbor attack, he again affirmed that that was not one of the reasons that he advanced against the move. Roosevelt fired Richardson for his objections. He then appointed uh, Admiral Husband E. Kimmel as commander of the Pacific Fleet. Now, in the second half of 1941, the relations between the U.S. and Japan became very fraught. The diplomatic exchanges became deadlocked. The U.S. was decoding and reading Japanese diplomatic traffic, but there had been no break in the main Japanese fleet code. Even without actual code breaking, however, radio intelligence uh, provided other techniques, like monitoring simply the location and volume of traffic, and this clearly disclosed that the Japanese were massing air, land, and sea units in the Far East. Given Japan's desperate need for raw materials, the obvious target was resources, and particularly the petroleum in the Dutch East Indies, which of course is now Indonesia. Washington alerted the Pacific and Asian uh, commands in a series of what were called war warning messages in November, late November. The problem with these messages was that the war warnings were generic, but when they did speak about likely targets, none of them listed Pearl Harbor. The U.S. Army Senior Intelligence Officer, Brigadier General Sherman Miles, proved to be especially inept. On 5 December, just two days before the attack, Miles proclaimed that Germany was, quote, the only Axis power capable of launching large-scale strategic offensives, unquote. Had President Roosevelt and other leaders been reading the uh, Washington Post on the morning of 7 December, before, of course, news of the attack reached the U.S., he would have found that a Gallup poll had closed out the day before. The Gallup poll had asked a representative sample of the American people, do you think the U.S. will go to war with Japan in the near future? 52% of the respondents said yes, 27% said no, and 21% declined to answer. So President Roosevelt would have been better served by the Washington Post than by Sherman Miles. <laughs> so the overall background of these events, I have to stress, is not that there was no recognition that war with Japan might be imminent, but a failure to recognize Pearl Harbor as a primary target. Now, surprise is sort of the baseline explanation for the Japanese success in the Pearl Harbor attack. But I would emphasize that the term surprise is not sort of a singular explanation, but it's really an umbrella term, and it covers three separate levels of war uh, and at four different ways by which the Japanese achieved this stunning surprise. Now, uh, Admiral Isoruko uh, Yamamoto uh, created the strategic surprise. He did this by inverting the bedrock conviction in both navies of how a Pacific war would unfold. The shared perception on both sides of the Pacific was that the correct Japanese strategy was to keep the main fleet in the Western Pacific and wait for the U.S. fleet to traverse the Central Pacific where it could suffer attrition from Japanese air uh, units and submarines. Uh, 
Yamamoto, in fact, had to overcome terrific opposition from other senior uh, officers in the Imperial Navy uh, with respect to his vision for a carrier strike on Pearl Harbor. Uh, finally, he had to threaten to resign to finally win his way. At the operational level of warfare, which is the level between uh, strategic and tactical, the Japanese achieved surprise in two different ways. Uh, first of all, Yamamoto's own vision uh, to attack Pearl Harbor contributed to the first. The Imperial Navy had never displayed the capability or the intention of projecting a major part of the fleet to the Central Pacific. We'd been monitoring Japanese uh, ex fleet exercises in the 1930s, and there was nothing in those uh, monitored exercises that showed the Japanese had any intention other than to keep the main fleet in the Western Pacific. And the second component of the operational surprise rose from the massing of six large or fleet carriers into one formation. Now, both the Imperial Navy and the U.S. Navy had recognized the enormous uh, potential of carrier offensive operations by the late 1930s. The U.S. Navy also, however, recognized the enormous vulnerability of carriers in the days before radar and effective fighter control arrangements. Up to 1941, both the U.S. Navy and the Imperial Navy had dealt with a carrier vulnerability issue by dispersion, or as the saying goes, don't put all your eggs in one basket. In April 1941, the Imperial Navy uh, created the first air fleet, which by December of that year would hold all six of Japan's large or fleet carriers. These would become the instruments for the Pearl Harbor attack. This step went unrecognized by the U.S. Navy. Now, while massing the fleet carriers in one formation created unmatched offensive naval air might, the Japanese made no parallel advance in defensive capabilities. The penalty for this would come just about six months later uh, off the island of Midway. <laughs> now, at the tactical level, the Japanese achieved uh, a tremendous level of surprise also by developing air-launched torpedoes that could be used in the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. Uh, these would sink three of the five American battleships that were sunk at Pearl Harbor. Now, the British had used torpedoes uh, against Italian uh, battleships in Toronto Harbor in November 1940, but Toronto was much deeper, about twice as deep as Pearl Harbor. And initially, it was believed that uh, there was, that didn't indicate any vulnerability to Pearl Harbor. Later, there was some indication uh, that was sent to Admiral uh, Kimmel in Pearl Harbor in June that, well, we may have torpedoes now that can be operated there, but Kimmel did not believe that that was a serious threat. So in sum, the surprise to Pearl Harbor attack uh, stemmed from three levels of war in four distinct parts. It's my view that in, in, when you understand these multiple levels of surprise, no clue about any one level of these things would have betrayed the plan for this deadly blow by mass carrier aviation. Now, I'm going to talk about the commanders themselves uh, at Pearl Harbor, but before I get to other specifics, I need to give some background. Uh, Lieutenant General Walter C. Short was the senior U.S. Army officer at the time of the attack, while her husband Kimmel was the senior naval officer. The two immediate points that arise about their situation is that first, neither was the overall commander. In other words, Washington, not Short or Kemmel, fixed the command structure as one of cooperation, not unified command. Short and Kemmel had made ad hoc arrangements for unified command, but these were not in place at the time of the attack. Second, in 1936, an in, in inter-service inter agreement on relevant roles officially made the Army responsible for protecting the fleet while it was at a base uh, within uh, uh, Army territory. That, of course, included Pearl Harbor. Now, historian Brian Lynn's uh, excellent book, uh, Guardians of Empire, uh, discussed the fact that the Hawaiian Department was the largest overseas command that the U.S. Army had between the wars. It was also potentially the one that seemed most likely to be subjected to an attack. Prior to uh, 1941, uh, there have been multiple uh, prior commanders, all of whom were recognized as outstanding field commanders. Short's background, by contrast, was in training. Specifically, he was, in effect, the Army's highest ranking expert in machine gun employment. And beyond this, Short was a uh, micromanager. And this had served him very well in his rise to his position, but now he was commanding the equivalent of an Army Corps. And a commander in that position must be an effective delegator. And that, Short, was not. Now, Roosevelt appointed the 58-year-old husband, Kemmel, uh, and elevated him over several other, senior, several other more senior admirals to command the Pacific Fleet. Some of those officers who had previously been his uh, senior uh, resigned rather than serve under Kemmel. Uh, 
Now, when Kimmel assumed command of the Pacific Fleet, it was somewhat more powerful than the battle, in battleships than the Imperial Navy. But in the spring of 1941, uh, Washington transferred about a third of the Pacific Fleet to the Atlantic to counter the German threat. This left Kemmel inferior to the Japanese fleet. Uh, during the rest of the year, most of the new construction also was uh, uh, funneled to the Atlantic Ocean. And by Pearl Harbor Day, the US fleet was split almost exactly evenly between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Now, at the Naval War College, they taught one of the principal maxims to always follow is never divide the fleet. But that's where we were in December 1941. Nonetheless, Kimmel remained very aggressive. He had a current plan that once the US was at war, he intended to conduct an audacious scheme to draw out and defeat a major portion of the Japanese fleet. A key feature of this plan was that he would need every long-range search plane that he had for effective reconnaissance, which was an absolutely uh, critical part of his plan. This is the underlying reason why no addition to his uh, inventory of uh, Catalina PBY long-range search planes uh, would have prompted him to increase defensive searches to protect Pearl Harbor, in my view. He, he clearly was offensively minded, and he needed those search planes for his offense. Now, Kemmel possessed an extremely valuable resource that Short lacked, an effective radio intelligence organization. This had been tracking Japanese fleet movements for years, even when, as was that t at the time of uh, December 1941, they were without the ability to break uh, Imperial Navy operational codes. But from 17 November 1941, his radio intelligence organization lost the Japanese carrier force and would not identify where it was again until it attacked Pearl Harbor. The Japanese also cleverly created the appearance that the carriers had remained in Japanese home waters by detaching the normal carrier radio operators to remain in Japan, creating dummy traffic. Now, because radio communications at that time were generated by the human manipulation of a telegraphic key, each operator had what was called a distinctive fist, which was readily recognizable by experienced radio operators. This created the impression that the Japanese carriers must be located where their radio men were. Now, the Navy shielded its radio intelligence under extremely severe restrictions on dissemination. As a result of this, Kemmel never informed Short that the whereabouts of Japanese carriers was unknown. But the miscommunication between Kemmel and Short was not simply a one-way street. As noted, Short was formally tasked with protecting the fleet at Pearl Harbor. His tools for that mission were anti-aircraft guns and the Hawaiian Department's Air Command. Short's airmen had 138 modern fighter aircraft on hand. During the palpably increasing tension during the fall of 1941, Short had ordered a significant level of alert. But after Washington sent him a war warning message on 27 November, Short decided to lower, not raise, his level of alert. Why he did this has never been satisfactorily explained. The anti-aircraft guns remained mainly in storage rather than deployed, and those that were deployed had their ammunition locked up. The Air Control Center, about which I'll speak a little bit more later, uh, such as it was, uh, as well as the radar network were only operating from 0, uh, 0,400 to 0, 0,700 hours in the morning, primarily for training, and no pilot stood by ready to immediately man defensive fighters should the radar detect a threat. Now, Short provided uh, two notifications to Washington about his alert status. On 28 November, immediately after receiving the war warning, he simply tersely invited Washington that he was, quote, alerted to prevent <coughs> sabotage. His comprehensive response reached Washington on 1 December. In that message, Short reported his command was, uh, was at alert number one under the new standing operating procedures of 5 November 1941. And that level of alert provided for vigilance against uh, sabotage and uh, subversion. This message passed through Colonel Charles W. Bundy, Brigadier General Leonard Giroux with the War Plans Division, and on to General Marshall, and none of them objected to Short's level of alert. Now, in my study of the Pearl Harbor attack, I believe it's uh, accurate to say that Short and Kimmel were much more sinned against than, sun than sinning, but they did make one mistake, in my view, justified their relief. Washington had deprived them of many tools, but it did supply them with enough radar sets and the rudiments of an air control center. But to make the air control center effective, it required both Army and Navy liaison officers who'd account for traffic of their respective services and thus permit identification of hostile aircraft. The Navy never provided such liaison officers, and the Army's input uh, proved to be an error on the morning of 7 December. Now, the Japanese presented Short and Kemmel with three tactical warnings of the attack on the morning of 7 December. First, early came two cruiser float planes that were sent ahead to scout 
and determine the state of the American alert. alert. They were picked up by radar, but dismissed. In my view, there's virtually no likelihood that these two stray aircraft showing up on aircraft would have triggered an alert, even if there had been a high state of alert at, the air, at an air control center at that time. This is not the case with respect to the remaining two tactical warnings. The second tactical warning came when the destroyer Ward, on sentry duty outside the entrance to Pearl Harbor, sighted one of the five midget submarines the Japanese had launched with the mission of penetrating the harbor and attacking American battleships. Ward sank the submarine with gunfire and sent an immediate urgent report. This reached the duty officer of the Pacific Fleet at headquarters, but he did not order a general alert. And the third tactical warning became a famous story, an important part of which you just heard in the oral history this morning. These two very junior enlisted men operating that one radar set had just been about to shut it down when they witnessed uh, on the oscilloscope, in which the display was made at that time, this uh, what we would call a blip. It was the largest they'd ever seen. And there's the uh, video of Kermit Tyler indicated after dis debating what they were looking at, they decided to call it in. And when they called it in, uh, officially, the control center had shut down at 0700, but uh, Tyler, who was actually there, he was a fighter pilot there for familiar, familiarization training, uh, he was on duty, and as he explained in the video, he had been informed by one of his friends that these B-17s were due in that morning, and by a great stroke of luck for the Japanese, the B-17s and the Japanese attack formation were almost on identical bearing, bearing down on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the pilots, the, the two enlisted men at the radar center didn't bother to mention that the contact they were looking at must indicate many, many aircraft, and uh, Tyler therefore had no reason to believe that the size of the blip uh, said something other than the B-17s. Now, had either the second or third uh, part of these tactical warnings prompted an immediate alert, it might have limited the damage and casualties from the attack. And the failure of Kimmel and Short to create an adequate air control center is, in my view, the one really damning mistake they made that cannot be qualified by any contribution from their superiors in Washington. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Uh, before we turn to the audience for questions, I have a few of my own. Um, Rob, you make a good case for the inevitability of Pearl Harbor. Um, you identified June 1940 as this point of no return beyond which um, war couldn't be avoided. Um, I wonder if you could give us a better idea of what was happening in 1940 globally that contributed to this sort of crossing the Rubicon moment. Sure. It's really a way to get you to talk about Rommel, but you can talk about No, 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 no <laughs> Rommel. That, that's another drinking game at a different, different conference. Um, you know, I can go two ways on drinking games. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely can. You know, the, perhaps the, the dean of World War II historians in, in America and globally over the last decades is Gerhard Weinberg. And Gerhard will always remind any listener that the earth is round. <laughs> in other words, that you can't really talk about east and west, that we're all on this big ball together. And what happens in the supposed western half of it has real uh, uh, implications for what's happening in the, uh, in the east. So I don't really want to spin out the counterfactuals too much. but. It, it wasn't just that the Germans overran France and, and Western Europe in 1940. It was the, the, the speed, the intensity, the abs, absolutely abject performance of Western military forces against the Germans, against a modern military force. So let's some, you know, conjure up somehow a more robust defense uh, in, in France by the British and the French. Maybe there's no need for a Dunkirk. Uh, maybe Britain and France don't seem so kind of tired and played out. And maybe the Japanese then don't really believe that the drive for empire in the Western Pacific will be as easy as, in fact, it, um, it turned out to be. But, you know, um, th that, that link between West and East, let's go forward from June of 1940 to, July, uh, uh, to June of 1941. Um, a lot of things happened in that summer. I, I, I mentioned one of them, <laughs> the Japanese uh, occupied the southern half of Indochina, making it appear pretty clear that their next stage of, of expansion will be a drive in, uh, towards the, the to Southeast Asia and the oil of the Dutch East Indies. But you know, something else happens that summer, and that's the Germans invade the Soviet Union. I mean, a big thing happens that summer, and those two things together, 
just, I think, make it obvious to the Japanese that the, 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 the Western powers aren't going to have a lot of effort or a lot of armaments or a lot of energy to devote to blocking their drive for empire into the, uh, into the Western Pacific. So I, I just, you know, I, I always like to remember uh, Dr. Weinberg's quote, and uh, Gerhard has not only been a mentor to me, but he's been kind of a lodestar. When, when Gerhard Weinberg speaks, I listen, and you, everyone, everyone should listen. And if I could leave everyone with wisdom on this point, it's that, you know, the Earth is round. A globe, actually. Thanks. Um, Rich, I, th I think it goes without saying that individual leadership matters greatly, and on that point, you mentioned in early 1941 that FDR fired Richardson as the head of the Pacific Fleet. He ends up, um, Kimmel ends up accepting the position, but before that, Chester Nimitz is offered, or selected by FDR to take that position, and he declines, uh, saying that he was too junior to the many senior officers who were above him. So my question is, what's the significance of that decision then for Nimitz, um, not only for the Navy, but for the larger American prosecution of the war to come, that Nimitz wasn't sink pack at the time of the, the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, this, that's a great question. And it gets into one of the areas we really like to do here at the museum, which is gossip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Nimitz was uh, then chief of what was <laughs> You have, bear with me. The, the Navy called its personnel branch the Bureau of Navigation at that time. I can't totally explain that, but that was what happened. So Nimitz was in charge of personnel, uh, both enlisted and officer personnel. He'd worked closely with uh, Secretary of Navy Frank Knox, uh, and he had face-to-face -face with, uh, with Roosevelt, although we're not exactly entire, entirely sure. But Roosevelt did, in fact, offer the job of uh, Commander in Chief of the Pacific Fleet to Nimitz. And Nimitz, is, as Adam said, uh, declined on the basis he was too, he was even more junior than uh, Kimmel was at that time. And as I mentioned in anticipation of this or whatever here, that you know Kimmel takes command and several other senior officers uh, resign rather than serve under him, and we've been much exacerbated by that. Uh, in my view, we're extraordinarily fortunate that that happened. Now, I'm, I'm not sure by any means whether uh, uh, Chester Nimitz in, at the helm of the Pacific Fleet in, in December 1941 might have had a much better uh, readiness and awareness than uh, what uh, Kimmel did, but we'll never know about that. What we do know is that getting Chester Nimitz, uh, we found one of the really great uh, naval officers in American history. And he was a person uh, of great personal probity, uh, a very respectful figure. He was not an egocentric. Uh, and he had the sort of nerve to take risks that no one else had. A, a point I've made several times at these conferences is that when you look at the senior American leadership in World War II, Chester Nimitz is the only American theater commander who would win great battles when fighting outnumbered or merely at parity. Nobody else could claim this, not Eisenhower or MacArthur or Stilwell. Uh, none of these other officers uh, had that on their resume that, uh, that Nimitz had. And, you know, it's in, in some ways to me, the selection of, of Nimitz sort of parallels that of Marshall. Uh, they were both, in my view, indispensable figures to lead America to victory in World War II. Thanks. Great points. This question's uh, for either, either of you or both of you. Um, Washington essentially made Kimmel in short scapegoats, really. And um, certainly they weren't the only ones at fault, though. And if we look at things objectively, who else should have shouldered the blame for the attack? I'll let you take with that one. Okay. Uh, well, Counselor. Well, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the gentleman I mentioned, uh, Brigadier General Sherman Miles, they found his services were no longer needed for the war effort, uh, quite appropriately. So he really, uh, there, there's a whole series of things that, that Miles and his G2 operation do during the second half of 1941 that do not reflect great credit. Uh, what's interesting is, of course, although the Army technically was responsible for the defense of the fleet in Pearl Harbor, and it really blew that assignment big time or whatever here, uh, to the American people, the public perception was the big culpability was on the Navy side because the Navy casualties were so much enormously heavier than the Army casualties and the loss of those ships uh, was uh, much more significant to the American people. Uh, the Chief of Naval Operations was Harold Stark. Uh, and uh, by rights, uh, if you assume that the responsibility did lie heavily in Washington, which I believe was the case, then uh, Stark uh, 
should have been terminated at that point. He was not. He was kept on as Chief of Naval Operations, but they brought in uh, Ernest J. King to be uh, the Commander-in-Chief of U.S. Fleet until Stark was eased out in March of 42 to go over to command naval forces in uh, Europe. Now, the issue that comes up immediately is, if Stark should have gone, what about Marshall? Uh, and very fortunately, you know, he was spared. But it is quite true that they really, uh, in my view, how Kemmel and Short were treated uh, in terms of being made scapegoats and being made it seem like they were 99.9% .9 responsible for all the devastation and loss, that was m most unjust. I should add that Pearl Harbor achieved the distinction of producing not one, but 10 separate subsequent investigations uh, about it. Uh, 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 several during the wartime, a big congressional hearing afterwards, and finally in the 1990s there was a further review, and that review is the best one in my view because it really explains how the blame extended well upward uh, from Pearl Harbor for what had happened, but it did not decide to restore the rank of uh, Kemmel and Short. I wonder if I can ask Rich a question. Adam, would that be all right? Sure. You know, uh, Rich, let me take a, this is a 30,000 uh, foot uh, question. How, how aware should U.S. planners have been of the possibility of surprise? Um, a, a, a surprise attack, what we, when I was a boy, a sneak attack. That's kind of left the vocabulary. We speak right. of surprise attack. Uh, Japan started a war with Russia in 1904 with a surprise attack on the Russian fleet at rest at a place called, not Pearl Harbor, but Port Arthur, it even sounds like it. Uh, invaded Manchuria in 1931 without a declaration of war, although that's unusual circumstances. Invaded China proper in 1937 without a declaration of war, kind of a bolt out of the blue. It's unfair to say what, what they should have been doing. Was anyone thinking about this? Anyone reading any recent Japanese history and saying, we're likely to have a, a kind of a surprise on our hands if the balloon goes up? There's, there's actually, uh, you know, uh, in the weeks immediately before Pearl Harbor in, in, in Washington, in one of the discussions that's going on at the high level officials, someone says, well, you know, the Japanese have this record of staging surprise attacks. I think the answer, though, is that, uh, you know, the Navy uh, had studied in great depth the possibility of war with Japan from uh, 1906, and particularly the interval between the wars. And the Naval War College played war games about what was called War Plan Orange, which was mm -hmm. the, the scenario for fighting Japan. And as one wag put it, two generations of naval officers were genetically encoded to execute War Plan Orange. <laughs> and War Plan Orange pr provided that it would be a war in three stages. In the first stage, the Japanese would attack the US, but they would attack the Philippines and Guam in the Western Pacific because everyone knew that the correct Japanese strategy was to keep their main fleet, which was outnumbered for most of the, uh, the 20s and 30s, in the Western Pacific and make us come to them and subject our fleet to attrition or whatever here. So the Navy was thinking sort of pragmatically or whatever, even though they were aware of the history, aware the Japanese were capable of, they thought that the Japanese simply had never displayed the uh, capability or the intention to do that. And also, they recognized Japan's situation, as you've described. I mean, they're, they're in dire straits with the war in China. Their resource, you know, they had to get the resources. It was obvious that was what they're going to strike for. They just did not have the imagination to realize that, oh, by the way, at that point, the Pacific Fleet was the main deterrent to any Japanese effort to execute their war plans, and therefore Yamamoto decided that he'd have to go for that. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate that. I think the audience is probably has their own questions, so I'm going to turn things over now to my colleague on the floor, Jeremy Collins. Well, thank you to our panelists, first of all, Adam, Rich, and Rob. Round of applause, please. <laughs> and as I make my way to the front, please raise your hands, and my colleague Connie and I will find you. Gentlemen, we're going to start towards the front to your left, please. Great uh, talk, as always. So, Rob, something else that happened in June of 1940, the Congress signs the Naval Expansion Act, which says that over a period of, I guess, three to four years, we're going to double the size of the Navy with Iowa class, battleships, and Essex class. How did that figure into the calculus of the Japanese? You talked about going to war when next year is going to get worse. And given our system where it's pretty clear what we're going to do, uh, by 43, 44, 
we're, we're going to have a pretty good fleet. How did the Japanese uh, take a look at that? Uh, again, I, I, I'm, I had the advantage for those portions of my paper of dealing mainly in the theoretical perspective, you know, which is the best, where you want to be sometimes, right? right. Um, but but it just, I, I think it backs up the, the very point. If, if we have an open system, there's been legislation decided upon in, in Congress, signed by the President of the United States, that says we're doubling the size of our Navy. I think it just gives more grist for the mill of this notion that next year is not going to be as good as this year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm arguing with a strain of the historiography that says constantly, what in the world were the Japanese thinking? What a silly decision they made. Of, co of course it was, as things turned out. But, but I guess my calling as a historian, as I interpret it, is not so much to, to kind of condemn the, the Kimmels and Shorts and Rich. I thought you did a great job in, in making the point about a, a qualified defense of, of Kimmel and Short. Uh, but my job as a historian is to kind of explain w uh, w what happened and why what happened happened. I, I have a difficult, that's why I say I don't want to delve too deeply into a counterfactual. I have a difficult enough time trying to figure out what happened and why. But I think the point you made of a doubled U.S. fleet, or it's going to be doubled in size by, let us say, 1943, you can, it's mathematical, how many, how many keels are you going to lay down and how many ships are you going to build is kind of a mathematical thing, and it's even laid out in, in tables. And I think it just further reinforces the point that the Japanese are probably believe they're looking at a ticking clock. Let me, let me uh, add something to that. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill was a pretty good phrase maker himself, <laughs> and uh, in one of his communications about uh, they were trying to assess Japanese intentions, uh, Churchill says, the Japanese are doing their sums again, and they actually, we know now that in the Imperial Navy, they sat down and worked out what would be the most opportune time for the Imperial Navy to go to war against the U.S. in view of the potentially ex enormous expansion of the U.S. fleet. And the calculation worked out that December 1941 <laughs> was the ideal month to go to war. But they also calculated that if they didn't succeed quickly in, uh, in the war, uh, securing victory or whatever here, their situation would become desperate in 43 and you know, catastrophic by 44, 45 because of the fleet expansion or whatever here. So yeah, it was, it was a, a critical element in terms of uh, Japanese calculations. And I was, uh, believe me, I was really struck when I read that part saying they worked out the sums and December 1941 was the magic month, or whatever here, explains a lot. They also, by the way, had refitted every ship in the fleet. On Pearl Harbor Day, every single major combatant in the Japanese Navy uh, was available for operations but for one destroyer. Hmm. It's big Bill Knutson po pointing to December 1941 on a map saying, we'll probably be ready to go right about then. Yeah. December of 41. The next question is going to be in the center to your right. It, it seems inconceivable that um, Short and Kimmel were appointed to defend Pearl Harbor, where Short was a, um, a training officer and Kimmel, a force of, of several senior officers, resigned rather than serve under him. Uh, I'm just kind of figuring, was there any, when Roosevelt heard about this, did he start an investigation? I asked questions saying, like, what's going on with Kimmel, and, and, and why are all these folks so senior to him resigning rather than serve under him? And does, ultimately, does he, president, bear some responsibility for, you know, um, um, installing what I kind of think would be a couple of boobs for jobs that uh, seem to be really grossly uh, um, it unqualified for. Well, uh, let me, uh, I've long believed, let me spool back a minute. You know, I've uh, dealt with the Asia Pacific War for a long time. And one of the topics, however, that I had avoided until I had to really grapple with it in my, my book, uh, Tower of Skulls, was Pearl Harbor. It's a fever swamp down into which many historians have wandered and been smitten by fevers and never recovered or whatever here. And so I was always a little leery. I read a lot of the secondary literature, but I actually did a really deep dive for this. And one of the conclusions I reached was that Kemmel uh, was not a bad selection. Kemmel had many positive attributes that he'd look for for someone who's going to be fleet commander. Uh, he just uh, was very aggressive, it turns out, and did not properly interpret his situation. Short was, in my view, far more deficient uh, as uh, a officer acting in his capacity and not just in those ways. And let me add w one other detail that also resonates on our earlier question. I, I mentioned this in a little extra detail. I mentioned that when, Sh Kimmel, when Short sent his 
longer message about his uh, status, he said, it's in accordance with the operating procedures as of what, uh, 1 November 1941. Well, there was a nuance in that. His, the prior uh, commander of the Hawaiian Department had a, a standard operating procedure with, a, with, a, with an SOP about alert levels. And under the prior uh, commander's uh, standard operating procedure, alert number one was the highest level of alert. Under Kemmel's revision, one was the lowest level of, uh, of alert. And the desk officer, this Colonel Bundy, who was killed in a plane crash in December 1941, which is why you've not heard about him. He was the guy who was really supposed to know that when they made this switch, what number, alert number one really meant. Giroux was his superior who probably didn't need to know that detail. But they passed it on to Russell because they didn't recognize that, that Short's alert number one was not what they thought it was, or whatever here. Uh, so that's another element about how well, Washington, you know, uh, screwed it up. And once again, you know, Bundy's killed in a plane crash. Otherwise, in that congressional hearing post-war, we've been hearing a lot from Colonel Bundy about what, what he had done. You mean like the threat is like, is it one or is it 10? Is, right. is it 10 or is it one? Right, yeah. Wow. <laughs> We're gonna stay in the center aisle, gentlemen. Good morning. 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 Reasonably, Okay, you have the attack with the ward on the submarine. You've got the radar contact. You only talk about an hour and a half. I mean, you don't fuel an entire fighter wing at Wheeler Field. What do they do? I mean, besides the fleet maybe going to battle stations, does Kimmel try and do something crazy like sortie or? I mean, what could they have done differently to mitigate the effect? Well, if, if you actually work out and add a, a reasonable amount of time frame for the report comes into when you issue the alert or whatever here, you get a difference of between 20 and 30 minutes or something like that. Roughly at that time, for a battleship to go to general quarters is about 10 minutes or whatever here. So the ships in harbor could have improved their material condition, particularly their watertight integrity and, and you know, get their anti-aircraft guns uh, and, and start getting them in position or whatever. You're right, however, the, because Short had so totally, totally uh, disconnected his air defense capability from the alert. There's no way that alert would have material effect. In fact, he had the planes parked, you know, wingtip to wingtip. Uh, uh, the fighters were at Wheeler Field. They were, you know, they were just lined up, a uh, perfect target for the Japanese. Uh, <laughs> and ironically, when the, when the Japanese attacked, uh, the, uh, the best fighters were uh, uh, left under a cloud of smoke so that do the, do the Japanese attack, so it was all, everything that could go, could go wrong with respect to the air defense just about all went wrong. But it would have increased the material readiness condition of the ships in harbor. It probably would have reduced the number, certainly like uh, Oklahoma or whatever here, you probably would have had fewer losses or whatever. It would not have helped the Arizona. You know, I, I think Rich gave a really good uh, exposition of the levels of war, tactical, operational, and, and even strategic. You know, having an hour to do something is a tactical issue. Um, but if the enemy fleet has already shown up 200 miles from your base undetected, you have already sustained a kind of operational defeat, and you're in bad shape even before those Japanese aircraft take off. So I think maybe here we do need to look a bit at levels of war. I, I think five, if you have five minutes and you use it in some way, you said it might not have helped the Oklahoma, uh, what uh, would have helped the Oklahoma would not have helped the Arizona, but helping the Oklahoma is a pretty big deal. Yeah. So, yeah. And also, you know, the Jap one of the things about the attack uh, is that uh, the Japanese later, uh, we can assess the attack and note that by far the greatest amount of damage in the attack was inflicted in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. And then the ships put up much more anti-aircraft fire than the Japanese ever experienced, yeah. which accounts for why the later, level, later uh, relays of attack uh, were not nearly as effective. So if you figure they're already ready to start shooting before the Japanese uh, commence their attack, you can figure that it is going to diminish the effectiveness of the attack. Next question is to the front with Connie, please. Professor Satino, I've always been fascinated by the concept that the Japanese, of course, thought that this would be a good decision. <laughs> and we've learned that they thought, well, the United States didn't have the will. They would sue for peace after a period of time. Was there something in particular that the Japanese learned about us or thought about us that made them think that we would give up and just sue for peace after a period of time? 
That's good, a really good question. Um, I guess I would remind everyone in the room that this is the, uh, the great flowering of the age of fascism. And, and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to waste everyone's time defining exactly what fascism it is, but I think we know it when we see it. And the, the, the Germans, the Italians invented it, and then the Germans had a variety of it, and the, the uh, Japanese certainly had a variety of it as well. And it emphasizes the martial, it emphasizes factors of will over material factors. It almost always denigrates the enemy as a kind of weaker other who lacks the racial purity or the martial tradition to go toe to toe with us, whoever us happens to be, in this case, the Japanese. So I think the notion of, of the democracies, um, as Mussolini called them, the demo plutocracies, um, one of his greatest formulations, Rich, I know you agree. Um, I, I think the notion of the democracies were just a kind of, it was a, democracy was a played out concept. Liberal democracy was so 19th century and that in the 20th century, it was the powers who simply refused to say die and refused to let things like rational planning and intelligence and material factors get in the way of their drive for global power. Those were the powers who would, you know, so to say, in, inherit the earth. So I, I, I don't know if there's a specific um, a, a Japanese take on Americans. I, I'm more interested in that notion of fascism as an international ideology. You know, we talk about the communist international of the 1930s, but there was a fascist international that we, went, that we wound up going to war with in the 1940s. And I, I think those kinds of thoughts are, are shared widely, even in the smaller countries of Europe, the, 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 the Iron Guard in Romania, the sort of Romanian fascist variety, looking at the Hungarians as a weak and played out power. Even, even there, there's sort of varieties of racism. But racism, but by which I mean in this context, you know, assigning specific characteristics to a group of people solely by virtue of, of their race, whatever, however you define race scientifically or pseudoscientifically, that's part of the fascist inheritance of the 1940s, and they all share it. Let me, let me add to that. Um, if you really go back and take away looking back through the wreckage of Tokyo and Berlin in 1945, and you look at what had happened in hostilities from say when Italy rolled into Ethiopia in 1935 to the summer of 1941, the Axis powers were winning almost an unbroken stream of tremendous successes, many of them humiliating. This whole notion that they were, they, both Germany and Japan pitched themselves as supreme warrior races, that material factors didn't count because they simply had this X factor that made it sure that they would win. And when the Japanese are going through this decision-making process in the second half of 41, remember, the Germans are driving deeply, deeply, deeply into the Soviet Union. For quite some time, it's by no means clear the Soviets are going to survive. And so the Japanese are looking around saying to themselves, you know, we signed up on the winning team, yeah. you know? And those Americans, it's not like they're thinking, well, it's just us against the Americans. They're thinking, well, the Americans are going to have to split their effort or whatever here. This is going to diminish their ability. One of my favorite stories about this is I was reading this uh, biography of uh, Yamamoto by a fellow named Agawa many years ago. And uh, immediately prior to Japan attacking Pearl Harbor, Agawa uh, goes searching for someone to comment upon the rationality of that decision. Of course, Yamamoto was not available for comment, so uh, Agawa turned to one of his classmates, in a way, who was a solid Imperial Navy officer, and asked him, you know, can you explain this decision? And in a way, he says, well, you know, it was those idiots in the Imperial Army and the civilians. They thought America was dominated by its women. And if the war started, the American women would demand that the war end immediately. You know, when I read that, this thought immediately went through the back of my mind. You know, gosh, had they, they only read or seen Gone with the Wind, they would have realized <laughs> they, were they were going the wrong way, you know? And years later, I'm reading an assessment by another Japanese naval officer post-war, this long essay, and he gets to this one section, he says, the, about the, the Americans, he says, we, we underestimated their national character. We thought they were soft and decadent, whatever here, and it proved to be that they would make any sacrifice, blah, blah, blah. He says, it was exactly like the people of Gone with the Wind come back to life unchanged. <laughs> so if you're looking for a, a cocktail a demonstration of your, your wit, you can always say, you know, gosh, if we'd only shown them Gone with the Wind, this whole thing could have been avoided. <laughs> If you ever grew up in a house with my mother, you would also not have attacked Pearl Harbor. I, I miss her dearly, too. It, gentlemen in the center, about halfway back. Rich, you mentioned about the Japanese doing their psalms. 
Was there ever any serious debate or calculation made for them going to war with just the French and the British? Because the rubber and the tin and the petroleum were colonies held by those countries and not necessarily the United States. That's, that's a really good question. Yeah. And yes, they did think about that. In fact, if you, if you flip that on the other side, Roosevelt was quite concerned through the second half of 41 about what if the Japanese only attack the British and the French and the Dutch and they don't touch US territory? It, will the American people rally to go into the war. And in fact, one historian found evidence that uh, they had assigned a State Department uh, person to try to write a speech in December 1940 that would explain why we should go to war if our territory was not touched. But ultimately, what the Japanese, when they assessed this, they said, well, look, you know, even if we don't immediately start war with the US, the Philippines sit astride our essential line of communication to the resource area. And if the Americans ever come in, you know, we're, you know, in a technical term, we're screwed, you know. So, you know, they had, they realized they had to go uh, whole hog. It was all or nothing. And one of the other ironies about this is that they made the final decision for war officially on the 1st of December. You know, within that little span of about a week, when it looks like finally the Russians are going to hold out, yes. the, you know, had they waited maybe two weeks longer, who knows what would have happened in terms of contingency. That's one of the big contingencies about this, these whole events. If, if I can build off of Richard's contingency, you know, there's intelligence flowing into German headquarters that the Japanese are planning some sort of strike on the Americans, not necessarily Pearl Harbor and the way it actually worked out, but the Japan is seriously thinking of rolling the iron dice and launching a war against the United States. And Hitler says in, in his, you know, within his small circle of advisors, the OKW, the high command of the armed forces, on several occasions, he says, that's why we have to keep the drive on Moscow going. He's getting, he is getting intelligence on the front. We're running out of this, we're running out of that. A frostbite casualties are exceeding battle casualties. You can imagine the bad news coming off of the Eastern Front in, let us say, November of 1941. One of the reasons Hitler you know, keeps that drive inching forward to Moscow is he, he doesn't want to call it off because that might give the Japanese cold feet in their war against the United States, which he's really excited about. It'll keep the Americans busy. They won't be able to give so much lend-lease to, um, uh, to the British. It'll sort of give him, at least in an indirect way, a fleet, which is his, the Japanese fleet, which is his big strategic lack. The Germans really don't have any kind of battle fleet by now. So uh, once again, what's happening in the West is having material impact on what's happening in, uh, in Asia, and if I may, quote Gerhard Weinberg one more time, it's because the earth is round. Yeah. Gentlemen, all the way to your left in the back. Good morning. Um, one of you mentioned about the battle at Nomanhan, and I think that's one of the great under-reported uh, battles of the war. Would you, a lot of historians pretty much dismiss its impact on where the Japanese drove and whether they would actually attack Russia and the peace treaties that came about shortly after that battle's conclusion. Sure, I'll be happy to make some comments on it. Certainly, I, I would not want to be counted amongst the historians who discount the, the Noman Han as a material factor in Japanese planning. Um, the Japanese, uh, there were some border d uh, d disputes in Inner Mongolia between the Soviet sphere and the Japanese puppet colony, if you will, puppet empire of Ma Manchuria, Manchuguo as it was called. Um, both sides had some cavalry, some Mongolian cavalry, sort of Soviet surrogate Manchuguo. Is that the adjective, Rich? Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. Cavalry uh, fighting on, on behalf of the Japanese. It, it, it leads to uh, bigger skirmishes, regimental size, eventually divisions, and then uh, uh, I would say roughly a reinforced corps on both sides, both designated armies. Um, in, in the course of that fighting through the summer of 1939, um, the better part of two Japanese divisions are encircled and destroyed. The Japanese went through their entire sort of playbook of we don't need heavy tanks. We don't need heavy artillery. We don't need to be heavy at all. Why? Because we have, I don't know, the Yamato spirit, or we have, we have, we have superior morale on, uh, on the part of our uh, soldiers that will allow them to triumph even when the material odds are against them. And there's that fascist formulation uh, one more time. And of course, it, at least in Inner Mongolia in 1939, it proves to be bunk. The Soviets have real tanks. 
Uh, BT-5s, if you're sort of keeping track uh, of what so Soviet stage of armor development, not yet the T-34, but the sort of forerunner of it. But they have, they have tanks used en masse. They have a very skilled uh, uh, commander on the operational level, a young general by the name of Zhukov, who will go on to fame and fortune for the rest of his career in World War II. Uh, and, and you have an absolute disaster here on the part of the Japanese. So there is obviously no real, you know, er, uh, what, um, there's no real enthusiasm about having a second go at the Russians in Siberia, people often say, well, the, the Russians would have been otherwise engaged. This, by this, they're, they're fighting for their lives against the Germans. Good point. The Japanese are otherwise engaged. They already have their, practically their entire army in China. How many land campaigns can the Japanese possibly launch? I, th this big strategic debate that, that our friend Ed Dre wrote about so well in his book on the Japanese army between the northern road and the southern road. Do we want to go north into Siberia or south into the Pacific to seize our resources? I, I think it's a debate that kind of resolved itself. Uh, I, I think you, you could still make a case both ways, but expecting the Japanese who are already unable to uh, conclude a land campaign in China to, to, to be eager to have a go at, at the Red Army again in the Far East after what happened in 1939, that's too much even for a fascist. Yeah, let me, let me just add on that. I obviously agree with everything Rob said. Uh, the one thing is that there were, there were advocates in the Imperial Army that wanted to have another go at the, the Soviets, but only if it was clear the Soviets were being administered lethal damage by the Germans. Gotcha. They thought that then would be an opportunity. And in fact, they flowed reinforcements into Manchuria, their Wang Tung army, uh, up to 700,000 men. And there were other Imperial Army officers who became very concerned that given the lack of indiscipline and even mutiny with rampant in the Imperial Army, they were afraid that hey, if we continue this buildup, somebody in Manchuria might decide to attack the Soviets without even authorization mm -hmm. from, and they began to throttle back the buildup. But ultimately, in my view, what really did it uh, was when we cut off the oil, uh, there was no rational basis to drive against the Soviets without uh, secure uh, oil petroleum supplies. That was, and there's one Japanese historian I quote, uh, who says basically, once the oil was cut off, that settled any real serious dispute about going north or south. They had to go south for the resources. Now that would have been the that would have been a battle of the big battalions. Big, heavy, intensive land warfare is, is also resource intensive, and right. so it's the Dutch East Indies. Right, right. Next question is going to be in the center here, please. Did the Japanese send a tacit declaration prior to the attack, even like minutes before, that it was either ignored or not received and lamented by Yamamoto? Rich, I'm going to let you handle the details of that one. I'll be okay. happy to jump in. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hey, these are really good questions, yeah, as yeah. always. As always. This, this, is, this is, the, is one of the, the things. sweet that, spot of the conference. This is, yeah, this is one of the things uh, for us up here on, on the podium. One of the things that is so gratifying is to get an audience like this that asks you know, these really astute questions. Absolutely. Uh, and my answer is, I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all out of time, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> so uh, uh, the question again, quickly. <laughs> what, did, they, did they send a declaration of war? Oh, declaration that, of war. OK. I, I, was, I was already halfway down the path on that. Uh, Interesting question. Uh, strangely enough, the Japanese foreign minister at first didn't want to issue a declaration of war. I mean, the emperor and the uh, prime minister T Tojo said, no, I think we need to do that. But then the Imperial Navy said, well, we can't issue anything that's going to tip off the attack. So they came up with this formula of this 14-part message. The first 13 parts we intercepted and, and read, and it looked like it was a wind-up for a declaration of war. That's what was being interpreted. FDR, when he read the 13th part, said this means war. Well, then the 14th part uh, actually said not, not that we're going to war, not that we're breaking off diplomatic relations, just that we're breaking off negotiations right now. So it was this tremendous letdown, that 14th part message, and that message, they were told to deliver the message at 1 p.m. Washington time to uh, Secretary of State Hall which worked out to be about 7.30 in Hawaii, which was a calculated effort to make sure that, although technically they would have delivered some message they could claim was a declaration of war, that it was before the attack, but not soon enough that the Americans would be able to communicate to their Far Eastern uh, 
commands a level of alert before the attack actually arrived. Well, you know, it turns out that was uh, a colossal strategic mistake uh, because there was nothing that so riled up the Americans as the fact that here they had those diplomats acting as though they were acting in good faith in diplomatic relations, and then the attack comes out of the blue. And by the way, uh, neither Nomura nor Caruso, the uh, ambassador and uh, an assistant in Washington, had any inkling about the Pearl Harbor attack. Although they could read the tea leaves and they knew that war was very close. You know, that sounds like a bridge too far in terms of planning. A 13-parter, and we'll do that, and then we'll hand in one. So to quote Clausewitz um, one last time, uh, in war, everything is simple. It always sounds so. It always sounds so simple, but the simplest thing you try to do is difficult. And and there's an example of it. You can't even declare war on somebody cleanly. I think of the Italians. They fought the war in Epley and then couldn't even leave it. You know, they, right. they, so everything about war is difficult, and that's why you should keep your plans as basic and as simple as possible. But that's a complex uh, operational prescription that you just laid down. That's yeah. amazing. Gentlemen, we have one last question to your left, halfway back, please. Can you, either one of you, comment, uh, given his service in the United States or before the war, how Yamamoto felt about going to war with the Americans? Uh, I'll, say, I'll give the high view, and then Rich can maybe get into a bit more details. He's more learned on this question than I. But, you know, I, I, we always hear that he said, we've awakened a sleeping giant. It's kind of tough to find the provenance of that quote. It's been my, my understanding. Maybe he, said it, maybe he said it somewhere. He did plan it. So how we felt about it to me is, is of, of relatively less import than the fact that he was deeply involved in the, in the planning for the raid. Every single German general purported after the war not to have been in favor of the strike into the Soviet Union. Every single one of them was involved in the planning process, and that, that, those are my general comments. But yeah. Um, yeah, that uh, you've awakened the sleeping giant is, is, uh, is a complete made-up thing. That this is, we don't have any... You're killing me here, we don't even have uh, We don't have a, any clear indication that uh, Yamamoto thought that. Yeah. Uh, his exact attitude towards Americans, uh, there's, there's conflicting evidence on that. I mean, he, he clearly said it sometimes that, you know, you know, we're going to war with them is, you know, we shouldn't go to war with them, and their national character is such that if we get into war with them... My view on, on Yamamoto's ultimate thinking was this, that he did not want to go to war with the U.S., uh, he was quite opposed to it. In fact, he was moved from uh, sort of a high ministry official out to the fleet to make sure he wasn't assassinated because of his uh, opposition. Uh, but finally, when the word came down from on, on high that we're going to war, Yamo sat down and tried to think out, well, now that I've committed to this, what's our best option? In my view, Yamamoto's uh, concept was that the only American vulnerability Japan could strike at was the will to continue the war. And the attack on Pearl Harbor, plus repeated blows after that, were his, his estimate of the one American vulnerability that Japan could reasonably strike at and get the war over quickly before Japan was overwhelmed. And my view is that Yamamoto did not embark upon this with a high confidence that the war was going to be successful. He did it because it was, in his view, the only conceivable way he could, uh, he could see for Japan possibly to succeed. And that's why he embarked on the attack. Ladies and gentlemen, our panelists, Rob Satino, Rich Frank, and our chair, Adam Gibbons. This marks our first break. The panelists will be escorted outside the doors to your left, where they will be seated at the book signing table. The next session begins at 11, but you may want to show up a little early. As Dr. Bell indicated, we will be rolling some oral history showcases throughout the day. Thank you.
At the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, there is a new experience as epic, as extraordinary as the conflict it honors, beyond all boundaries. It is an immersive 4D cinematic journey through the war that changed the world, shown exclusively in the museum's one-of-a-kind Victory Theater. I'm proud to have served as executive producer of Beyond All Boundaries, and you can see it exclusively every hour only at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Hey y'all, I'm Amanda Shaw. We all know Louisiana is as fun as all get out. So get out, take a road trip, and explore our state. Fill her up, then try a new restaurant that's as fun-loving as it is food-loving. Grab the family and take off for monumental adventures at our 21 state parks. Or take a magical minivan tour along our 19 scenic trails and byways. Louisiana's a trip. Take one today. This is Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Plan your road trip at louisianaisatrip.com. They were ordinary people, just like you and me, who never expected to find themselves like this. But they found courage. They found grit, grace. They found strength in each other. And in their stories, we find strength within. The National World War II Museum. Find the extraordinary inside. Five years ago, this was a vast checkerboard of potato farms on New York's Long Island. Today, a community of 60,000 persons living in 15,000 homes, all built by one firm. This is Levittown, one of the most remarkable housing developments ever conceived. There is no job like it on the face of the earth. In the power which is concentrated here at this desk, and in the responsibility and difficulty of the decisions. We've made progress in spreading the blessings of American life to all our people. There's been a tremendous awakening of American conscience on the great issues of civil rights. A third world war might dig the grave not only of our communist opponents, but also of our own society, our world, as well as theirs. Starting atomic war is totally unthinkable for a rational man. I suppose that history will remember my term in office as the years when the Cold War began to overshadow our lives. I have had hardly a day in office that has not been dominated 
by this all-embracing struggle, this conflict between those who love freedom and those who would lead the world back into slavery and darkness. And always in the background, there has been the atomic bomb. When Franklin Roosevelt died, I thought there must be a million men better qualified than I to take up the presidential task. But the work was mine to do, and I had to do it. And I've tried to give it everything that is in me. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. against 
very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. invasion. The American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. We got about a little over 1,700 uh, veterans going in today, and uh, we're excited about it. It'll probably take a day and a half, two days to get it, uh, get it right, get them all lined up. We have anywhere from about 800 uh, to about 1,500 bricks per, per install. This one's a little bit larger than, uh, than our normal install, which is nice. The commemorative brick program started here at the museum um, before the museum actually officially opened. It started as a volunteer-run run program, and it's kind of grown alongside uh, the museum as well. It's pretty amazing. What started out uh, as impressive has grown monstrative, and uh, it's become more like a, a rallying cry ar around the museum, around what's going on, around what's going on with our veterans and the... And the the, the, the greatest generation kind of dying off. Today we have, as I mentioned, a little over 45,000 bricks uh, on campus, and all of our bricks are around the perimeter of the museum campus, so both Andrew Higgins Drive, Magazine Street, and then we have some interior bricks as well. With all of our bricks, it's three possible lines of text, 18 possible characters per line. One of the great things is kind of hearing the stories that people submit with, with their brick and the brick text. Um, we, so we do have primarily World War II uh, honorees serving in some capacity, either on the home front or abroad. My family actually purchased four bricks, um, two of which are still living World War II veterans. My grandmother, who will be 97 in March, and my great uncle, who will be 104 on Mardi Gras Day. We also have quite a few veterans who served, um, you know, in other other capacities during this time as well. And those who support our mission, we have quite a few volunteers who have uh, bricks here at the museum and, and those who have served the World War II Museum's mission as well. You're not just necessarily buying a brick for a World War II veteran. You can buy a brick to memorialized efforts of, of volunteers. My husband's family purchased one for his father. They had three World War II veterans who were very close. So I decided, well, it'd be nice to honor all of them. But what we did is we put all three names on the brick and we put World War II buddies and put the division they were in. It was just such an honor to be able to buy one for the three of them. And it just, it means a lot to us as well as to, to his family. We certainly understand the, the how meaningful these tributes are to, to all the brick donors. That's why we do everything in our power uh, to, you know, not only make sure these are installed and taken care of in a timely manner, and also in a manner that's, you know, uh, up to the quality of the museum. I don't think you can make an investment, a cheaper investment anywhere that'll have a more lasting impact in memorializing their efforts. We're getting to a point that it's kind of a legacy of service or, and, you know, how, what that service means today um, for, for other families. <laughs>
I think it's heartwarming for everybody that's w involved with the project. J just being involved with the project is uh, uh, amazing, but handling the memorialization of the soldiers is just it brings it to another level. The fact that their names will forever be here and people can walk by and, you know, look and see where they they were stationed and what they did. Our bricks here, they're lasting tributes and, you know, this is a, uh, a brick program here. I mean, it's seen by millions of visitors every day. It's really moving and very special. The American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum in New Orleans have partnered together to help educators better learn the stories of the American experience of the war in Europe. Join us for a four-week online teacher professional development course that will explore critical campaigns, decisions, events, and about those who served in the European theater through the lens of ABMC's cemeteries and memorials. Beginning with the invasion of Sicily and Italy in 1943, each module will cover the Allied efforts to eliminate fascism from Europe. This course will provide access to noted World War II scholars, museum and ABMC staff members, and virtual resources educators can incorporate into classroom instruction. Employing a rich array of curriculum built upon primary source materials from both the American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum, this free online course will aid teachers in finding new and exciting ways to bring the legacy of World War II to life. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese military launched a surprise attack on the United States Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So why did the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor lead America into World War II? On the 80th anniversary of the attack, join the National World War II Museum with student reporters from Hawaii and New Orleans to answer this question and learn how the war began. Students will have the opportunity to explore Pearl Harbor, galleries within the National World War II Museum, and World War II sites all around the world. So tune in on December 7th, 80 years after the attack, to hear what our student reporters and museum educators have to share about the path to Pearl Harbor. Well, I felt in my bones something major was about to happen. It seemed inevitable. So the move to Pearl Harbor wasn't at all surprising or emotional. There was no, let's give the Yanks a taste of what they've got coming, none of that. Just, well, I guess this is finally starting. When the order came down, we had been training for six months for this inevitability, and we were ready to go. We were confident that we would be able to perform to the maximum extent of our military capability. I was in the second wave, so I had some time after the operation started and before it was my turn to go. When the commander took off, when the very first plane took off, and I lost him from my sight, it looked like he'd gone right off the edge of the aircraft carrier and fallen into the sea. And I remember being really relieved when the plane came back up into view. Seventy-eight of these planes left the carrier bound for Hawaii. I was in the last of these aircraft. So I was positioned to overview and direct the entire forward position of the force. I recall thinking, the shepherd that follows the flock is the most important, and I was really impressed with myself. The first wave was an hour ahead of us, and the scheduled time for their attack was Sunday at 8 a.m. 
I figured that the first wave must have already arrived by now, but I still couldn't see Oahu. And then just then, from under the cloud bank, I finally saw something glittering white that I knew had to be the Kaneohe coastline and the airbase at Ford Island. I headed out toward Diamond Head and banked right, descending from an altitude of 3,500 meters. Then, as the unit commander, I gave the order to make the assault. My mission in the second wave was to attack aircraft carriers and suppress the American emergency response and the counterattack. But the carriers I was supposed to bomb weren't there, or at least we didn't know their actual locations. At first I was disappointed because it seemed my targets weren't there at all. The battleships were all lined up in Battleship Alley, the Tennessee, Arizona, West Virginia, Maryland, and all that. I actually wound up attacking the Arizona, but nothing happened as a result of my attack. What I mean by that is that after releasing the ordinance, I realized the Arizona was already a meter below the waterline and sinking. The first wave had successfully hit the battleship, and I realized my bomb was essentially wasted munition. I saw a large object from 2,500 meters, and so I attacked it. And since there were no carriers, we were re-attacking the battleships that the first wave had already hit. The order came down to continue the attack on the hit targets, so that's what we did. Then we received a message that our six aircraft carriers were formed in two columns east of Honolulu, so we honed in on them. We had a lot of admiration for the enemy's ability to react to the attack and fight back so quickly and so accurately after the raid had started. At the same time that we heard the Tora 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 signal, we saw 200 to 300 anti-aircraft rounds in the sky. It was a faster, more accurate, more impressive response than we had expected. In that light, the Americans at Pearl Harbor were really incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats so we can begin the session promptly at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Hey, folks, welcome back. Please take your seats. So uh, we, we just heard from Robin Rich on the, um, essentially the American perspective on Pearl Harbor. You know, I'm asked, uh, you know, there's always that kind of what if and could we have done this and if, what if this happened? And certainly uh, those are, are great conversation pieces, but capture some of those because uh, for those of you who peeked ahead, our last panel today with uh, Con Crane as the chair is going to look at this kind of counterfactual piece and ask the kind of what ifs, what if these other scenarios has unfolded? So 
So save a bunch of those as well. We don't want to have the last panel not have a bunch of questions. So, uh, so save those super hard counterfactual ones this afternoon. And uh, I, think, I think that'll keep Khan happy and, and certainly Rich happy, right? So now in this session, we're going to shift our lens and, and we're going to look at this uh, from a different perspective. The first perspective was the U.S. perspective, and now we're going to, going to shift over. Uh, Dr. Uh, Noriko Kawamura, professor at the University of Washington, and historian John Parshall will discuss Japan's role in leading up to the attack. Now, Rich is uh, doing double and probably triple and quadruple duty today, um, but Rich will be chairing this panel. And as you know, uh, Rich is an internationally recognized expert on the Pacific War. Uh, many of you know him and uh, probably have heard his voice on radio or TV. Uh, he's also a founding member of the museum's Presidential Counselors Advisory Board. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're uh, grateful to Rich uh, for consenting to do this. Uh, Rich, uh, thanks for that, and thanks for everything you do for the museum. And I'm going to leave the stage and leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Okay, this morning in the first panel, I was playing defense. Uh, for this session, I'm playing offense. I'll be back on special teams tomorrow. <laughs> I was talking with one of uh, the participants uh, who had a very wry story to tell. He would thought about coming here for quite a while, and finally his wife said, well, really, you ought to go. She was happy to go to New Orleans. So he came here in 2019, and immediately after the first session, he called his wife and he said the immortal phrase, I have found my people. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we feel about it. Our, our friends here at the museum. Uh, Mike introduced uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kawamura. Uh, the biography is in the uh, program. Uh, let me just get right to the most important point. Uh, she's here today before you primarily because of her work, Hirohito and the Pacific War. It is, in my estimation, the most thoughtful and persuasive account of Emperor Hirohito's actual role and path through the war in English. A number of other historians have provided portraits of the emperor of varying quality, but hers is really the best as it interweaves context, time, education, and personality. Uh, I highly recommend it to you. And let me take from her uh, work uh, two important points to sort of set up her presentation. Uh, emperor Hirohito struggled with a very complex and ambiguous role that was assigned to him under the Meiji Constitution of 1889-1890. Uh, this placed him in, as she puts it, the impossible position where simultaneously he exercised the role of a constitutional monarch with nominal power and at the same time reigned over a country with effectively a warrant for absolute power. He conceived his proper role uh, was to accept consensus recommendations from his government and high command, uh, the high command of the armed forces, he did uh, pose pointed questions to his uh, officials at times. He also had some influence in appointments, but he did not act as a final decision maker on domestic, military, or foreign policy uh, throughout his reign, with one uh, major exception prior to Pearl Harbor. And this single occasion was quite significant. And this is where he exercised decisive personal leadership uh, this was an attempted coup d'etat by Imperial Army officers on the uh, 26th of February, 1936. The revolt struck directly into the Emperor's close staff, uh, killing uh, one of his chief advisors, the Lord Keeper, the Privy Seal, and near fatally wounding the Grand Chamberlain, Admiral uh, Suzuki Kantaro, who would be Japan's last Prime Minister before uh, Pearl Harbor, and would still have the bullets uh, of that attack in his body at the time. He was the prime minister. Uh, these events struck uh, shockingly and directly into uh, the emperor's uh, view of the situation, and he reacted with tremendous anger. Uh, when the government military leadership failed to act uh, quickly to quell the uh, revolt, Hirohito pointedly put on his uniform as commander-in-chief of the armed forces and issued a directive through his military aide de camp that the re rebellion must be ended, as he put it, immediately, unquote. And that sort of sets up uh, uh, Professor Kawamura's comments. And with that, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Rich. Um, I have a PowerPoint. 
presentation. Okay. There you thank go. You. It's up. Hope mm -hmm. it'll work. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to this great conference. I have no, I had never been to New Orleans. This is my first visit, and I'm so grateful for everybody who uh, were willing to uh, invite me here. And uh, today, I would like to focus on Emperor Hirohito's role. And uh, uh, the previous speakers already covered excellent uh, sort of ground for the road to Pearl Harbor, so I will try not to repeat the same information. Um, but I have to confess, I'm not really, I wasn't trained as a military historian. I was a diplomatic historian by training and international relations. Um, but then I was drawn to the subject of World War I, World War II, and now I'm working on the Cold War. And I have to explain why um, the, really, I was studying uh, the diplomacy and the statecrafts. But then the most uh, difficult topic to study was the decision for war, that threshold to, to make a decision to go to war. Why do people make that decision? And uh, so that was the sort of reason and st I started to study. And uh, Emperor Hirohito uh, really embodied that sort of the difficult sp spot he was placed on to make that decision. Well, he didn't, but he allowed others to make decision and sanctioned it. So I will put it that way. Um, but does this work? You have to get it up a little ah. higher. It seems to want to. Oops, it's not working. Oh, that's our uh, slide's not working here. No. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm advertising my book here already, but um, the Emperor Hirohito was one of the most controversial figure in the uh, uh, Pacific War, and. Um, the, there was this famous question that came from Tokyo war crimes trial, and the people were asking why, you know, if the emperor uh, possessed the power to stop the war on August 15th through his so-called Seidan, the sacred imperial decision, why did he permit war to start in the first place? And uh, many historians pursued that line of questioning to examine Hirohito. So I started with that question, but as I started to research on him, I had to reverse the question really based on, through the lens of Emperor Hirohito, I realized that it's better to put the question this way, that is my question, if the emperor could not prevent the military from going to war with the United States in December 1941, why was he able to end the war in August 1945? Um, so, so basically the book kind of follows that line of questioning. Um, but today's question that I would like to uh, pursue in this talk, is, very brief talk, is uh, the role that Emperor Hirohito played in the decision, Japan's decision to go to war with the United States. And uh, the, the, this slide basically uh, explains the power structure of uh, a Japanese government and the military uh, under Meiji constitution. But things changed from 1860s, 90s, and then all the way to 1941. And by 1941, the structure that uh, Meiji constitution created no longer was working well, and uh, the, the people who were in power were all dead. They called it Genro. And the uh, um, emperor was supposed to be a divine figure and so forth. He was sovereign and the commander in chief, but the uh, emperor personally was in favor of acting like the British monarch meaning constitutional monarch who, try, who would allow the government and the military to make recommendations for him to accept. And so by 1941, Emperor Hirohito was acting more like a ratifier of national policies that were recommended by uh, the government and the military. In the meantime, uh, the, the 
military organization, the army and navy, um, the, there was this inherent uh, shortcoming in the Meiji constitutional stru structure, that is that the navy and army did not work together well, and they were separated, and they were doing their own things separately, and they were almost like rivalry, rivals. Uh, they competed for power and money. And so from in 1930s, after Sino-Japanese War started, they created something called the Imperial General Headquarter so that uh, the whole country, will, the military will be united. But in reality, general headquarters was divided into army division and navy division, so they were not working together. And the only person or the institution that was linking the two was the imperial court, the emperor. And so emperor really had the difficulty trying to coordinate army and navy. And uh, that became the whole problem throughout uh, the First war with China, and then later the Pacific War, mainly with the United States and Britain. Um, well, I just don't have a lot of time, and there is no time already showing. I don't know how many more minutes, yeah. but uh, um, so Emperor Hirohito was born into the throne, and so he was the moment he was born as the oldest son, he became the uh, the crown prince, and. Uh, Conveniently, he was born in 1901, so you can roughly calculate how old when he was, when he became emperor. He was about 26 to 27 years old, and then at the time of Pearl Harbor decision, he was uh, no, not yet 40, uh, about to become 40. And so he was surrounded by a lot of senior advisors. And, um, um, Skip to one. Yeah. So the key figures uh, in the decision making, I would say, prime ministers, and then the road keeper of the previous seal, Kido Koichi, those are the most important advisors to the emperor. They are the ones who will uh, make uh, convey the decisions of the government, and and then. Uh, the interesting thing is Konoe, the Prime Minister Konoe, who stepped down in October 1941, uh, was a classmate of roadkeeper Kido. And so they had close communication, but in the end they're going to start developing disagreements. But they are more senior to the emperor, so emperor listened to these people. And then there was, of course, General Tojo, but I'll talk about jo Tojo later. And then the, if you look at the military leadership, uh, those are really senior uh, ge you know, generals and admirals. And at the time of Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the chief of the general staff in the army was General uh, Sugiyama, and the army was Admiral Nagano. Um, General Sugiyama was more like reflect, like conveying the, all the decisions and recommendations made by his uh, subordinate younger officers who were more hawkish, hardliners. And uh, in the army, uh, army was split. Uh, there were a lot of uh, people who did not want to go to war with the United States and Britain because they looked at the Anglo-American powers, navies, as a model and teachers. But then there was this hardliners, and the Admiral uh, Nagumo, I'm sorry, Nagano, came from that hardline group. It, there was a serious division between the two. And um, as uh, uh, Rich and others mentioned, Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto was against the war with the United States because he, you know, he knew Japan was not going to uh, be able to defeat the United States in the end, particularly you know, in the case of prolonged war. In the meantime, in civilian section, uh, foreign ministry was run by uh, foreign minister Togo, and he was going to be placed in a very difficult position. Uh, he will advise to the emperor. Emperor had a lot of close sort of agreement with Togo, but Togo had no real control over the relationship and negotiation between United States and Japan in the last several months. 
um, of, you know, on the road to Pearl Harbor. I um, don't think I have time to uh, really go into those details, uh, but the, uh, I think previous uh, speakers already covered it. Uh, I will just uh, add one more thing about Japan-US relationship. I, you know, to put it simply, I think that Japan and the United States went to war, or Japan declared war on the United States for at least two issues. One was China, and the other was of course, oil embargo, um, or freezing of Japanese assets in the United States. And the China part was not emphasized, so I would like to add. And um, I think uh, June 1914 was indeed the turning point because Japan uh, wanted to uh, uh, you know, move to the French Indochina so that Japan, Japanese military could stop uh, the British and American military support that was provided to China. Japan's problem all along was that it was not able to end the war with China, that Japan started in 1937, and it was prolonging, uh, and then the Allied, I'm sorry, British and Americans started to support Jiang Kai-shek, and uh, so Japan wanted to stop that military supply route known as Burma Road, and uh, in the, in the, on the map, I think, yeah. And, and so that, that was another, one, of, one of the main reasons why Japan wanted air bases in northern French Indochina, besides natural resources. Now, diplomatic negotiations, uh, is, okay, I, uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, so diplomatic relations uh, between the United States and Japan, of course it was an embargo, and uh, the, of course, fatal uh, problem was Jap uh, Japan's decision to move to northern, I'm sorry, southern French Indochina, and that triggered uh, uh, the FDR's decision to freeze uh, Japanese assets in the United States, and that led to the virtual oil embargo. One of the myths is that oil embargo was not, uh, you know, uh, ordered by President Roosevelt. Rather, the freezing of Japanese asset led to a de facto embargo of, uh, of petroleum products and uh, the raw oil uh, from the United States. And that was all done by State Department and the Department of Treasury and so forth. So by the time FDR realized that uh, um, oil embargo was in place in reality, he could not reverse that decision. And that was sort of unfortunate because, as we all know, oil embargo was the main reason for Japan's countdown to Pearl Harbor, really. And Japan's timeline, I um, think that uh, there are several points of no return September 6th Imperial Conference was one of them, uh, where they, they, they decided to prepare for war preparation in one and a half months. But the emperor actually uh, uh, expressed his opinion by reading, citing his grandfather, Emperor Meiji's uh, poem. He, uh, basically this poem conveys that um, you know, you know, he preferred peaceful diplomatic negotiations over war preparation and going to war with the United States. But then this conference cut, put a sort of deadline, mid-October. By then, if diplomacy failed, Japan was going to start preparation for war. And Behind uh, this, I, I think I will just, don't have time, so I'm gonna just uh, conclude the emperor's role, okay. So basically, on the road to Pearl Harbor, uh, my main argument is that Emperor Hirohito was personally against uh, going to war with the United States, and then he did his best by exerting his influence to delay the war decision for one and a half months from mid-October deadline to another one and a half months all the way to December 1st. 
but after that he could not uh, uh, do any more. But then the funny thing is, um, because diplomacy did not uh, produce desired outcome under Konoe administration, Konoe stepped down. Then Emperor and the Kido, Lord Keeper, had to find a replacement, and they chose General Tojo. And why did he choose Tojo, the, most, the leading advocate of war, uh, to, to, to place in on the prime minister's job? And that is a puzzling question, but I don't have time to explain <laughs> it, do I? Well, that's why we have the Q&A. Yeah, okay. so well, I probably will save that to the question and answer because I'm over, <laughs> I overspent my time, I'm sorry. Very good. Uh, also present uh, this morning, of course, is John Parshall, who's no stranger to these proceedings. Uh, he's been a friend of the museum for quite some time. He participates in these conferences. He, produced stunning maps for the museum. He's also a participant in the travel program uh, and been a very uh, wonderful uh, friend of the museum uh, through all of this. Uh, you can read his biography also, uh, bi biographical sketch in the program. Uh, let me get, again, right to the heart of the, heart of the things. The most important thing uh, in his resume is that he is the co-author with Andrew Tully of the widely hailed work Shattered Sword, uh, the best account of the Battle of Midway by far. It's a rare work that uh, blows away dense encrustations of myth and expose the true story of what really happened in this important part of the history. It's also wonderfully balanced and engaging read. Uh, John is, uh, uh, with respect to this writing, he enjoys a particularly warm glow of adulation by both legions of historians and, and uh, readers for setting up a key moment in the story of the battle with the following immortal phrase, quote, there will be a brief pause before the bombing commences, unquote. It doesn't get any better than that. John? <laughs> I'm gonna go full podium here. Uh, if we could put up my first slide. I'm gonna spend the next 17 minutes or so charging through uh, a rapid history of the Japanese side of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So without further ado, what I want to cover here is talk about the strategic objectives of the attack, what were the Japanese trying to accomplish, then I'm going to take a look at some of the officers that were involved in that process. We'll take a look at uh, how the attack unfolded versus its actual planning. I'm going to touch on the fuel tank myth, the infamous fuel tank myth, uh, because I know that we'll be talking about that during the counterfactual session uh, this afternoon. And then finally, a quick assessment of the operation. The reason the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor was because the bulk of their war plans were actually oriented towards the south for the very simple reason that all of the economic uh, targets that they needed to capture were located in this region, the oil, the tin, the rubber, and so forth. And the last thing that they wanted while they were undertaking this campaign was to suffer an American counterattack coming across the Central Pacific and hitting them in the flank and the rear. And so the idea was to attack Pearl Harbor and take that American fleet out of the equation. The implement that they were going to use for this uh, is First Air Fleet, often known by its operational sobriquet Kido Butai, or the mobile force. Uh, which is composed of all six of Japan's large flight decks, more than 400 aircraft. This is the most powerful naval aviation force in the world at this point in time. In terms of officers, of course, everybody knows uh, the name of Yamamoto as being sort of the, the architect of this attack. But you have to understand that Yamamoto is, of course, also responsible for all of the naval actions that are going to be going on uh, throughout the campaign down in the south as well. And so he passes planning of the actual details of this attack off to one of his senior planners, a gentleman named Kurashima, who is a strange monk-like uh, figure 
who also rode herd over a gang of junior planning officers, each of whom was slated to do one thing. You know, you're in charge of fuel, you're in charge of navigation, you're in charge of weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And then Kurashima amalgamated all of those uh, activities into a unified plan of campaign and wrote the actual operational order. But of course, Kurashima has to be interfacing with the officers within Kitabutai as well, who are actually going to be undertaking the attack. The most important of those being, of course, Admiral Nagumo, who is the commander of the task force. But Nagumo is not an air guy. He is a torpedo officer, a surface warfare officer. And so Nagumo, in turn, is leaning on certain members of his staff, uh, the most important being Admiral Kusaka, his chief of staff, who is an aviation expert. Um, to handle the actual nuts and bolts of how to build this attack. Also very important is uh, Commander Genda, who is really seen as sort of the house genius. Uh, Genda is a former fighter pilot, uh, a well-known air advocate, and is the air officer in Kutabutai. So he's really in charge of, of building the air component of this attack. And finally, Commander Fuchida, who is the air officer aboard Akagi, and who is also going to be in charge of the overall united attack force once all of those aircraft are up in the air. The operational objectives are relatively straightforward. Uh, they want to sink at least four American battleships because battleships at this time are the coin of the realm in terms of measuring naval power. And so if, if we inflict that level of destruction on the Americans, that'll be a devastating blow and will prevent the American fleet from sallying forth. They obviously also want to sink any carriers that happen to be in the area. And the overall goal then is to buy a six-month respite so that the Japanese can do what they need to do down in the southern resource area. And there's sort of an unwritten fourth operational goal, which is to destroy American morale at the outset of this conflict, as has been alluded to by some of our earlier speakers. Um, they're hoping that by launching this devastating blow against the Americans, they can put us in a position where hopefully we'll come to the bargain, bargaining table very early on. If we take a look at Kurashima's targeting orders that are passed down to Kitobutai, uh, what you see is a list of six objectives. At the top of that list is land-based air power for the very simple reason that the Japanese do not want Oahu's aircraft to be able to reach out and counterattack against their carrier force. And then after that, aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, other combatants. And then towards the bottom of the list, you, think, you see things like port facilities and land installations. So let's take a look at uh, planning and then execution of this attack. Some of the main features that you see coming out of the planning process are that the Japanese are going to use two attack waves. Uh, almost all of the aircraft from those six carriers will be launched against Oahu. They're going to come in two waves uh, so as to inflict as much damage as possible against the Americans. They're going to use specialized weapons against specialized targets, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And there are going to be simultaneous attacks against not only the naval anchorage, but of course against all of the major airfields on Oahu as well, with the intent of suppressing American air power. And that's something to keep in mind, because we as Americans, I think, tend to overfocus on what's going on in the harbor, because of course that's where the majority of the destruction actually occurs occurred. Um, but during this naval attack that's going on, keep in mind that there's this constant drum beat of attacks against the airfields. And in fact, if you take a look at the number of aircraft that are involved in these various missions, this is actually something that Rich pointed out to me uh, a few weeks ago, you can see that they actually use more aircraft for attacks against airfields and air suppression than they do against the, the anchorage itself. So the target area, uh, this is Pearl Harbor, and of course the most important target within Pearl Harbor is going to be Battleship Row. And one of the problems that we have here that's already been discussed is that the water in the harbor is very shallow and you can't use torpedoes on it. And so what the Japanese do is they modify their Type 91 torpedoes with wooden fins so that they dive less deeply and they'll be able to use those against the outboard battleships. The inboard battleships we can't get at with torpedoes, so we're going to use uh, level bombers uh, flying parallel up battleship row that are going to be dropping these Type 99 uh, heavy armor piercing bombs, which are modified 16-inch naval shells that will have sufficient kinetic energy of drop from about 10,000 feet to get through the deck armor of those battleships. So if we take a look at the execution of the attack itself, 
As planned, uh, the torpedo planes were supposed to approach basically from all points of the compass and go after the aircraft carriers which were hoped to be on the west side of Ford Island and then attack Battleship Row on the east side of Ford Island. But what ends up happening uh, in the heat of battle is that these torpedo pilots decide they want as much water uh, as they can get to line up their attack runs. And so what you see, particularly in the case of the torpedo planes that go after Battleship Row, is that they sort of get channelized into the southeast lock and just parade down that lock uh, and, and take very bad casualties towards the end of that run because a lot of these uh, planes are shot down because surprise has, has worn off by that point in the attack. Nevertheless, if we take a look at the uh, efficacy of the torpedo attack itself, what you see is uh, they devastate the inner two most battleships with five and seven hits apiece. They also leave the California in a sinking condition with two torpedo hits as well. So the torpedoes uh, take three American battleships uh, right off uh, the roster and also damage uh, the Nevada. Next, and almost simultaneously, the level bombing attack is also occurring. And the Japanese don't have as good luck uh, with this attack. They do manage to put 10 bombs on or relatively close to targets, uh, some of which perform moderate damage, but they suffer a lot of dud fuses from those Type 99 bombs and don't get the results out of them that they really would have hoped for, except, of course, for one notable exception, which is the Arizona, whose forward magazines are uh, destroyed and kills about three quarters of the crew instantly. So if you take a look again at the first wave damage, as Rich alluded to, the first 10 minutes of this attack inflict probably 90% of the damage, and they leave uh, four American battleships sunk or sinking uh, and three more damaged. The second wave then comes in, and this is composed almost entirely of dive bombers uh, along with some fighters for air suppression. And we've already seen this picture um, earlier today. This is the, the site that greets the Japanese as they, they come into the harbor area. Uh, extensive anti-aircraft fire, large uh, fires and smoke billowing over the harbor, and also the cloud cover has, has sort of socked in the harbor as well. So this is a lousy set of conditions to actually try to do a, a dive bombing attack, and the results show. So if we take a look at uh, the hits that are inflicted by the dive bombers in this second attack, you see sort of a smattering around here, um, mostly down in the repair basin, and famously, of course, the battleship Nevada, which is trying to exit the channel, is swarmed uh, by VALs and takes a number of hits, and she ends up getting beached by Hospital Point as a result. The problem for the Japanese, though, is that uh, despite having, you know, run Nevada aground, they actually had some more applicable targets uh, that they sort of did not go after. A dive bomber bomb is not a very useful weapon against the heavy deck armor on a battleship. Uh, a series of cruisers would have been much, much better. And in fact, there was a, a group of four large, juicy cruisers uh, sitting over here in the southeast lock, New Orleans, San Francisco, St. Louis, and Honolulu, all of whom are going to have very active careers in 1942. It would have been much better to have taken those four ships out of action rather than disabling the third oldest battleship in the U.S. inventory. Finally, in terms of uh, the fuel tank myth, uh, which has been an endless source of speculation down through the years, and that is the notion that if the Japanese had simply come back with a, another attack from their carriers later in the afternoon and attacked both the repair facilities and, of course, the fuel tanks that are around Pearl Harbor, that that would have dealt uh, a devastating blow to the American war effort and might have sent the Pacific Fleet back to California. Um, the way that this came down to us, frankly, is uh, through a movie that I'm sure a lot of us have seen here. And this is Tora Tora Tora, and this is the actual segment of the movie that gives us this myth. You know, our man Fuchida lands back on board, the Akagi gets out of his aircraft, goes up to the crew chief, you know, what's going on? Why isn't the, the next attack wave getting ready to, to take off? And he's told, you know, we've received no orders to that effect. And Fuchida looks up at the bridge of Akagi to his buddy Genda. Genda looks down at Fuchida and decides to go have a conversation with Nagumo. Genda says to Nagumo, you know, we, we can't turn back now. We have to go back and hit the Americans again, destroy their carriers and their dock facilities. 
and is then reprimanded very sharply by Nagumo, Chigao, you're wrong. We have accomplished our mission, and furthermore, the safety of this carrier force is paramount. Uh, this war is just beginning, and I'm going to preserve that force, and I'm going to take it back to Japan, at which point the flags go up on Akagi uh, that the force is turning for home, and Fuchida is a very unhappy character on the flight deck. None of this happened. <laughs> None of this happened, OK? And if you, if you want the, the grisly details, you know, hit me up at the bar tonight, and I'll be happy to bend your ear. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a myth. And the person that gave us that myth is none other than Fuchida himself, uh, who in a series of interviews given in 1963 to Gordon Prang, convinced Prang that, you know, this is what went down. Prang then, as screenwriter for Tora Tora Tora, bakes it into the movie, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, in fact, the, the most simple disputation of this myth is to simply look again at those targeting orders. What Fuchida would have you believe is that, okay, we've only sort of nibbled our way into item number three on our targeting list, but I'm telling you, I've had this mental epiphany that all we need to do is jump down to the bottom of the targeting list and that's going to turn this war around. To have done that would have represented nothing less than the repudiation of 15 years worth of training and indoctrination on the part of Mitsuo Fuchida as a naval officer. It's nonsense, and it never happened. So if we take a look at an overall assessment of the attack itself, I think you can say three things. Um, first, it was revolutionary. There was no other Navy on Earth at this time that could have pulled off an attack of this scale and sophistication. You know, think about what they did here. They came 3,500 miles across the ocean with six carriers. They shut down a major naval bastion and not only, you know, crushed the air power on the island, but also attacked the harbor itself in the course of two hours worth of attacks. So no one could have done this except the Japanese at this point in time. On the other hand, as, as I pointed out, there were some real flaws in terms of the tactical execution uh, of this attack, particularly in the second wave. And if, if you want more information on that, there's actually a really good article in this month's Naval History uh, magazine written by Alan Zim that talks about the failure of the second wave attack as far as the Japanese were concerned. So the Japanese left money on the table that they, they could have used to better effect in the campaign that's going to unfold in the next year. In terms of their operational objectives, you know, tactically uh, that plays into operations. Um, you can say, you know, did they sink four American battleships? Yes, they did. Objective achieved. Did they sink American carriers? No, sadly they didn't. Did they buy a six-month respite for operations? Eh, I'm going to give them this one. You know, the Battle of Coral Sea happens exactly five months to the day after Pearl Harbor. So five months, six months, I'm going to give them that one. It's that unwritten fourth objective, though, to destroy American morale at the outset of this war that is a disastrous failure, that in fact, uh, the way that this attack was commenced and carried out against the Americans, uh, as we all know, enraged American public opinion and, in effect, took any possibility of a negotiated settlement to this war right off the table at the outset. So from a grand strategic uh, perspective, the attack was an absolute disaster for the Japanese. Thank you very much. Let me add one detail I've always uh, in, savored, and that's Fuchida in his uh, creative uh, post-war life. Creative. Creative. Yes. Very creative. And eventually, in the 1960s, he applies for and receives uh, an American green card for permanent residence in the U.S. I have been on a search for some time in our archives to find the application form for the green card because I wanted to see what he wrote in the block, prior occupation. <laughs> <laughs> so now for the round table, uh, oh, let me go first to uh, Noriko. Uh, uh, Emperor Hiro Hito acted twice to intervene decisively during the war. Uh, uh, really, uh, I'm sorry, let me spool that back. 
He intervened only twice decisively to intervene in domestic or foreign policy between 1926 and 1945. Uh, he didn't act, as we've talked about, in 1941. He did act in August 1945. But do you see any common threads linking his actions both in 41 and in 45? Um, the, because he believed that his role was to uh, take the recommendation and sanction it, and uh, in December, or oh, actually, yeah, this, in fall of 1941, the decision for war came as a unanimous recommendation, both government and the military. Now, uh, in 1945, that unanimous decision was not there. The leadership was divided into really half, uh, big six was divided to three in favor of accepting post declaration and surrender, and the other three fight to the bitter end. So that division in the, uh, the, the government and the military leadership sort of allowed him, or he felt that he had to, and that in fact, he was asked to express his opinion. And so that's what he did. And that was unprecedented. In, in the entire history of his reign up to 1945, he was never asked to speak his own mind in the Imperial Conference. And that's what happened in nine, summer of 1945. And so that was considered as his intervention, uh, but because he was asked. And we've talked about this before, but another element overarching over this is, was his sense of stewardship of the Imperial Institution and, and maintenance. And, and I think you've mentioned, you talk about this in the book, is that that was really a critical factor both in 41 and in 45. He was concerned about maintenance of the imperial institution. Mm -hmm. Would that be also part of it? Yes, he was always worried about him as a sovereign to preserve the state of Japan. And uh, um, so that was his primary responsibility. Uh, and I guess the other question, and this this is a question that, uh, or an issue that most Americans uh, who only have a light understanding of this would find hard to believe. But was the emperor had to have a good reason to be concerned that even if he gives an order to the military, he might not, in fact, be obeyed? Mm -hmm. Yes. He um, actually, in my book, I tried to demonstrate that he did express his opinion, and then he was uh, reprimanded for that. And first, in the, it was like uh, his decision to uh, suggest the prime minister to step down after the incident of assassination of Zhang Zhaolin, the warlord in Manchuria, that was 1928. He was very young and inexperienced. Uh, and then second time was um, uh, the, um, well, I wouldn't say, I'm sorry, it's not second time, but um, um, there are many times, Manchurian incident, uh, he was not in favor of using, spreading the military occupation of Manchuria. But it was more obvious at the time of that Marco Polo Bridge incident, I, uh, I was able to demonstrate he, his opinion was that he was against expansion of military operation uh, in the Tianjin and the Beijing area. And uh, he actually said, do not move my forces but army completely ignored it. And so his opinion didn't count. And then at the time of Pearl Harbor, the officers knew he was not in favor of war. He wanted negotiation to continue. That's why I skipped my, the slide, but uh, uh, the General Muto in the uh, war ministry, uh, that's the sort of home ground of hardliners. and. Uh, uh, they, they were determined to persuade the emperor to uh, accept the army's recommendation. And when he read that peace poem, uh, they realized, oh, no, emperor is not in favor of war, so now we're going to have to keep you know, working hard right. and to persuade him. And, and so it was always the case that the army had the chance to basically over 
right emperor's personal opinion. Right. And uh, he he never trusted the army ever since uh, 1937. And he even used the word, are you lying to me? But, you know, it's an interesting thing about royalty to the emperor that army claimed to embrace on one hand and also army's defiance against that sort of personal thoughts of coming from the throne. Yes, uh, right. it's interesting. Yeah. It is. It Contradiction. Is. Uh, John. Time for my grilling. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out whether we're going to move straight to crucifixion or no. Uh, <laughs> uh, to what degree, do, to, to me, one, one point that's interesting is, to what degree do you think Yamamoto's original vision of the attack differed from what it became after again down the planning process went forward? You know, it's interesting because I, I, I too started taking my deep dive before uh, the conference to kind of go back through some things and um, came into some additional primary sources that actually our mutual friend Mike Wenger, who is working on a series of books on Pearl Harbor, um, shared with me. The whole planning process is really opaque. You don't really have a good understanding for how much input Yamamoto even had into the process. It really, the more I read the interviews with, with Kurishima, it really seems to be more Kurishima's baby. Um, the, the one point that I would make that I, I think is fairly clear, though, is that you can see that Yamamoto is, is primarily focused on strategic and morale issues. That's why I'm going after battleships. And yet, at the operator level, Genda and the other flyers are like, well, yeah, yeah we're pushing carriers up the, the, up the priority list, thank you very much, because we know that if we actually get into a war that we have to destroy those vessels. And so the targeting list that I showed you there is, is only one of two targeting lists that I've seen, and the other one actually reverses uh, the position of carriers and battleships on there. So there, there seems to be some sort of a tug of war going on between Yamamoto, actually, and some of the first air fleet flyboys who are, who are trying to figure out, you know, who's, whose priorities come out on top. Yeah. And the second point I want to make, this usually gets overlooked because of all, there's so many other major issues that seem to go on, but one of the things that's striking when you really do the deep dive is the weather the Kido Butai was steaming into when they yeah. launched that first strike was abysmal. Atrocious. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not remarked upon, but... Uh, these ships were rolling at the time of takeoff, uh, in some cases up to 18 degrees on either beam. Um, and particularly the, the two smaller carriers, Soryu and Hiryu of, of Carrier Division 2. Um, these are not ideal conditions to be taking off a heavily loaded bomber, you know, with a torpedo or what have you. Um, and Fuchida made the statement that if this exercise had been going on during peacetime, of course, they never would have you know, launch combat operations. At the time of uh, when they got the pilots up to the flight deck, you couldn't tell black from white. It was so so dark and overcast and pitching. So, yeah, miserable conditions. Okay. Highly okay. dangerous. Jeremy, well, let's, uh, let's turn it over to the, our wonderful audience. It helps when you turn the microphone on. That's Jeremy. amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the first question is to your right towards the back, please. I hope my question is worth turning it back on. Um, uh, timing of, of all these big issues is always uh, uh, obviously critical. And in a subtle way, I, I'm curious, uh, given the fact that, that the military was at its least ready military, defense-wise, on a Sunday morning when soldiers who had been in, in Honolulu at night uh, were, were, many of them did not even come back. My good friend, his, uh, her father survived because he with his friends were intoxicated in Honolulu, never made it back to the Arizona, and that on a Sunday morning when the bands were getting ready for church, that the, the timing of this is absolutely precisely the weakest point of our readiness. Does that, and the intelligence that possibly came out of uh, the spies that were in the Japanese embassy, uh, 
in Honolulu for some time, did, did they fully understand, that was their planning so specific to those weaknesses? Yeah, um, yes it was. I mean, they, they did have a spy in Honolulu, and I'm spacing his name now, because I'm that poor a scholar. Um, what? Uh, the, uh, Ned? Yeah, yeah the, the, Ned Wilmot? No, 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 no. Uh, the Japanese spy in, in Honolulu at the tea house. Oh, oh uh, uh, yeah, okay, good. I got that, you. That too. guy. Gotcha. Uh, okay. That guy. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, it starts Kawa, and I've forgotten the rest of it. Yes. Takeo Yoshikawa. Yoshikawa. Oh, okay, um, there we yeah, go. no, they, they absolutely, the Japanese did have a very good sense for uh, what I want to say, the, the weekly cycle of operations that are going on with the Pacific Fleet at this point, that they know that Sunday is, is a day of rest and that most of those ships are probably going to be back uh, in harbor uh, and may not be fully manned as a result. So, yeah, absolutely, they wanted to time the attack. On a, on a Sunday for those reasons. Um, one thing I would add, and, and I, this is a plug again for Mike Wenger, I've, I've seen uh, some of the scholarship that he started to drag out uh, in terms of the contingency plans that the Japanese had. What if that fleet had been in Lahaina? What if some of it had been here and some of it had been there? What if it were just off the, the harbor mouth? And again, we can talk about in the, in the counterfactual session what might have happened. But the Japanese did have uh, a very detailed set of plans in hand for what they would do if they had to go after the fleet in a different location, if it didn't conform to those operational patterns that they had seen. Yeah, one, one thing that came out in the post-war hearings, post-war evidence, was that uh, Yoshikawa was specifically asked about what would be the most opportune day or time to attack, and he said Sunday. And this gets back to one of the missed opportunities, which was that there was, uh, as part of a larger effort, an, off, uh, an opportunity to close down the Japanese consulates, not the embassy in Washington, but the consulates that were in various locations, including Honolulu. Yoshikawa's information was so critical to understanding the movements of the fleet and the location of the fleet that had we closed the consulate down and he would have had to uh, trundle off, that quite possibly that might have, uh, might have caused cancellation of the plan. Mm -hmm. Towards the front, all the way to your right, please. Given the disaster at Midway and the surge in U.S. war readiness and production by the end of 1942, would it have ever been possible for the Japanese, either strategically and or politically, to retreat to a position to better defend their territory in the far west Pacific? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, what I, okay, so I'm working on this never-ending tome on 1942 that you know may come out before I die, and um, you know you have to go into uh, Japanese strategy making in sort of the, the March time frame of 1942, one of the problems that they had was uh, an inability to know when to say when. Um, that given the fact that you have the football, if you will, um, they always wanted to keep, keep that momentum. You know, I've, I've got the advantage now, I want to press home my attacks. And that ends up forcing them into this sort of never-ending series of territorial agglomerations that didn't actually do them any good in terms of, you know, keeping a hold of the stuff that they actually needed to keep a hold of. So, for instance, you take Rabal, because Rabal is going to be the linchpin of our, you know, defense in the, in the Solomons area. Well, you know, if we have Rabal now, now we need some outposts to defend Rabal from attack. And if you take those outposts, oh my god, they need outposts too. And pretty soon, you know, you're, yeah, you're, you're grabbing stuff that really has no strategic value to you whatsoever. I don't with, with respect to Rob Satino and the whole topic, topic of inevitability, um, I don't see any real way that the Japanese can win this war after Pearl Harbor went down the way it went down. Again, if you've taken the negotiated settlement route off the table at the beginning of this conflict, as long as the Americans maintain the political will to stay within this war, the disparity of productive forces is so incredibly lopsided that I just can't see any way that they can win. So. Noriko, do you think uh, the emperor was interested in settling it up in uh, 42? Yeah, he actually asked the military uh, leaders, 
how, I, uh, how they are going to finish the war, how the exit strategy. Before he uh, sanctioned Pearl Harbor, uh, decision to go to war right. with the US, he asked the military leaders, uh, how are you going to end this? And they didn't have answer. They didn't, yeah. And that's how desperate they were. And they didn't fight this war to win. They just wanted to have, as earlier speakers said, uh, they wanted to have a sort of position of strength secure the first six months to a year yeah. or so, and then negotiate peace. And that was the only option they had. And so, but then the emperor, because he asked, come up with an exit strategy, please. And so the Tojo administration came up with uh, some sort of plan to you know, end the war, but it was never executed. And I asked actually the military historians in Japan, working at the Defense Institute, and they said, oh, that was, what you call, victory disease. Victory. Yeah. That's what they said, yeah. and they just yeah. don't know the answer to it. Yeah. That's, that's actually uh, a thread. I was just reading uh, William Morley's um, series of, of books, you know, The Path to War, and uh, he was talking about the immediate aftermath of Nomenhan, and we had a question about that this morning. And the, the Japanese were struggling with the issue of, you know, is now the time to normalize or, or adjust our relations with the Soviet Union in the, in the wake of this defeat at Nomenhan? And the answer from the military then was, well, we have to win a victory first. You know, we can't negotiate from a place of weakness. We have to win first, and then we'll negotiate. And so you see this thread in 42, and you certainly see it in 1945 that, you know, yes, we know that we've lost the war, but we're going to beat them on the beaches in Japan, and then we're going to bring them to the negotiating table. And this thread, you know, recurs through the whole war, and it's never successful for them. Let, let me just add one code to that, and that's that, uh, once again, get back to this theme, uh, which I talk about in this uh, second volume. You, you'll have to buy it, of course, to read all of this. Uh, but, you know, when you, once again, when you, when you remove the perspective we've had of looking back over the rubble of Tokyo and Berlin in 1945, and you look at events as they were seen by Americans up to mid-1942, and you look at the record of the anti-fascist forces up to that point, it's an incredibly grim story. I mean, the touting of the Japanese and the Germans that they're, they're unbeatable does not seem to be like a wild claim up through that period. In fact, up through mid-1942, it goes on. Uh, historian uh, greatly admired Richard Overy in a book about how the Allies won, made the observation that any reasonable person in the first half of 1942 uh, knowing only what they knew then would not have been able to predict the outcome of the war. And, and so it went literally into mid-42. So the Japanese were not entirely deluded through mid-42 that, well, maybe this is all eventually going to work out, or whatever here, which I'm sure uh, impeded any thoughts about trying to get out of the war as fast as possible. Yeah. Well, if Rich gets to plug his next book, I'm going to plug our next conference. Richard Overy has actually agreed to be the opener for next year's conference. And we'll have more information about 2022 in between the sessions. Next question to your left, panelists. Uh, given the fact that the um, Japanese did end up uh, surprising us at Pearl Harbor, if they had accomplished what they wanted to, which was to have a declaration of war before the attack happened, um, if they had had their declaration of war, it was on the table, and then the attack had happened, and devastating that it, let's assume it was still devastating, would that have changed that morale thing that you were talking about with, because um, one of the reasons the Americans were so fired up was because it was a surprise attack. Yeah, um, I think the answer to that is unknowable, but my broad sense is I don't think it would have changed it that dramatically. I still think we would have just been absolutely outraged. That's my two cents. Rich, I, I I agree with that. I mean, it's it's a, no, a noble, but uh, you know, even even if they managed to do it like they did, if they delivered that note at 7:30 in the morning, uh, Hawaii time or whatever here, uh, people would still have viewed it as you know this was you know they were finagling you know it really wasn't a true prior declaration of war before they commenced the attack. Yeah, yeah. The bottom line is you've killed you know 3,000 of our of our service personnel. Gloves are off. So. Yeah. Next question is to your right, about halfway back with Connie. 
Okay, it's on. Um, really softball question. I like those. Yeah. How come the Japanese didn't know the three carriers were not in port? And I ask that softball question because obviously that guy, quote, that in guy. the embassy, was giving good operational information about the rhythm of cycle of ships in and out of Pearl Harbor. And the Japanese did traffic analysis. They listened to bursts of radio communication and concentrations, did the same kind of traffic analysis we did. If something is out there because there's communications going on, they might not know exactly what it was, but they, they did traffic analysis. So how come they didn't know the carriers were at sea? That's a really good question, too. Bear in mind that there's always a delay in when you actually receive that signal analysis and when you can actually you know, decode it, analyze it, do what you're going to do with it. And so there's a dissemination problem of that information as well. The other thing is that you know, I don't think that their, their picture was ever perfect as to where those vessels were. Um, the final thing I would say is that they were aware that the carriers were not there in the harbor because when they sent their uh, two float planes over early in the morning before the raid, they were made aware of the fact that, that those carriers were not present, which was a tremendous disappointment to them, but at this point you're committed and they couldn't very well you know, back down at that point. Well, the other thing I'd add is that you know, they made all this planning. The fleet actually sortied on the 25th of November. Mm -hmm. We had three carriers in the Pacific Fleet at that time. There were four over in the Atlantic. The Saratoga was undergoing normal maintenance on the West Coast. The only two that were in Pearl Harbor were the Lexington and the Enterprise. And they, serendipitously, were, were sent on missions to uh, send aircraft to both. Enterprise was taking aircraft to Midway. Lexington was taking aircraft to uh, uh, Wake Island. And they sailed in that interval after the striking force had already sailed and be, just before the attack. So. Uh, once, the, once the task force had sailed, uh, I don't think there was any going back at that point. Yeah. To your left, towards the front. Yeah. On the planning side, uh, Japanese sent five midget submarines uh, to Pearl Harbor, and, I, and I'm wondering uh, what they thought they could get accomplished, because they only had two torpedoes in, in each of them. And secondly, it would have been... Um, it jeopardized the mission because they, they obviously were seen there, and if we'd followed through, we would have been on a better fitting. What was their, their objective there? Yeah. Um, Yamamoto actually objected to the use of the midget submarines up until about the middle of October. Um, but at that point, the basic notion was if, if we're going to do this attack, we need to bring every possible weapon to bear, and we have an opportunity here to use these midget submarines, and they may be able to sneak into the harbor and do something. And so um, I, think, I think some of this you're seeing actually there's uh, almost uh, service pressure coming up from the various branches within the Imperial Navy. You know, we've got this weapon system. Come on, let's, let's use this thing. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right, too, that it was a tremendously risky asset to be using because it could give away the attack uh, before, it had, before the aerial attack actually came in. Yep. Good. Next. Uh, panelists, we're over here to your right in the middle. In hindsight, from the Japanese perspective, it seems incredibly short-sighted that they thought they could win the war even through a negotiated settlement. Was there anyone in the military or the government, uh, particularly before the embargo and the freezing of their assets, but even after, who thought it might be a better strategy to just purchase through negotiations the resources that they needed? Would you handle it? You want to address that? Um. Well, uh, once military took over the government, the only way they knew to settle the dispute is to use military solution. So um, the military was really, you know, particularly the army, uh, war faction, was uh, already, uh, they made their, their mind, or they had no other way. <laughs> 
but to resort to military solution, that is to go to war with the United States. Uh, well, earlier they talked, they, you know, there was a discussion about uh, maybe what if uh, attacks does British colonies or uh, the Dutch colonies to just to get oil, but that wasn't the, the military thinking. They, in their mind, the British and the Dutch were linked to the United States, and attacking the British or Dutch territory meant war with the United States. So their mind, they, their thinking was very simplistic in that regard. In the, and particularly Prime Minister Tojo who was, now I can sort of say, Emperor asked him to become prime minister to try negotiation one more time. And uh, it was proven wrong because Tojo was loyal to Emperor, so he said yes. So he tried one more negotiation, proposal A and B, but he put a deadline. November 30th is the cutting point. If the United States is, was not to, going to be persuaded to lift an oil embargo by November 30th, then Japan would go to war. And that's the mentality, the way the military was thinking about uh, how to use diplomatic negotiation. Plan A, plan B, and if that, that didn't work, then we're gonna go to war. That's sort of the way they thought. So really, there was nobody really could um, suggest or even recommend or persuade the military to go to diplomatic route because to avoid war, that was not in the thinking of the military in Japan, particularly in the golden age of militarism, I would say. So it's an inst institutional uh, problem in Japan at that time. Uh, the civilian, uh, particularly diplomats, were not in the position to prevail over the military. And one final note on that. I mean, we take it, uh, Americans take it so much for granted because this has been Im uh, embedded in our history and our constitution that the military is subordinate to the political leadership or whatever here. And it's always very difficult to address uh, an entirely different context that existed in Japan in that period. I was uh, talking with a Japanese scholar at a conference a couple of years ago and uh, I said to him, you know, it's, it's really difficult to convey this sort of thing about how Japanese decision-making processes were so dysfunctional. And I was alluding to the lack of supremacy of the civilian government. And he looked at me and he said, you should try explaining it to a Japanese population. <laughs> <laughs> Panelists to your left. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Kawamura, I was wondering, um, in your research of Hirohito, did you come up, uh, upon evidence that kind of talked about his, how he personally felt about putting uh, the death of so many of the Japanese youth in their decision? And I was just wondering if there was anything that you might elaborate on. Um. After I finished writing this book on the Pacific War, I am now writing uh, uh, Hirohito and the Cold War. The more I read whatever documents available in which he expressed his thoughts, um, it, I think he was haunted by uh, the whole war that he allowed to happen. Uh, and uh, that the, the next half century when he was uh, you know, still reigning as emperor, uh, the symbol of the nation, um, as a symbol of nation, he probably lived that whole World War II experience and uh, his role, I mean the war was after all fought in the name of emperor <laughs> Hirohito. And uh, the, so in that regard, I, I think his remorse was really deep, but the tragedy is that he was never allowed to express his uh, feeling or apology or remorse to the public, not only to the Japanese people, but also to all the victims of, of the, for Asia and the United States and the Allied powers as well. Once he actually drafted his apology, 
that he wanted to um, uh, publicize. And it's there, we saw it, but uh, at that time it was in, uh, you know, after Japan, uh, the occupation uh, was over. Um, I mean, American occupation of Japan was over, but, but at that time, uh, Prime Minister did not want that to be publicized. And so he never really expressed his any feelings of remorse to the public, but I felt that he was uh, deeply troubled. And at one point, in, uh, before he died, he, um, he was in a public speech, and he was just standing there listening to other people talking about uh, the war's legacy. He was in tears, and uh, that sort of thing was never broadcasted in Japan. But um, he, we don't know the uh, real, true feeling of him. He, him, uh, his. I'm sorry. Uh, in the in public record, that's the problem. But we cannot find it out because his documents are still sealed, and we can never read his diary or his own personal records. Wow, that is, uh, that's such an important point because that is at the heart of a lot of the animosity that still exists elsewhere in Asia, the lack of apology uh, by the Japanese government over the war. And that to know the emperor himself was attempting to do that, I think is a really, that's a really wonderful point to bring out at this conference. We have time for one, maybe two more questions. We're gonna go to your left towards the front here. Mr. Parshall, um, you were kind of on the fence about the effect on the Navy in the first six months of 1942. And I wanted to ask, given the shortage that the Pacific Fleet had of oilers and oiling capacity, even if the battleships at Pearl Harbor hadn't been damaged, wouldn't they have sat there the first six months of the war anyway? Weren't we really limited to carrier raids anyway? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a very perceptive point. In fact, if you read, um, uh, like John Lundstrom's uh, Black Shoe Carrier Admiral. He, he makes it very clear how incredibly tethered our carrier forces were to the oilers that were, you know, lurking just behind them. And in fact, if you lost a single oiler to a submarine attack or something untowards, that, that could, in, in essence, shut down that entire operation and the, and the carrier would have, to, would have to retreat. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I don't, I don't know, frankly, that we had any ability, even if those ships had been undamaged, to do the kind of a counterattack across the breadth of the Central Pacific that the Japanese were so scared of. Um, and even if we had, I don't know that the, that the battleship line would have been any use in that conflict, uh, certainly not against a, a consolidated Kido Butai. Um, in many ways, we got lucky, you know, with Pearl Harbor and that those ships weren't lost in deep water. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about that this afternoon as well. So, yeah, I, I think you're quite right that, that oilers really were sort of an unseen gating factor uh, at that time in the war. We've got time for one quick last question to your right, panelists. Well, I'll make it quick. <laughs> um, prior to the outset of the war, if um, Emperor Hirohito continued to say he did not want to go to war, was there any evidence that the mil Japanese military would assassinate him and take over everything? Um, perhaps assassination was not going to happen. I mean, even military could not <laughs> dare you know, assassinate the emperor. But there was a scenario among the war hawks that uh, his younger brother, uh, Prince Chichibu, served in the army and it was in more favorable to the army's position. And so there was a talk of uh, uh, you know, asking Emperor Hirohito to step down and uh, replace him with the younger brother, Prince Chichibu. And because of that, Hirohito's relationship with uh, Prince Chichibu was not that close. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> and he was annoyed because his mother, the empress, actually, his, her favorite was Prince Chichibu. <laughs> that even made it difficult for him, too. Yeah. 
So we promised you gossip, and we delivered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you to Rich and our two panelists, Dr. Kawamura and John Parshall. They will all be outside at the book signing station. Um, I just have to say I missed you guys and all your questions over the last two years, so keep them coming. Um, on the book signing, you may recall that Chris Michelle and the retail department have a great deal, that if you buy five books, you don't have to lug them home in your luggage. We will provide free shipping. Uh, it's now our lunch break, so please do enjoy your lunch right outside the doors in the pre-function area. Our next session begins at 1.15, but please be back early if you'd like to see our next oral history showcase at 1.10. Thank you. Oh, that, that's time. okay. No, that was
Hi, I'm Rob Satino, the senior historian here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. Standing in the museum in our Road to Tokyo exhibit, which deals with the Pacific War, and I'm standing next to my great friend Volker Benkert, a faculty member from Arizona State University. Volker, welcome to New Orleans. Thank you very much. Um, we're here to introduce our new joint um, master's uh, online program. Uh, and this program marries uh, two great institutions, the National World War II Museum, as well as Arizona State University, to uh, teach World War II in an online capacity on a graduate level. And I think what's novel about this is we, we, we're standing here in this great museum that tells the story of World War II through an American experience where history really comes to life. But this program will talk about the history of World War II in a comparative and global fashion. So we're taking this story as the core and we're uh, bringing it into a much more global perspective. But our program will also include even a course uh, on contemporary relevance where we're not just thinking about the world that was shaped by, by uh, World War II, but we're also thinking about long-lasting memory debates, not just in the United States, but globally around this ma uh, major conflict. I think that's great, and I'll, I'll also throw this in that just as we're gonna try to be global geographically, we're really gonna try to have the broadest possible approach. So, sure, we'll do some battle and war fighting. That's always been my bread and butter as a scholar and, and as a researcher, but we're also going to be looking at politics, at society, at diplomacy, at culture, at film. We're not going to shrink from the, discussing the horrors of the Holocaust, yes. comparative genocides, that too is gonna be part. So, I'm pretty excited about this. I. I, I also, we'll second what you said about the, it's two institutions that are kind of being married here. Mm -hmm. It's a great educational institution in Arizona State and one of the leaders in, in online education. But you know, here at the museum, we also bring, bring some things mm -hmm. to the table. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're standing in a museum gallery, artifacts, mega artifacts, uh, you name it, we have it here, including mm -hmm. 10,000 testimonies, oral wow. histories from, from veterans. I think of people who might want to take this. I, I can come up with a lot of groups. I see this as kind of professional development. You might be a, a high school teacher who would, mm. would, would like to get a master's and, mm. and, and uh, for professional development reasons. You might just be somebody who wants to keep that, keep those juices flowing and, and yeah. study this, uh, this largest of human conflicts a little more carefully than you have. Mm. Absolutely, and that's why the program is designed to teach skills, right? We were, of course, we're gonna learn a lot about World War II. There's no doubt about There's, that. That's for sure. <laughs> but we're also really interested in transferable skills. So analysis, uh, our critical thinking, writing, and writing not just in the academic format, but writing on many, many different venues, as you will when you are a professional working in a museum, if you're a teacher, um, if you're a historian, in any kind of um, public organization, you will have to have a repertoire of different kinds of writing and we try to teach that here. Great points. So, you know, I'll throw in one last thing, the flexibility of this program. Mm. You're going to really do it at your, at your own time. It, it doesn't matter where you are on the globe. This is yes. World War II class, and you can take it literally from anywhere in the world. So I hope that you will be very much interested uh, in the program. You will definitely meet Rob and myself, uh, and we're looking forward to having you in class. Uh, we had donut machines, donut mix, coffee, ground coffee. So we'd go out to a base and um, hook up to their electrical system for the, for the donut machine. It had uh, a PA system, but that meant that, uh, that either they could listen with their coffee and donuts or you could dance with them. Mm -hmm. We also, in our off time, as it were, would go over to the two to the two Red Cross clubs in town, and uh, and help uh, you know entertain and listen, 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 listen. I'll tell you the first unit that we served was a, an artillery battery in in firing position. Uh, we we used to have just line up jerry cans and put a box of donuts and a, some cream and sugar and some coffee, you know. Um, we'd, we'd, and the guys would come by. The, the guys loved it when we did stupid things. They did. And sometimes we did them purposely, but not usually. Anyway, uh, so they're, they're going down the line and, uh, and uh, we're talking to them and everything, and they're wondering, some of them be, stand behind and wonder, what are you doing way up here? <laughs> 
And well, well, I don't know. We're doing our best, and um, uh, so the, they were not firing at the time we set up. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Uh, I'm doing coffee again, and it's a big one-pound uh, ladle. Don't uh, we? Uh, and um, I've got it uh, just about to pour into this guy. This off. He turns out to be the the commanding officer, the captain. Uh, of uh, he, and he's got his canteen cup out, and I'm about to pour the coffee into it when they start firing. These are one five fives. These make a noise. And I go this way and pour coffee all over him. And uh, he, fortunately, he had a field jacket on. And so our orders were to be among the first to cross. And we, we had this truck that we turned into a club mobile and had the donut machine in it. And our GI cooks, we had two guys who had, you know, they did the cooking while we went out and served. That was the point. Why, why put Red Cross women in a truck and have them cooking? Um, what happened was when, when we turned up at the, um, at the gates of Memmingen camp uh, and started in, the guys went wild. It was disbelief. Mm -hmm. It was joy. I can remember uh, standing in, a, in a, an open space with just nothing but guys, you know, mm -hmm. prisoners. And I started trying to talk to them. And, you know, said, hey, hey, who's, who's from there and whatnot? And, and um, they wouldn't answer. They just stood there and looked at me. And finally I said, I don't know what, to, what, 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 why won't you talk to me? Mm -hmm. and, and one guy, an American, stepped forward. He said, Miss Red Cross, could I touch your hand? And I said, sure. And, I, and he turned it over and just went like that. It went, you know, uh, I think what it meant, what, I hope what we meant to them, and I believe it, was that there, there is a, a, a normal, caring world out there. Mm -hmm. Constance Negrotto was a talented art student in New Orleans when a professor suggested she apply for a job as a draftsman. We were supposed to bring a sample of our work. I drew a picture of a, a C-46, a big poster, and uh, <laughs> I got the job all right. Negrotto began her new job at Higgins Industries, working on both production and internal projects. My aunt and my cousin worked there as riveters, and I had a job up in front. We did a lot of the charts and things for both the plant and Higgins' conference room. When Negrotto began work at another Higgins location, the Mishu assembly facility, wartime restrictions posed challenges for her commute. I didn't have enough ration stamps to get gasoline for my car, so I had to go and catch a streetcar, ride to Canal Street and Broad, get off and get a ride to the Mishu plant in a horse trailer. <laughs> it was kind of fun. <laughs> Draftsmen and women like Negrotto were key to the productivity of wartime manufacturers like Higgins Industries. By the end of the war, Higgins employed 25,000 people and had produced over 20,000 boats and landing craft. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, died on April 12, 1945, while in office. His death was a shock to the country and dealt a blow to the morale of the American people in the waning months of the Second World War. For many Americans, especially the young men serving overseas, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the only president they had ever really known. Elected in 1933, when many of those fighting Germany and Japan were in grade school, Roosevelt was the epitome of the term leader. His leadership was unquestioned from his initial election through his astonishing and unprecedented four terms in office. Winning in a landslide victory over incumbent Herbert Hoover in 1933 during the heart of the Great Depression, FDR as he was known, guided the country through the worst economic years in America's history. At the time of his election, more than two million Americans were homeless and over a quarter of the American workforce was unemployed. Roosevelt's New Deal policy helped pull the country out of the depths of the economic depression and put people back to work. Despite his successes in his first two terms and into his third, Roosevelt's greatest lay in front of him. Desperately trying to keep America out of the war raging in Europe while still trying to render aid to the country's besieged European allies, 
the president provided skilled and trusted leadership in the dark days following Japan's attack on the United States at Pearl Harbor. His trusted voice reassured, panicked, and scared Americans that the country would strike back at their attackers and gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Throughout the war years, Roosevelt displayed great leadership, trusting his subordinates while leaning on their expert levels of dedication, ingenuity, and strategic decision-making. Roosevelt's leadership allowed for American victory to be achieved in both the European and Pacific theaters of war. His leadership on the American home front gave hope to millions who otherwise had not known opportunity. The war which essentially ended the Depression and either employed the unemployed in defense plans and war work or enlisted them in the armed services also provided opportunity, thanks to Roosevelt's decisions, to millions of African Americans and women who both took a prominent role in the workforce for the first time under FDR's guidance. The Depression, war years, and ceaseless leadership of the American people and her allies took a toll on the president. With his health declining during the initial portion of his fourth term as president, Roosevelt succumbed to a massive brain hemorrhage on the afternoon of April 12, 1945. On the morning of April 13th, Roosevelt's body was placed in a flag-draped coffin and loaded onto the presidential train for the trip back to Washington. Along the route, thousands flocked to the tracks to pay their respects. Roosevelt's declining physical health had been kept secret from the general public. His death was met with shock and grief across the United States and around the world. After Germany surrendered the following month, newly sworn in President Truman dedicated Victory in Europe Day and its celebrations to Roosevelt's memory, saying that his only wish was that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had lived to witness this day. I'm uh, Walter Imahara, and welcome to the Imahara's Legacy Garden here at Hemingbao in St. Francisville. First thing you see is a Tory gate, because the Tory gate, it's, it's welcome. You're welcome to uh, peace in nature, and you leave the old world behind. This garden has uh, been built about two years ago because we had a, uh, we sold a big gardens on in St. Francisville. We needed a place to finish up with the legacy portion and we didn't want a big piece of property. So here at Himmelbau, we found this property but needed a lot of work because where I'm sitting, big erosion and the trees are just so solid in here, you couldn't see the water. We bring in plants from all over uh, Louisiana because the plants from up north doesn't really grow good here. And during construction, I was asking if it's a Japanese garden. I said, well, it's a, it's a Japanese American garden, which has uh, never been heard of before. But the mixture of Japanese and American because that's who I am. But we have lanterns here, we got Tory gates. You see some carvings that came from Indonesia area, made out of lava stone. Okay, this is a greeter. I was born in 1937, so when World War II started, I was like uh, four years old. I learned a lot of philosophy from my father and mother because you must remember now, I'm now age over 80. I, I, I've been with them all my life, except for the three and a half years in the service. And I must mention that uh, I learned a lot because my parents were Buddhists. And we were born Buddhists, but after camp, my mother became a Christian. We came from camps from Arkansas. We were in two camps, uh, Jerome and Royer, which is about five hours north from here. And my parents wanted to go south 
because they lost everything in California. Okay, and when I say they lost, they lost a the farm and all that. And one of the biggest things that we want people to know that we really were Americans at that point. So, and we knew the circumstances of the war. My father spoke about incarceration uh, to, uh, to the, not too much to the children until he got past the anger. My father's journey into uh, plant materials that he found peace after uh, leaving camp. But it took him maybe uh, uh, 10 years, but till then he was very bitter against the United States and just bitter against everything. But uh, he found a way in his heart that with the Buddhist background, and then he started uh, working with plant material and your nature, huh? You see plants blooming, you see the bees, and uh, you see the butterflies, and it's, it's all nature. That's why I like, uh, my father and I liked the gardening business, because sometimes when you work with plant material, it really uh, makes you feel better, yeah. This monument was first found by my father and myself in Hiroshima in 1977. But it took us another, until 2005, when we understood that the, the monument was gonna be taken down in Hiroshima at this Buddhist temple. The temple did not want the uh, monument any longer because no one has come visit it for 50 years. And a generation of Imaharas left Japan and, my, and now living in America, okay? So this is a very old, uh, I would say in age-wise, it's about made, uh, it was built about 19, uh, 1905. What's interesting about the monument that it did survive the atomic blast, and it, the history is that uh, my great-great-grandfather built it for a son who passed away 1895 uh, while he was a Navy in, in China. So it's not a tombstone per se, it's like a monument. But also in the front here, I can't read Japanese, but in translation, it means this is a Imahara monument for those now living and also in the future. When you walk in the gardens, it's, uh, it's peaceful, nature. Uh, you don't hear no uh, trucks going by, and it's just so quiet, huh? And you see a, uh, the birds, you see the bees, butterflies, and the peacocks, things like that. It's just, uh, it's, good, uh, it's good for the soul huh? to, uh, to visit nice, quiet place with nature. So quiet here.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find your seats, we will begin the oral history showcase before starting the session at 1.15. Thank you. Well, it started out no different than the rest. You know, it was a Sunday morning, and it was quiet. A lot of ships in the harbor. This is 7 December, so you're coming to the end of your operating year, and a lot of ships were going to be in harbor over the Christmas holidays and into New Year's. As of the first of the year, for instance, San Francisco was supposed to have been released from the yard and back on station. Um, so it's quiet. Uh, of course, that particular attack had been planned and drilled for for years and years and years. And of course, their people, hey, you walk around the island, go up on the high ground and look down on Pearl. The ships might not look much bigger than that in line of sight, but there they are all laid out in that harbor at a naval air station. <coughs> and the shipyard. So they had a pretty good idea where everything was located and where their targets of greatest importance were. So when they came in, scared, yeah. But then after a while, you know, it took about maybe 15, 20 minutes or so, and then you begin to, to take in that precision it was, like, it was almost like they were going through a drill. Those guys were absolutely perfect. But it was a drill for them because we weren't prepared to fight anybody. 
So folks, welcome back. If, if you're not back, please take your seats. You'll see that this next panel is raring to go. They've occupied in force. They you know, beat me up to the stage. They're already here, ready to go. And so uh, we're gonna oblige and continue mission. You know, with this session, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're looking at a different lens. You know, we started the first lens was kind of the American experience and the, uh, view and the, the road to war, a strategic one. The second one was the, the Japanese perspective. And now we're gonna provide a different perspective uh, bringing things a bit closer to home, providing an introspective on the experience of African Americans uh, in the conflict. Now, uh, we've got a great team here, our museum presidential counselor and Franklin professor and chair, the history department at the University of Georgia, go dogs, Dr. John Morrow, and uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. I'm, I'm a bit of a Clemson fan myself, but um, can't, can't, you know, I remember the days of Herschel Walker. And it's, uh, it's great to remember. And, and uh, he's joined by historian Dr. Robert Chester. Uh, they'll discuss the impact of the Pearl Harbor attack on the Afri African American community and how we remember World War II today. Now, joining them on stage, it's a great opportunity to uh, uh, introduce you to uh, more of our team. Our chair is our institute historian. Uh, Dr. Steph Hinnerschitz. She's happy. So Steph joined the Institute last summer. Um, she's earned her PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park, uh, where I did too. And uh, she's taught at several colleges, but also at the History Department at West Point, uh, which is also near and dear to our hearts. Uh, she's the author of three books. Uh, her most recent book came out just this year uh, from the uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, Press, uh, Japanese American Incarceration, the Camps and Coerced Labor During World War II. So with that, uh, I look forward to an amazing, provocative panel. And Steph, the floor is yours. All right, thank you everyone for coming to this session. And I'm really excited to be able to chair it and honored really, because I think it's a necessary addition to this symposium. Like Mike had mentioned, we've spent most of the day talking about grand strategy and talking about Pearl Harbor as something kind of over there or something that seems to be a little bit separated from the home front, but we get to switch gears and talk about how Pearl Harbor impacted society and specifically the African-American community, but also how we remember World War II and Pearl Harbor. And I think this session and panel were, it was brilliantly organized around one figure, which I think most of you are familiar with. And if you're not, you will become familiar with him thanks to Dr. Chester over there, and that's Dory Miller. So this is a way to kind of frame this panel to understand the life of Dory, but more specifically, what kind of impact he's had on how we remember World War II. But before we do that, we need to set up sort of the world of Dory Miller. So the context, give a little bit of background, and in order to make that happen, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Morrow, who will, yeah, kind of like explain where Dory Miller comes from and the impact of Pearl Harbor on the African-American community. So turn it over to John. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be back here. I should say that this is the first time I've flown since COVID. The last time I flew anywhere was when I flew down here in 2019 uh, for the last of uh, these symposia in person. Then I was doing B-24s and B-17s uh, and sharing a session on them. Now uh, I have to come back down to earth. Uh, for this conference, um, because I'm actually on two programs. The one uh, tomorrow will deal with civil rights in the 20th century, and it's sort of a long 20th century view. So I don't want to take anything from what we'll be talking about tomorrow. And what I plan to do today is to talk about African Americans in the 1930s, primarily, up to 1942, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I should warn you that I am not going to mention Dory Miller except now. 
because that's my colleague's job, Robert Chester, and I'm anxiously looking forward to hear what he has to say. The 1920s were not a prosperous decade for African Americans, as they were for some folks. And the 1930s, with the full onset of the Great Depression, made things even worse. The migration out of the South that had started, particularly in 1915, uh, with the boll weevil epidemic, had blossomed during the First World War. Some 500,000 African Americans left the South to move north and west, mainly north at this point in time. And they had jobs that were waiting for them there and a better life in which they would not be dubbed subject to daily humiliations and the potential of lynching in those places. And when World War II came, the prospects and possibilities for work, employment, you name it, surged enormously. But the background to all of this is the epoch of white supremacy, Jim Crow and segregation. The 1930s, in a sense, kicked off with the trials of the Scottsboro Boys in Alabama, who were wrongfully accused of rape um, in a boxcar, two white women, uh, one of whom admitted later that she lied. But regardless of the changes in evidence, these young men, the oldest of whom was 19, the youngest of whom was 12, could never get a fair trial, and one of the conclusions, because it was fought through the courts, up and down, back and forth, was that it was impossible for a black person to get a fair trial, in, in particular the South, uh, when you had all white juries, or even if you had one black juror. <laughs> and uh, I hate to mention this contemporary point, but in Georgia right now, uh, the trial of these fellows who shot Ahmad Aubrey is exactly the same situation with only one black juror. And people are wondering what the hell is going on in Georgia other than football. Um, I have no answers there yet. A few beacons of light shone for African Americans through the bleak 30s. Jesse Owens' sweep of four gold medals at the Berlin Olympics in 1936 offered a strong refutation of the myth of Aryan supremacy. Joe Lewis's pummeling of German boxer Max Schmeling in their return bout of 1938 made the Brown Bomber a national hero in whom African Americans took particular pride. And on Easter Sunday in 1939, Marian Anderson sang America before broadcast microphones and a crowd of some 75,000 people, and this was in a, on a blustery cold day, at the Lincoln Memorial in a concert that represented a strong protest against discrimination because the Daughters of the American Revolution would not let her sing in Constitution Hall, and Eleanor Roosevelt, as a result, resigned from the Daughters and then proceeded to help stage this miraculous performance. And the point was that it was a stand against the kind of segregation that people had known, and quite successful. The African-American freedom struggle forged ahead in the mid to late 1930s. Now, some people believe, or they have the sense, that the struggle for civil rights really gets kicked off in World War II. It's, it's interesting how we've in our discussions of civil rights, um, we know, acknowledge now, that a number of the people who came out of World War II were not, and that not just African Americans, but a number of white people who served in World War II concluded that segregation really was wrong, and we needed to do something about it. And people think, all right, beginning of the civil rights movement, it doesn't begin there. It begins much further back. You can even go before World War I. But let's focus on the 30s. In 1937, Mary McLeod Bethune organized the Federal Council on Negro Affairs, often known as the Black Cabinet, of leaders such as A. Philip Randolph, the head of the sleeping car porters union who had been uh, 
a well-known radical even during the First World War, and Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP. And they were called to represent black interests in the New Deal. It's also worth it to note that Walter White and Mary McLeod Bethune were personal friends of Eleanor Roosevelt, who during the Second World War often took stands supporting African-American achievement. In particular, you might remember when she flew with Chief Anderson, who was the trainer of the Tuskegee Airmen at Tuskegee, when they presumed she was just going down to visit. And instead, she said, no, I want to fly. And so Chief took her on a flight, which uh, certainly impressed uh, everyone present and others as well. NAACP legal counsel Charles Hamilton Houston, I'll have a lot more to say about him on uh, uh, the next tomorrow, launched a new initiative to fight segregation in 1934 and in 1939 helped create the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund to fight for civil rights. And for those of you who are aware of it, the Legal Defense Fund now is actually a separate entity from the NAACP, which continues to fight discrimination. In 1938, Houston protested vigorously segregation and discrimination in the U.S. Armed Forces, but to no avail. On the other end, the New Deal's Works Progress Administration, the WPA, employed black individuals not just in construction and so on, but in many cultural realms, and a number of these people would become very famous. Author Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes were watching God, is one of her famous novels. Richard Wright, author of Native Son. Ralph Ellison, author of Invisible Man. All these people got their start working for the WPA, as did African-American uh, excuse me, artist Jacob Lawrence, who had become famous in time. But at last, as of 1938, mobilization for the coming war in the late 30s finally lifted the United States out of the grips of the Depression and put Americans, black and white, back to work. In September 1940, African-American leaders met with members of the administration to press for the end of segregation and discrimination in the armed forces. But Roosevelt demurred, preferring not to disturb the status quo of racially separate units, all with white officers, of course. The Navy announced in 1940 that it would enlist black men only as mess men, cooks, and stewards to the protests, the vehement protests of African Americans. The Marines remained lily white. In January 1941, A. Philip Randolph and other black leaders determined to call for a demonstration of 100,000 people in Washington on July 1st to demand equal opportunity for African Americans jobs in the defense industries and an end to their degradation in the military. Five days before the march, Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, which banned racial discrimination in the defense industries, although its enforcement was toothless. Anyone who keeps up with the racial conflagrations in Detroit and around Detroit, the Ford factories, remains aware that segregation and racial difficulties were rampant in the war industries. But I have a little quiz for just a second. There's an interesting exception to this rule that black and white Americans could not work together on production lines, and that they could not receive equal pay for their work. And I'm sure it's an industry 
we all know. Where is it? And what's the name? The Higgins Boat Company. Absolutely. That makes it a rarity. So always remember, if anyone gives you any crap about being from New Orleans <laughs> or being around here, you just say Higgins Boat Company. And that will shut them down because they won't know what you're talking about. All right? All right. One of the reasons that Roosevelt capitulated to such demands was the international embarrassment that was certain to occur. As an America that anticipated fighting for democracy and broadcast that it was fighting for freedom, the four freedoms and so on, abroad would surely be branded as hypocritical for its treatment of its black citizens. In fact, and this is something that people are often not aware of, after, Jap after World War I, the Japanese government had launched a strenuous propaganda campaign among the colored peoples of the British Empire and African Americans here in the United States to essentially convince them that the Japanese were the only power working for the improved circumstances of the repressed colored peoples of the world. After all, Japan in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 had defeated the Russians and therefore became the first colored nation to defeat a white nation in a war. And then the Japanese in 1919 further demanded inclusion of a non-discrimination clause in the League of Nations covenant. Well, the Europeans' rejection of this proposal simply added fuel to the fire of any admiration that subject peoples and African Americans might have held for the Japanese. But all this became moot on December 7, 1941 with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. A number of things actually became moot with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The America First movement, which represented some 800,000 white Americans who sought to keep America out of the war and displayed anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi attitudes, completely disappeared within days of Pearl Harbor, as went the way of any support for the Japanese. And of course, the fact that Hitler conveniently declared war on the United States on December 11th, figuring we were going to be in it anyway, uh, put a cap on the Nazi Bund movement in the United States, which had been very popular and very vocal in the 1930s. Now, African Americans, of course, had no attraction to Hitler because they sympathize uh, with the Jews of Germany subject to the Nazis' brutal anti-Semitism. Uh, Joe Lewis, in fact, replied succinctly to the jibes of those few who criticized his enlistment in a white man's army, and I quote in 1942, with the succinct statement, lots of things wrong with America, but Hitler ain't gonna fix them. <laughs> right. I think that captures it all in a nutshell. And I, I should say as well, I do this to appease Jeremy Collins, who's sitting in the back, who wanted to work that statement in somehow into my presentation, and I have succeeded. All right, all right. Now, the Pittsburgh Courier announced its double V campaign in February 1942, and this is really what pulled the whole thing together for African Americans. The double V, victory over fascism abroad, and racism at home, enemies without and within, captured the fancy of African Americans. It made sense. The campaign signaled that African Americans would not accept the discrimination, 
repression and outright violence they had experienced during and at the end of the First World War. This time, in fact, they were in the war to win on all fronts. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's a rare privilege to be here. Um, if I'd thought of it in time, I would have called this talk the mess man, the machine gun, and the medal. I didn't think of it in time. <laughs> but that is the title. What we know about Doris Miller, Doris Dory Miller, is summed up in those three words. Like all African Americans, he was a member of the stewards branch, forbidden from service above decks. But on the day of Pearl Harbor, serving on the West Virginia, he manned a machine gun, fired away at the Japanese before diving overboard and helping other sailors get out of the water. For this, he received a medal. He was the first black American to receive the Navy Cross, which Admiral Chester Nimitz gave him in May 1942 aboard the USS Indianapolis. Here he is getting the prize. These are the images of Miller that we see the most. He was also, after his receipt of the medal, the subject of an Office of War Information propaganda poster, as you can see. Much later, in 2010, he was the only black American featured in the US Postal Service Distinguished Sailors Stamp Collection, three white officers, and Dory. There he is. I've still got mine, and I can assure you they won't be on any letters anytime soon. Doris Miller, that's the insignia of his, the boat that was named after him. I'll get to that ship, not boat. Um, here's a much later picture from 2020, 2018, forgive me, when the Doris Miller Memorial was opened in Waco, Texas. And you can see him proudly wearing his medal in these pictures. Here he is in a more recent Navy poster as a trailblazer uh, for a recent uh, African American History Month. Here's the image again, Doris with his medal, at the announcement of the new Ford class supercarrier, the USS Doris Miller, which we'll go to see sometime in the 2030s, but which is under construction now. Those are members of his family, along with uh, current sailors. Here's another image from that day with US officials and the remaining Miller family standing proudly alongside an image. Again, Doris with his Navy cross. The other images we see are of his time at the machine gun, right? This is what made him famous, what got him the medal, ultimately. This is a painting by the African-American artist Elmer Brown from 1942. This is a cartoon uh, which was actually drawn in wartime. Uh, I put 51. It was reprinted many, many times in the black press. Again, we see Doris firing away at the Japanese in his moment of glory. Here he is in a film that was mentioned earlier, briefly in the long, rather protracted Tora Tora Tora. Doris gets about 10 seconds. Tora 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 pauses, if you're important, and says, you know, Admiral Husband Kimmel, or whatever it is. Doesn't do it for Doris. He fires his machine gun and swims off into continuing obscurity. Perhaps most famously, here he is played by Cuba Gooding Jr. in Disney's epic Pearl Harbor from 2001, at the machine gun again, blasting away in a rage of patriotic intensity. Here he is alongside Cuba Gooding Jr. in a sort of remade propaganda poster which came out alongside the film. This is one of my favorites. The Mattel Company, Battleship Row Defender, Doris Miller. It doesn't say Doris Miller, but it, who else could it be? Um, and he's got his machine gun with him. So, mess man, machine gun, medal. These have become, in the abridged tale of Doris Miller that we hear, moments of affirmation in American history. 
Despite segregation, Doris was loyal, patriotic, heroic. Despite its reluctance and its segregated nature, the US Navy gave him a medal, the first such medal to be given to a black American. And it signifies for many progress, right? John already referred to this. World War II was the moment from which we accelerate forwards into a desegregated future. This is, after all, what Tom Brokaw famously called the greatest generation any society has produced, quite the phrase. So Miller's stand at the machine gun has become in our memory, and that's what I'm talking about here, is memory, right, rather than history. How is this story told? What meanings are attached to what Doris did and what the nation did for and didn't, didn't do for him afterwards? A flashpoint after which prejudice receded, we are told. Ronald Reagan, speaking in 1975 in North Carolina, said that there was great segregation in World War II, but this was corrected during the conflict. Doris, he said, cradled a machine gun in his arms, which is an interesting image. And all that was changed. Instant progress in the Reagan fantasy of Pearl Harbor. In the movie, the 2001 movie, as Doris gets his medal, that's the last we see of him in the story, a white nurse played by Kate Beckinsale says that the nation surged forward after Doris's heroism. It was a war that changed America. Doris was the first black American to be awarded the Navy Cross, but he would not be the last. He joined a brotherhood of heroes. Unfortunately, the rest of the film takes us on a trip with Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett. Maybe not Ben Affleck, I can't remember, but it's the white heroes who get the rest of the film and Doris disappears with his medal, never to be heard from again. I'm not saying for a second that what Doris Miller did wasn't important, because it was. But what I am saying is that the story of the mess man, the machine gun and the medal abridges, sanitizes, makes comfortable and palatable a much more complex history. Doris need not go back below decks and die on the Liscombe Bay in November 1943. His mother, Henrietta, need not live out her days in bitterness at the treatment her family received after her son's heroic acts. Civil rights activists need not continue the struggle for integration in the military and the rest of society beyond the end of the war, because after all, all that was corrected, Ronald Reagan said. The Navy in, the, in, uh, in wartime did not want to recognize Doris Miller. They would not have told us his name had it not been for the activism of the Pittsburgh Courier and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. He posed a dilemma. He was proving wrong the reasons behind segregation. But at the same time, the Navy didn't want to alienate black Americans, which they would have done had they ignored him completely but they didn't want to make significant changes either. So, they gave him a medal. And they sent him on a speaking tour at the end of 1942. A month or two, he went round selling war bonds. And here he is in the rather unglamorous surroundings of the Great Lakes Naval Academy, speaking uh, to an audience that appears rather uninterested if you look at those fellows in the corner. Nonetheless, he did it, um, and this was, of course, good propaganda. There were also commercial exploitation of Miller, which I shall come to in a moment because I have the wrong slide. This is an example of the dissent that continued to be spoken about what Miller had done. This, things weren't corrected. People understood this. This is a pamphlet from the International Labour Defence, the ILD, um, which was a sort of communist organisation. On the front cover, 1942, we've got Nimitz pinning the medal on Miller. On the inside, we have a map showing acts of aggression, violence, even murder, inflicted on black Americans since the start of the war. Even black Americans in uniform. So the ILD was saying there's a long way to go here. The medal doesn't solve anything. There were commercial ventures too. Apologies for my photograph of a table uh, as well as this image from the Library of Congress. This was a print issued by a company called Timely. And Con Connery's mother, Connery's mother, Doris's mother, Henrietta Connery was his dad, 
um, got some money out of this. Uh, this was sent to the NAACP as well, and the NAACP dismissed any notion of cooperating, pointing out quite rightly that that looks absolutely nothing like Doris Miller. Um, but these were sold um, in the black press, and it was seen as a patriotic thing to have one. But there were many copycat schemes, and Mrs. Miller was kind of shunted out of the process. People were exploiting Doris's actions. After the war, there is a period of forgetting. There is also a persistent resistance by the Navy to give Doris a Medal of Honor. That campaign started the minute the news broke, and it goes on today. I spoke with some members of the Congressional Black Veterans Caucus not long ago. Still after this Medal of Honor, not going to get it. The Navy had this sort of form rejection letter they would send out. But Pearl Harbor became very quickly a Cold War metaphor. When Alban Barclay, the vice president, spoke on the 10th anniversary, he didn't mention Japan. And he certainly didn't mention Doris Miller. It was all about preparedness. Let's not let a nuclear Pearl Harbor happen to us at the hands of the Russians, of course, recently armed with their own nuclear bomb in 49. Race was also, uh, as John pointed out, an issue in the Cold War. The Russians never tired of pointing out that the leader of the free world segregated its black population. Propaganda uh, from communists uh, was uh, collected by the State Department quite religiously. Ebony magazine, the black magazine, said in 51 that racism was the Pearl Harbor in our midst, exposing us to Russia's attack. But not very much was said about Doris, because you don't want to bring that up if you're trying to pretend race is not that big of a problem. But others saw the need to preserve memory of the heroic mess man. They wanted to use him to stimulate further change. I'll get to that. In 1945, the African-American poet Gwendolyn Brooks wrote a poem called Negro Hero to suggest Dory Miller. And she characterizes the United States as a white woman in a flowing gown. She describes this as Doris's fair lady, a seductive figure. But in the sleeve of this fair lady is held a sharp blade ready to puncture his patriotic ambitions and desires. His dad, Connery, went on the radio during the war and was asked if he thought that black and white servicemen fighting and dying together was making a big change. And Connery Miller rather bluntly said, I haven't seen any changes yet. The radio program stopped. The announcer sputtered, and I don't know what he said, but I can imagine it was, we'll be right back after these messages, folks. Uh, let's do something else. Community remembrance was where Miller's legacy was preserved. In 43, Elmer Fowler, a Chicago reverend, started a foundation, and he presented awards every year to those who were seen as having helped the progression of seg uh, integration, goodness me, in America. So Jackie Robinson got one, Mary McLeod Bethune got one, Medgar Evers, the murdered civil rights activist, John F. Kennedy, even Aretha Franklin. Um, there were schools, American veterans posts, YMCA's named for him, and also the ever persistent Medal of Honor campaign. The Navy preferred to keep quiet until at the, in the late 60s, when, as you all know, race relations in the United States entered a new and fractious phase with black nationalism rejecting the idea of military service. Vietnam, there were riots on Navy vessels at sea and, of course, among soldiers in, um, in Indochina. And the Navy saw a need to appeal to black recruits. 73 was the end of the draft. You can't draft people, you've got to get them to volunteer. And so part of the campaign to reform the image of the racist Navy took place in the form of memorial concessions. One of these was a naming of a, a barracks, uh, an enlisted men's barracks at the Great Lakes base where he'd spoken in 43. The other was the destroyer escort USS Miller launched in 1973. A destroyer escort is not a particularly grand vessel, and there was already a destroyer called the Miller, named for James Miller, a Civil War hero. So when they gave Doris's name to this ship, the original Miller became the James Miller, and this one was just the Miller. So he still didn't know, necessarily, if you heard that, that it was Doris's uh, badge of honor. Oftentimes, when these sorts of things happened, it was presented as if the story was now over. 
We've remembered him now. Look how far we've come. Bill Clinton did a similar thing in 97 when black soldiers, soldiers were given medals of honor, six of them posthumously. History's been made whole, he said. These injustices are behind us. The Navy characteristically refused a similar investigation into the refusal to give medals uh, to black sailors, medals of honor during the war. The memorial at Waco, however, preserves Doris's memory. But it should be noted that's not a Navy memorial. That was done by local people. It was crowdfunded, sort of. They even wrote to Cuba Gooding Jr. asking for money. I don't know if he gave them any. He should have done. <laughs> Memorials are important because they give us space to interpret. Just like the museum. It doesn't dictate. It directs, but we have the right to interpret our own way. And if you haven't seen it yet, go see the infamy exhibit. Doris is very prominent and it made me very happy. Um, there is also, of course, the Ford class supercarrier, named for him, which we'll go to see in the, thir uh, the 30s, the 2030s, yes. This was uh, requested by then acting Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Modley, who wanted a black enlisted man and wanted someone from World War II, he said, because it was a time when the country was really united. I think John's comments earlier have suggested that's not necessarily 100% the case. But the vessel will ensure that Doris's memory is preserved, as will exhibits such as the one here at the museum. He's been the subject of children's books, he's been in movies, he's been toys, he's been named, uh, buildings have been named for him, and museum exhibits continue to preserve his memory. But there is still no Medal of Honor. As long as that's the case. Here they are cutting the steel for the Miller in 2021. And there is Doris again. 80 years on, as long as there's no Medal of Honor, there will be a campaign. And I sometimes wonder just what this humble and modest man would think of all this were he 102 and alive today. Um, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. So I'm, I'm going to stay seated for the questions. So I have some questions for individual panelists and then maybe a question overall, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. But one of the things that I liked that both panelists brought up is this idea that the home front is sort of never just the home front. There's an element of what's going on domestically that can influence policy and strategy. And so the first question I have is for you, John. You had mentioned something really interesting, which is, Japan's attempts to create a propaganda campaign using the treatment of African Americans in the United States. So I was wondering if you could tell us in the audience a little bit more about that and how successful was it <laughs> or not? So I just thought that was something really interesting. Okay. Thanks, Steph. It's a very good question. Um, there's a book by a fellow named Gerald Horn. It's entitled Race War. And it is exactly about this subject, the Japanese attempts to appeal, not just to African Americans, but to, in particular, because remember, they're facing the British Empire um, around the globe. They were facing it in particular in Asia. But to point out that these people are being treated abysmally by these imperialists, and as well to African Americans that they're being treated abysmally by their white counterparts, and that the Japanese are the perfect government to set this right, to stop this freedom. In a sense, you remember in World War II that the Japanese, with their greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere, were suggesting to Asians as they had been ever since they beat first the Chinese in 1894 and then the Russians in 1904-5, that they were the country that could lead this sort of freedom movement. Um, as we well know, for those of us who follow the history of the Second World War, uh, the Japanese, after making certain they had slapped and humiliated the British, went around Asia and Southeast Asia slapping and humiliating everyone in their path, and they had no intention of freeing them. They had the intention of subjugating them. 
and using them in the Japanese international war effort and campaigns. Um, some African-American intellectuals were drawn to these appeals, especially after 1919. And it's interesting because if you follow the path of the military intelligence division, um, you find that with the defeat of Germany in 1919, and they were keeping a very close eye on Harlem in New York City, that's the bellwether, suddenly with the defeat of Germany, they shift entirely and they begin to focus on Japan. And if you're following the documents, as I was uh, for an earlier book, I thought, whoa, boy, talk about a shift in gears. Germany's gone, and Japan is now the problem. And so they're checking and monitoring any Japanese, Japanese Americans in Harlem. What are they up to? How are black people responding to them? Well, there is some response. The Nation of Islam um, was in part drawn to them to the extent that there was an interesting combination, something I've never quite understood, but uh, about the Afro-Japanese man. And uh, I've never understood it because, it, as you know, Hitler made the Japanese honorary Aryans, which was a, a real stretch. And so if you're going to stretch it even further, why not the Afro-Japanese man, um, which doesn't quite fit. But some intellectuals who were very, very disaffected with the country, and you also find that a number of people in Harlem who had come from Jamaica originally and therefore brought the issues of the British Empire into the United States, were also drawn to the appeals of the Japanese. Um, I don't think this is very widespread, but Horn does, Horn's book does a very good and detailed treatise of what actually happened. And you realize this wasn't just something that was imagined. In point of fact, the Japanese invited a number of prominent African-American intellectuals to visit Japan and treated them royally to emphasize the distinction between how they were treated in the United States and how the Japanese were treating them when they came to Tokyo. So uh, this is something that went on throughout the interwar period. And I think as I've suggested, and we'll take up some of these other aspects tomorrow, you find that there's a lot going on starting with World War I, and it flows into World War II and afterwards, and we need to know that background. But um, that's all I, I would have to say right now about that attempt. But it is there. It exists. It is not a figment of anyone's imagination. I'm just going to chime in here, if I may. Um, there was a film made in 1943 by uh, John Ford called uh, December 7th, and it features, not Doris Miller directly, but footage of a black serviceman firing a machine gun uh, up at the Japanese. They recycled that footage in 44 in the propaganda film, The Negro Soldier. And that figure, the African-American firing at, uh, at the Pearl Harbor attack, appears just after the quotation, there are those who will tell you that Japan is the savior of the colored races. So as late as 44, they still felt the need to include that kind of thing, to just waylay any sort of sentiments in that direction. Very good. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, actually, this question that I have flows pretty well into that, because uh, you mentioned the, the movies that were made, not, you know, during the war or not long after, and you gave us a lot of background information in how Dory is used, misused. You mentioned the Cold War, which was really great, giving context there. I want to know a little bit more about how Dory was used perhaps by civil rights groups, activists during the war, or sort of immediately after. So what, what different ways, how was he kind of strategized or used by these, these equal rights groups? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the instant response was, the Navy announced that it was an, an unnamed Negro mess man had done something impressive at Pearl Harbor. So the instant response from the Pittsburgh Courier and other groups um, NAACP was like, what's, what's his name, what's his name? And it wasn't until March that the Courier got that information. And once that was out, 
the Medal of Honor campaign began, the campaign to get him home, and it was presented always as a way to emphasize and to create unity, right? They wanted to show that the nation was unified in its battle against the Axis powers, and Doris was the perfect symbol of that, and they wanted Doris's efforts to be recognized not just by a medal or a tour, but by substantive change, right? Let him and others like him show their full worth to the nation. Segregation is pretty antithetical to democracy and also inhibits the war effort. You're wasting people, essentially, who could be contributing more. So that was the, the main effort of, of groups like the March on Washington Movement, the National Negro Congress, uh, the NAACP, was, look, black people can do it. We did it before, that's another thing. There was a lot of references back to history. Um, Oliver Hazard Perry, who had been a, comm a Commodore, I think, in the, in the War of 1812. Other black figures who had served before the Navy had adopted this rigidly segregated policy. And they used Knox's, Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy, was a, a firm segregationist. They used his words against him. We did not impair battle efficiency. Of course, the, any impairment of battle efficiency that would have resulted from black sailors being given the chance to serve would have resulted from the white folks who would have objected so vigorously to it. It wouldn't have been the black people who were the problem, as it were. It would have been those sailors who didn't want to serve alongside black men who would have impaired battle efficiency. But it was very much let us fight, mm -hmm. very much a close ranks kind of thing, like W.E. Du Bois said in, in 1917. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, let's unite, let's prove our worth, let us do this. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, do you want to family end of this? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of my family, both sides, my mother's and my father's side, fought in World War II. Um, we had one Point Montfort Marine, and we have a photo of him in full gear. Uh, that shows, and the caption under it from him is, going from Iwo Jima to question mark. Most of the family who served, served in the U.S. Army, because that's where you did have a chance to fight and served well. Not a single one joined the Navy regardless of Dory Miller or anyone else. And I mean, there've been articles written about both sides of my family. It happens to be a relatively well-known black family, but nobody had any intention of being a servant. They wanted to be a part of the war effort and fight. Great, thank you. So I will just ask a question for both of you before we open it up uh, for Q&A. There was, both of you have mentioned some things that I would argue, and Rob, you would use the phrase this period of forgetting, or this misremembering or willfully not remembering certain aspects of, of World War II history. So we have that, the use and misuse of Dory Miller. John, you had mentioned that this period right after Pearl Harbor was perhaps not as unified as we tend to believe it to be. It's, it's a great narrative, but it's not entirely true. So you are at the World War II Museum, <laughs> the National World War II Museum. Lots of discussion about memorials, how important they are. So how do we, as historians, as members of the audience, make sure that some of these stories are not forgotten or not misremembered? It's a big question. Solve the problem right now. <laughs> um, but just a little, what can, what can we do? Young guy, you want to go first? I'm good. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I think, I think it's important to give people the chance to interact with the history. You know, you go in the infamy exhibit, and it's the mess man, the machine gun, and the medal, but that's more than it used to be, and more than you would probably have got through much of post-war history. And so when you give people, you introduce people, you, no good dictating to people what you've got to think, right? In a public forum, you invite them, I think, to engage with the history. The Smithsonian found out in 95 when they tried to exhibit Enola Gay and all those contextual complexities, that doesn't go over particularly well. So when you're doing public history, you know, you, I think you have to just ask people, hey, here's this, you know, if you want to learn more, learn more, but mention Doris Miller, you know, include things that, that are less remembered. Uh, another figure from Pearl Harbor from the other end of the Navy hierarchy that I've spent some time studying is Admiral Husband E. Kimmel, yeah. 
who's someone you, you might be familiar with, he's mentioned in the infamy exhibit too. He got the blame for Pearl Harbor and was stripped of his rank and became this rather unfortunate conspiracy theorist and a magnet for anti-Semitic rantings after the war. Um, take a trip to Wyoming to the American Heritage Center for reasons I do not know. This man from Connecticut, uh, his papers are all in Wyoming. I do know why, I'm not gonna go into it. Um, but we, ha we have to understand that history is divisive. And it's all very well to tell a movie story with Cuba Gooding Jr. and husband Kimmel's in that story too. You know, nobody's to blame. In, in, in Hollywood's Pearl Harbor, there are no racists. It's 1941. The two protagonists wander out of 1941 Tennessee and have no racial prejudice at all. Um, that doesn't do. And that's what I've tried to do with my work on Doris Miller is complicate it. But there are venues. It's horses for courses. You know, so I think introducing these forgotten figures is very important. And then you invite people. If they want to know more, they'll find out more. John? I've spent a very long time uh, with the National World War II Museum here in New Orleans. Uh, I've been affiliated with it, uh, I guess, probably over a dozen years now. I'm so old, I can't remember when I started, Nick. <laughs> um, and one of the things that drew me to it, because I've consulted with the Smithsonian, in fact, I was uh, affiliated with the Smithsonian when they botched that exhibit in 1995 and had been one of the historians who said to them, you are screwing this thing up badly, you need to discuss air power before World War II, otherwise you're gonna look like fools, and they did. Oh. Life is tough that way. Uh, you've got to have a handle on what people are thinking um, outside, not just what's going on in the museum. And I've also consulted with the National Museum of African American History and Culture and their World War I exhibit, uh, which is probably my primary focus. And uh, one of the things that you have to deal with often is some very touchy subjects. Um, I have positively enjoyed my time consulting here because uh, in Nick Mueller and the staff, we have people who are historians and understand what we're about. And so a number of years ago, I was co-chair of a committee that created the traveling exhibit, Fighting for the Right to Fight. And it's been around the country. It was here for a time, and it's coming back. And uh, I think the museum has plans in the future to update it. And that's one of the reasons I stick with the museum, because the museum is not content uh, with stasis. It believes in movement. History moves. History changes. We know more. Uh, we learn more. And the key is to transmit this to the American public those of it who are willing to listen and think and understand America's past. Uh, we are constantly wrestling with our past. We will always be wrestling with our past. And in point of fact, uh, this will come up uh, a couple of more times in this uh, symposium, uh, as it should. Uh, history's not an easy subject. People sometimes are deluded into thinking, ah, history's straightforward. Uh, you just write it. Uh, it's facts. Oh, no, 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 no. If it were only that simple, um, it isn't. And those of us who are historians understand that and respect it. And we try to stick to the documentation, which changes as we get more information. And so um, I would just suggest that uh, we will continue to change. The museum will continue to change. The museum has spent time raising very critical questions. And as we do the next uh, part of the symposium tomorrow on African Americans and race relations and civil rights, and then in the final roundtable discussion, uh, we're going to be discussing history and how things have changed. That's what makes it exciting and cut and dry. People often want to deny it if it doesn't suit their purposes. Unfortunately, you can deny history all you want. The only thing I say to people who want to deny it is, yeah, you keep on denying it. It will come back and bite you in the butt, okay? <laughs>
And you can't get away from it. That's all there is to it. But thank you, Steph, thank for you. being a marvelous chair. So I guess open up the Q&A Thank you to our panelists. We'll go to the first question to your right with Duke here. Please stand. Speaking from the perspective of a, of a volunteer and a docent here at this beloved World War II Museum, uh, I've, I've learned that people that come here, visitors that come here, don't just come here to hear the stories and to, hear, and to see the stories. They really come to tell their stories. I thought when I started volunteering, I'd got to tell all the stories about, I'd, I'd learned from studying about the war, but people really want to tell their stories. And they're people from all broad uh, groups of life. They're very, they're African Americans, they're Japanese, they're Germans, they're people from Europe, a lot of Australians. And they all tell their stories. And the stories they tell are about their pride the pride of what their grandfathers did, the pride of what, what their family has contributed to make the Second World War a lo still a livable story. So I think from the perspective of what you asked, what can we do here at this, at this wonderful museum that we're all so proud of, is to allow people to continue to tell their stories and have the opportunity to tell their stories as they come through. So I don't have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. We'll go to your left with Connie, please. Hi. Uh, my question relates to how the uh, death of Dory Miller was treated in 1943 by the press, by the military. It's a good question. Um, the, the black press was obviously very much grieved uh, to hear the news. Um, the, the story that touches me the most was how the Miller family learned of, 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 of Doris's death. And um, they wrote anxiously, because he wasn't confirmed dead to a year and a day, right? If you're missing, it takes that long to be confirmed dead. Um, the black, black press speculated, you know, what, where is he? Is he missing? You know, is he gone? There were all sorts of rumors. He'd been seen in a field hospital somewhere in the Pacific, and these reached the Millers, and they wrote to the Navy, and were, it was a pretty tragic kind of exchange when they were told that Doris was dead. Um, the military didn't make an awful lot of fuss out of it. Um, it was mostly the black press that paid attention and reported what they could. Um, and it was obviously seen as a great loss um, to the community. They, they didn't feel that they had had their fair share of, of Doris, as it were. His speaking tour was very brief. And they kept asking, can we extend it? Can he speak at the NAACP conference? And the Navy eventually was like, mm -mm. And by January 43, he was back in general service. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't a huge deal made of it, certainly not by the Navy, who would you know, still prefer to keep that relatively quiet. Uh, it was in the black press that, that, that he was mourned and missed, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. We'll go to the center of the aisle here. Uh, where is the effort to uh, get uh, Doris Miller's the Navy Cross uh, elevated to a Medal of Honor and the fact that we have an African-American Vice President and an African-American Secretary of Defense, both first, uh, will, you, will they be enlisted to try to get that elevated and, and, and get, the, get the recognition he deserves? I would expect so. Um, I mentioned briefly I was, uh, attended a meeting of the Congressional Black Veterans Caucus ever since COVID, I have no idea how long ago anything was, or, but it was a while ago, it was before COVID, but they were very determined, there were various politicians involved. It's difficult because this has been advanced so many times, right? They wrote to LBJ and people wrote to Bill Clinton and on and on and on, and the Navy's kept saying no. And they've sort of said, well, you know, he got his just desserts, at the beginning, and they were like, when they first heard, they were like, hundreds of cases were like this. We'll send him a letter. And people were like, a letter? You know, that's not enough. You can't just send him a... So they got him the, the Navy Cross, but the Medal of Honor ha carried certain connotations. Um, I believe that 
um, someone, you all know about this better than me, some of you military historians. Is there not a requirement that Congress stands or something in the presence of a Medal of Honor winner? I may be wrong, but there were, there were certain reluctances. And the Navy have said no so many times, they're almost painted into a corner. Because now if you say yes, you sort of have to acknowledge that all those no's were illegitimate no's. So you, you know, name a supercarrier after him and, and, and hope that that's enough. The campaign will go on. It's been passed down from Texas uh, political representatives, you know, one after the other, and it won't go away, and nor should it. Um, but at the same time, there's a danger, I think, in over-fixating on the Medal of Honor. Like, Doris is remembered elsewhere. You know, the Waco Memorial is, is a big thing. And the Medal of Honor can become almost a, a singular obsession. He should have one. I think he should have one, but, you know, nobody cares what I think. But... Um, the campaign will carry on. It's very much based um, out of Texas, and, and then in Washington, you have a lot of people pressing for their constituents who think that Doris should get this Medal of Honor. I don't think he'll get one. But then, I've been wrong many times before. <laughs> you know, along those lines, I think, uh, to put Dory Miller in broader context, you have to remember that it wasn't until Bill Clinton administration and the materials were actually sent to uh, Johnson C. Smith, which is a black university, uh, to be vetted and then they were sent to a committee uh, of historians uh, and this is for the Army's seven African-American soldiers who would be awarded the Medal of Honor who had received anywhere from distinguished service crosses to a silver star in order to elevate these men to the medals of honor they deserved. And in many instances, the reason that they were awarded the medal was because their white superior officers, the captains and majors who had fought with them, refused to give up the effort, repeatedly being denied, 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 and they were relentless about it because they knew these men deserved the Medal of Honor. So that's critical, but it took until then. Uh, one of the things that will come up tomorrow is that there has never been the review of the First World War. And the decorations board was known to be racist in both world wars. If you look at the history of the military before, hey, medals of honor. Not in World War I, World War II. Wasn't going to happen. African Americans knew it wasn't going to happen. B.O. Davis, commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, refused to put any of his men up for it because he knew they would be rejected out of hand, no matter what they did. And so the Army actually stands out for its willingness to review uh, the matter and had not taken such adamant stances as the Navy. But I would note that there are only two African American Medal of Honor winners from the First World War, one of whom I will mention tomorrow, and their awards were given, the most recent one, in 2015, nearly 100 years after they earned them in combat, and they and a number of other African-American soldiers were recommended for the Medal of Honor by their white superior officers coming out of World War I. No one did anything about it. And the Navy, I believe, refused, when the Army did a sort of retrospective investigation of, of, of Medal of Honor potentials, which resulted in those seven awards that John mentions from 97, the Navy said, we're not doing that. So they didn't. Next question is to your left, about halfway back. Dr. Chester, I have a two-part question. Uh, first of all, excellent job. Oh, thank you, sir. We all know the general story of Dory Miller manning the machine gun and diving in the water, but I'm wondering if you can fill us in on any of the specifics that were known of exactly what he experienced that day. And then the second part is you made reference to the fact that his mother and family were very upset afterwards. Can you tell us the details of why? What happened? Okay. Um, 
like any sort of history that takes place in a, in a big mess of fire and fury, we're not 100% sure. There's various accounts of Doris's day. Doris's day. Um, <laughs> Rushing here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, he was, as I understand it, below decks, and a white officer sized him up. He was a big fellow, 200 pounds, six feet tall, and he thought Doris would be useful, right? So he says, come up with me. And the captain of the West Virginia, Mervyn Bennion, who got a Medal of Honor, interestingly enough, uh, for his actions at Pearl Harbor, was mortally wounded. And uh, Doris was, I think, involved, or other sailors were building a stretcher. They were trying to get Mervyn Bennion out of the way. I don't know if you probably didn't notice, but in the drawing by Elmer Brown that I showed, Bennion is in the background, and Doris is protecting him with his machine gun. Um, while that was happening, Doris notices, you know, that there's a machine gun unmanned. And so he gets on it and, you know, presses the button, and he, he reported it sort of going away, you know, firing away fairly easily, you know, it wasn't that complicated a machine. Um, how many planes he shot down, we do not know. Um, I've seen as many as 16 offered. A little, a little perhaps um, excessive. <laughs> I, you know, there's, I, I, I think I, I said this before when I spoke on Zoom with, with, with Rob and, uh, and Jeremy, uh, you know, there's some idea that the more planes, the better. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Um, he may have shot one. He said, you know, I might have got one. He might have got none, doesn't matter. Anyway, eventually, fires on the deck made it impossible for him to carry on firing uh, the machine gun. So he abandoned ship and then proceeded to help others out of the water. So his heroism was multifaceted. Um, and uh, after that, I don't know. Um, there's not much said by the man himself. He was a quiet person. He was modest. He didn't get much chance to to say, or have much desire, I think, to say very much. Um, so that's what we know about Pearl Harbor on the day. And it's a mangled account, you know, produced from various different sources, the, the Navy's official sources and historians and such. Um, as far as his mother was concerned, uh, they were very poor. They were Texan sharecroppers. Now, I don't know for sure, but the documentation I've seen, Connery Miller marked his signature with an X. Um, so they were poor Texan sharecroppers. Um, and they had the opportunity through the poster I showed. They, they collaborated with that, made some money, moved house. Um, but Mrs. Miller always felt she hadn't had her fair due. There was a fire at the home in 1956, I think, and the medals were lost that he had won. Um, she felt that, she told a story that she said, she said a filmmaker had visited her. She didn't know when. This is in Doris's niece's book, uh, Vicky Gale Miller's book. And she said that, they wanted to make a feature film about Doris, but they wanted him to be played by a white actor. Now, that's not impossible, because in 1961, Tony Curtis played the Pima Indian Iwo Jima hero, Ira Hayes. So it's not that unrealistic, but she was like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, and she felt that they had been taken advantage of, and then she appealed for aid and assistance in rebuilding her home. The federal government said no, and she was like, well, she spoke to Jet magazine in the 70s and said, you know, they should be helping someone whose son died for his country. So she felt that she hadn't been given her fair share and had been left to sort of languish um, in relative poverty, and people exploited her. She said, we've been exploited by blacks and whites in the name of Doris. His father died in 1949, so there wasn't much time for him to leave much of a, an opinion on the matter, but yeah, thank you for the question. To your far left, towards the front, please. Uh, thank you very much. Just a comment and a question. So I'm, I'm kind of struck by the similarity be, be, between uh, Dory Miller and Jesse Brown. I don't know if you're familiar with Jesse yeah. Brown. He was the first naval aviator. Uh, he was shot down near the Chosun Reservoir in December of 1950 uh, in a white white wingman, uh, Thomas Hudner, landed. landed to save him. They couldn't save Brown. Hudner uh, got the Medal of Honor for his actions. I, my understanding is they eventually named a, a ship after uh, Brown. I think about the same time they did it for Miller. In the 70s. In the 70s, correct. But my question, uh, you showed a picture of Nimitz uh, giving Miller uh, 
his, uh, his medal. Any thoughts about uh, any efforts that Nimitz did in his command at, at SyncPAC to change African-American experience? And that's a big deal that you've got a head of SyncPAC giving a medal to anybody, because he didn't have to do that, I would imagine. Any thoughts on Nimitz's role? Do you know anything about that, John? No, I don't know about that. I know about Brown. OK. Um, yeah, I don't know an awful lot about what Nimitz did or didn't do, to be honest with you. Um, I know that there were changes made in the war in terms of what African Americans were allowed to do, um, but I, I can't tell you what, what Chester Nimitz's role was, so I apologize for that. I know a bit about Kimmel, but not much about Nimitz. No. Well, one thing you do have, by the end of the war, they have commissioned a ship uh, officered by white officers, but entirely crewed by black seamen um, to operate in the Atlantic and escort. And you do find that they're training African Americans as gunners. Uh, one of the most interesting photos I've run across uh, is a photograph of two men uh, manning a gun on a marine landing craft in the Pacific. And they're sitting up there shirtless and shorts behind the gun, and one is black and the other's white. And the response to the journal when it came out was, what is this? What are these two guys? Because they said so-and-so uh, and so-and-so. I think the white fellow was from Arkansas. The black fellow was from somewhere else in the South. And they pointed out that they were also best friends. And they couldn't figure out what to do. This is 1944. And the point was that the African-American Marine uh, was a messman on the ship, but he was the gunner in combat, and the white fellow was the loader, and they worked very well together. I think what you, and of course, if you know about the Point Montford Marines, they're actually doing supply in combat. They're not out of combat. They're taking fellows out. They're supplying the front lines. Um, what gradually happens in World War II, despite uh, the racism, is that if you put, for example, African-American mess men on a submarine, and they were on submarines, I've seen a marvelous article by one of the white submariners saying, these guys responded to being depth charged the same way we did, and they did their jobs throughout. Segregation just doesn't make any damn sense. And I think you see this, uh, which is one of the reasons why the civil rights movement, the NAACP was always integrated, but why more and more white people did join, because they realized in their experiences, and we'll talk some about fifth platoons and the tank, destroyer and tank battalions that fought in Europe, they realized that uh, they fought well together once you put them together. Uh, but there was always going to be that issue behind the lines and how to deal with it. I'd also just add, uh, as far as Nimitz goes, that the citation, the Navy Cross, uh, FDR, and the Attorney General were, were, were both involved in securing that. So I don't know how much agency Nimitz would have had to say no to the commander-in-chief. You know, I, I don't know that, but yeah, it came from FDR. Well, as Steph said at the beginning, this is an important session for us to include in the symposium, and I think with one of our longest-serving advisors at now 16, well, 15 and a half years, John. Oh, God. Uh, and Robert, who we met, I believe, a year and one week ago this weekend when we saw him referenced in a New York Times article on many of these same subjects. Uh, you've got the new and the not as new, but still young, still <laughs> old, young. <laughs> old, just give it. Um, <laughs> uh, Robert touches on a lot of things uh, that we wanted to bring to your attention. Many of you are loyal followers. We've had our Memory Wars conference planned for some time, and we are still planning it, and we are still hosting it. It will be all virtual. March 24, 25, 26, like the March of this year conference. It will be all online and all free. So Memory Wars, World War II at 75, will touch on many of the issues that Robert touched on, but also looking globally. So I'd like to thank Robert, 
John, and of course, Dr. Steph Hennerschitz for a wonderful panel. Please join me with a round of applause. Our panelists will be outside um, signing books. Continue talking, please. We have a little snack for the break time. And please be back at 3 o'clock for the next session. For those of you that are enjoying the oral histories, come back about five minutes early. Thank you. <laughs>
Hello, my name is Tyler Bamford, Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum. And today joining me is Dr. Jason Dossie, Research Historian here at the National World War II Museum. Today we're going to talk about the liberation of Dora Middlebow by the 104th Infantry Division on April 11th. Dr. Dossie, can you tell me what the experience of the 104th Infantry Division was leading up to their liberation of Dora Middlebow? So the 104th Infantry Division is a fascinating story in its own right, Tyler. Like, it's a unit that trained in mostly in the Pacific Northwest, and so it earned this nickname, the Timberwolf Division. And by the time it's ready to ship out in 1944 for combat in Western Europe, it's under the command of Major General uh, Terry de la Mesa Allen Sr., known as Terrible Terry to uh, many of his men. And the unit has a long history, really some 200 days of combat. It lands in early September 1944. It sees some action connected to Hürtgen Forest, mm -hmm. fights in Belgium and the Netherlands, and part of that time it's actually fighting with British and Canadian units, and then gets pulled back to the First Army, American First Army. It does basically defensive fighting from the time of the Battle of the Bulge late December 1944 into February 1945. Mm -hmm. And then once things go on the offensive again for the United States, it's involved in taking the, the great German Rhine city of Cologne. And then the following month is involved in the, the Ruhr Pocket offensive where the Americans surround an entire German army group. So the division has a long record of combat before it gets to Dora Metalbow, and then it sees something that is absolutely horrifying. So when this veteran division comes upon Dora Metalbow, what is the scene that greets it? What, what is exactly that these veterans come, what is it they see? It's really difficult to put into words. I mean, it was a, a, an utter hell, this, this camp. And Americans, I think we think we know a lot about the Nazi camp system, but there's many of these camps we don't know so much about. I mean, we're familiar with Dachau, perhaps, maybe Buchenwald, but Dora Metalbau was very different from those camps insofar as that it was set up really in 1943 to be a producer of the V-2 rocket, the A-4 or V-2 vengeance weapon 2 rocket mm -hmm. that the Nazi dictatorship thought would be a, a miracle weapon, would really change the course of the war. So they had this underground facility at Dora Metal Bow. It's north of the city of Nordhausen mm -hmm. in the southern part of the Hartz Mountains in central Germany. And there, this gigantic facility was put into place by slave labor. Mm -hmm. And they it was underground. I mean, for at least much of the time, the prisoners worked. And actually, prisoners may be too generous. I mean, these are inmates. They're, they're forced laborers. Uh, that are they're living underground, they're working underground under the most brutal conditions. Twelve-hour days may be short days, you know, with they're basically being whipped, being beaten, and in many cases where the SS uh, feels like they need to make examples out of people, they, they execute prisoners for what would seem to many of us to be fairly um, minor infractions. So it's draconian. It's absolutely a brutal place. And there's some 6,000 of these V-2 rockets were produced there during the second half of World War II. And we think that in the process, about 20,000 of these inmates perished at Dora Metalbow. So when the 104th Infantry Division arrives there on the 11th of April, the 3rd Armored Division had already discovered the site. And the Armored Division asked for help, mm -hmm. and understandably so. They were facing a, a, a real catastrophe, and so they found about 750 inmates that the SS had abandoned when they moved They moved others to Bergen-Belsen, which was liberated by the British four days later on April 15th, but about 750 they find alive, and they find about 3,000 corpses while they're there too. So the 104th Division comes across what is basically a humanitarian crisis, and this is a scene that they're not at all prepared to experience, um, And in, in addition to the 3rd Armored, like you mentioned. So what is it that, that these veterans, you know, could have done at that time? What is it that they would have been doing? They really do swing into action, and the first thing is to get as much medical care as possible for 
the survivors. Uh, many of them are emaciated, uh, there's, there's disease, and just maltreatment. There's really a series of factors that had added up for the, uh, for the men that are there. And these are men that, by the way, are from all over, from the Soviet Union, from Poland, from Czechoslovakia, from France. In some cases they had been people in the resistance. Others had people who had, quote, criminal backgrounds that are brought there. They, they have different backgrounds, but had come together in this sort of polyglot universe that the SS created underground there. And so the, the men of the 104th are just doing what they can do. And, and that's, it's really on the fly. Everything they're doing is, is, is with as much urgency as they can. And it's amazing, in fact, what they're able to accomplish given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting, too, that the 104th, like many American units, they do not allow Germans in the surrounding area to pretend they didn't know about the camp or that what had gone on there, you know, that they could simply pretend or ignore it. So they forced many of them to come in and mm -hmm. bury the dead. Wow. It is important to remember that the Dora Mittelbau was one of thousands of, of concentration camps and work camps all throughout Germany, and that even though uh, many Germans feigned ignorance, these camps were everywhere from rural isolated areas to the suburbs of major cities. Now, the 104th Infantry was one of 36 divisions that the United States Holocaust Museum has identified as liberator divisions, and it's important as we come across, as we come upon the anniversary of victory in Europe, that we remember these uh, liberators and the liberated at the same time. J.J. Whitmire was a platoon leader with the 79th Infantry Division and spent more than 200 days on the front lines battling through hedgerow country in France. After a particularly brutal day, Whitmire and his platoon were dispatched to track down a German machine gun unit responsible for killing a company commander the previous day. I had three other people with me, and I had a little fellow named Ferriola. I took care of him like he was my son. I really took good care of him. So we crawled along behind this brick wall, and I'm the first one in. And I guess the other guys were pretty much smeared up, too. The company commander called for Whitmire's platoon to rejoin the unit on the other side of the wall. I took this Ferriola by the hand, and I got up on the wall, and I pulled him up on the wall, and that machine gun cut loose, and, and it hit this boy through his neck right in its V. I was sitting on the ground and had him cradled in my arms, and he was squirting blood all over me, and he died. This was like my kid. Lepley told me afterward, he said, everybody around you took your rifle and fired every round they had in their rifle. I know that's where I changed from. First, I had to change from a civilian to a soldier. Then I had to change from a, a soldier to a, a killer. Whitmire later fought in the port city of Cherbourg, France, and moved with the unit to Haguenau, where he was wounded in combat. In June 1943, Charles McGee was one of the first graduates of an experimental Army pilot training program at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. It was the first time in American history that African Americans were allowed to fly military aircraft. After graduation, McGee was assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group, where he escorted heavy bombers from the 15th Air Force over targets in occupied Europe. I ended up uh, in one dogfight and shooting down a Falkworth 190. And we uh, provided our escort, and only if the bombers were attacked did we dispatch a flight to fight off that attack. And I was dispatched, and fortunately was able to get a bead on the Falkworth over the aerodrome. The dogfights take place pretty quickly, and in a few minutes it's over, and you're climbing back up to join the back in or head back home uh, yourself. After 137 combat missions, the reality of war sinks in. When you realize that, first of all, that fire they're putting up was meant to <laughs> knock you out of the sky, uh, uh, it gets your attention, and the idea is not to kill the other pilots. You don't go in it with that, but to 
destroy their aircraft and hopefully they bailed out. I'm not so sure in the case of mine that the pilot got out, but uh, that's, it was one or the other and uh, so you do your job. After the war, McGee remained in the Air Force until 1973, retiring as a colonel. Charles McGee flew more combat missions in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam than any other Air Force pilot. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is Victory in Europe Day. Tomorrow will also be victory in Europe's day. But let us not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, with all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. The injuries she has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States and other countries, and her detestable cruelties call for justice and retribution. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our task, both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the King. They call about three of us and said, you are now going to Oscudo, Michigan, and you'll be part of the Tuskegee. They didn't call it experiment, but that's what it was. According to the uh, study of black men in 1918 by the War Department, a black man who could not qualify uh, to be taught how to fly a plane. Unbelievable. Well, these persons had degrees in, from college and lawyers and whatever. And they say, there's a whole race of people that don't qualify. <laughs> what waste. After three years, 43, 44, 1945, December, I am given an honorable discharge after these years overseas in southern Italy. 1051st quartermaster of the 96th Air Service Group attached to the 332nd Fighter after serving that time with them, I came back and said, you cannot come in this door, boy. And a railroad station, when I was trying to buy a ticket home four to five minutes after I had been honorably discharged, you cannot come in this home. Colored people had to walk around the back. All over, I was born in segregation. It was something that you didn't get used to. We lift the American flag up in spite of the condition at home. One victory. Two, to come back home and fight segregation. 
following Martin Luther King. That was the second victory. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find your seats. We will begin the next session in five minutes, but here we have our final oral history showcase of the day. Thank you. I'm so honored to be with all of you today. Thank you. Yeah, let me introduce these uh, distinguished gentlemen. On my immediate left is Eddie Young, Ian Burney, and Dick Jarocco. So how did you guys feel when you saw all the planes flying overhead or the ships on fire? Like, how did that stick with you? I was six and a half and had just started first grade. And I was out playing in the yard that Sunday morning and I, I saw some airplanes and we had never seen an airplane where we lived. My father was concerned when he heard the shells nearby. So he pushed me back in the house and we, listen to our old Philco tabletop radio 
And there was a local radio personality named Webley Edwards who kept repeating, this is the real McCoy. We are under attack. This is the real McCoy. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, and I got out of my house and grabbed my old hand-me-down bicycle, and I looked out in the sky, and all of a sudden, I saw this Japanese Zero flying overhead. And my neighbor was next to me. I nudged him, and he was about 23 years old. I was nine, and I told him, Mr. Milamai, that's a Japanese Zero, because we draw planes at, at school, and I know that's a Zero. And he said, no, that's one of ours, Eddie. And finally, he looked up, and he saw the rising sun under the wings. And later, as I looked toward Pearl Harbor, when the uh, Zero passed over, he went to Pearl, and I saw all the flak in the air. So I knew this was the real thing. In a few minutes, I saw a big plume of smoke go up, went up 200 feet. It was not black, it was red. There was the Arizona, and eventually it turned black. How about you? How did you feel? Well, to begin with, I was in the Navy, and I was in a squadron of PBY Catalina flying boats. We were based here on uh, Fort Island in Hangar 54, which is the next one over from this one. What got our attention first was the noise that dive bombers were making coming down on our seaplane ramp. And we thought it was the Army Air Corps playing tricks on us. They used to come by on occasion and dive bomb us and drop flower sacks on us. So we all run out to front of the hangar and looked up. Didn't realize instantly that they were Japanese. Of course, when they released their bombs, they didn't look like flower sacks. And of course, when they pulled on their dives, they could see the red circle on the wings. Then it was a matter of self-preservation, get under cover somewhere. And there was no cover at all. So as luck would have it, they were putting a pipeline of some sort in out here between the, the hangars and the runway. And they hadn't put the pipe in it yet. So we all got in that. And basically, we were practically underground. So basically, what I remember the most was the noise and the concussions. After about an hour, everything stopped. Second wave come over after about 15, 20 minutes. So when that happened, back in the ditch for another hour. So was there any moment during that morning when you really realized that your life was going to be different? When nightfall came, then everyone in the neighborhood was shaking and being afraid that we don't know whether they landed troops or not. And there were rumors about trial troopers going up to the reservoir and putting poison in the water. So everybody started filling their bathtubs with drinking water. We were out of school for a couple of weeks, and I have, still have an ID issued by the territory on January 7th, 1942, which coincides with when I was fingerprinted and given an ID and issued a gas mask. And I carried that gas mask throughout the war. So thank you all so much for sharing your stories with me, and thank you for your service to the country. You're very welcome. Just something to think about. Hi there, John. How are you? Good. I mean, between the four of us, we can all throw out. Nobody has to talk on everyone. So every, everybody, welcome back. And uh, even the panelists, welcome back. Take your seats, please. Last, last second coaching going on here. Here we go. Hey, so welcome to our final symposium. So you would never detect from this that, that Con Crane used to be my boss. And so, you know, the likelihood that it's ever going to listen to me is pretty small. <laughs> so, uh, hey, so, uh, uh, you know, this is the Pearl Harbor what ifs discussion that we promised you was going to come later. Um, you know, we're, we're should be super interesting and provocative based on what we've heard. Of course, every panel we've had has been uh, super interesting and provocative so far. So um, now prior to coming to the museum, you know, I spent years, uh, decades, literally, uh, in the world of military planners, developing plans, 
branches and sequels for a range of potential contingency scenarios. And, and if you think about that, uh, this is kind of the hypothetical piece in that. So in the spirit of scenario planning, uh, consideration of alternate futures, uh, you know, and then the, the, the branches and attendant sequels, uh, our, our roundtable discussion will really consider the counterfactuals pertaining to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, looking at the period from November 1941 through August 1942. And so, of course, we've got the best people around to participate in this conversation. Uh, Khan's called it, you know, he's going to be the ringmaster for the stars. And uh, it's, it's really an amazing group uh, here today. And so, uh, Dr. Alan Millett is a member of the uh, museum's Presidential Counselors Advisory Board and the Ambrose Professor of History at the University of New Orleans. And uh, we have historians, uh, John Parshall, we saw earlier today. Thanks, John. Uh, Ian Toll, Ian, nice to meet you. And you know, as, as you know, they're all experts on this topic. So we'll have a lively uh, discussion uh, with questions, of course, uh, posed by uh, Dr. Con Crane, another presidential counselor, air power historian, chief of the historical services for the Army Heritage and Education Center. And then my boss, uh, 28 years ago now, I think. Uh, so a little while back. And, uh, but certainly an acknowledged expert on the Department of Defense, on contemporary conflict, on doctrine, and uh, strategic policy. And, and as Rob mentioned earlier, uh, he's uh, been awarded the prestigious Society of Military History Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize for his lifetime contribution to the field. So we really are. He may be the, the ringmaster for the stars, but he's also one of the stars in the firmament as well. And it's really, you know, my, my honor to, uh, to turn it over to Khan and uh, you know, say thanks to our team here and over Thank to you. you, sir. Thanks. Uh, you know that he had a distinguished career because he survived an evaluation for me in his younger days <laughs> and still made colonel. <laughs> I tried to ruin him, but I couldn't do it. Uh, the, uh, this is truly, I, 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 I told Mike that this, I, my general, as those of you who have seen me over the years know my general role with these conferences has been to handle these, these panels of experts that, like I said, ringmaster to the stars. And this is a great group. You've got Ian Toll, who is finishing up his distinguished trilogy on the Pacific War. John Parshall, you've you heard him this morning with his, his exemplary probably unmatched knowledge of naval warfare in the Pacific. And Al Millett, I thought that the description of a strange monk-like figure that we had from one of the panels <laughs> might fit, fit Al. Uh, I, he, has, he also has a lot of long titles that I, it'd be hard to... He's, he's hard still to, mad at me because I helped his softball team lose a game at yeah, that's point, he, he played 30 third, years ago. Played third base with the wrong glasses on. It was, I thought I was going to get him killed. Uh, but through, this is this is a uh, the, the trend. All the whole this whole session has been all these questions about there about what ifs, and to, we're gonna I'm gonna try to tap into these experts and and throw some questions out, and then we'll get over to the audi the audience, and you can bring all your counterfactuals to us. It's a lot of fun. One of the great things about counterfactual history, you can never be proven wrong. <laughs> so we can go all kinds of directions on this. Uh, I want to start out with one that, that actually uh, Dr. Kawamura kind of previewed this one this morning. Uh, she talked about this. There's a, there's a historian named uh, uh, Irvin Anderson that in the 70s started writing about the oil embargo and has a very convincing argument that, that President Roosevelt knew the oil embargo would push Japan into war and didn't want to go that far, but when the sanctions got put into effect, including the freezing of Japanese assets, that the State Department bureaucracy kind of went out of control. And, and basically, uh, even Secretary Hall kind of lost control of where it was going. And by the time it was done, the oil embargo was in place. FDR couldn't stop it. And we have the, this, this role. So the first question I want to throw out for this panel of experts is, so what happens if, if, if Anderson is right, and, and Richard Frank and I have had discussion, and, and Hard to believe, but there's actually conflicting evidence out there from FDR. But uh, 
<laughs> Richard Frank is not convinced that this is true. But the bottom line is, if, if Anderson is right, and, and FDR did have the sense that the oil embargo would push Japan to war and didn't want that, what happens if we do sanctions in the summer of 1941 without an oil embargo? Do we still end up with Japan going to war the way they do? Ha. No one wants to take that one. <laughs> I'm not going to. No, no. <laughs> No, actually, I will. Um, I think I would go back uh, to Rob Satino's statement at the beginning that I, I think all you're really going to get out of that is you may get a little more time out, out of the process. Um, and it's clear that it, that it was a good time for us to be stalling for all the time that we could get, uh, given the state of our own war preparations. But I think, again, just sort of given the, the larger trajectories of the U.S. And, and Japan and their entanglements in China, that, that there's no way at some point that those two are not going to come into a collision course and you're going to end up with a war. I just don't know when. So that's my take. So it, it, you would say that maybe a little later, but war would still be I think inevitable. that's what I'd say, yeah. Okay. Um, I like that. Yeah, I like that reasoning. Um, you know, I, it was it was clear that the the total oil embargo really did uh, start a clock ticking because the Japanese were immediately required to tap into their stockpile, which was finite, and they didn't have any uh, realistic solution to that problem, other than essentially giving our government what we wanted, uh, including a full pullout of China. Uh, or going, uh, going south as they did to go get the oil, to go take it uh, from the Nether Netherlands uh, East Indies. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if, the, if that clock didn't start ticking, or if it was ticking, but it was ticking more slowly because it wasn't a total embargo, uh, then um, I, I think you can, you can see a, a plausible counterfactual where the decision to go to war is delayed, and if it's delayed by even as much as a month, two months, at that point um, the Japanese would have, looking at the war in Russia, would have had a better idea that Hitler wasn't going to score a total victory, at least not that winter. Mm. Uh, and that um, you know, maybe starts to weigh a little bit in their decision making. Beyond that, I think it's sort of fruitless to speculate, but it is useful, I think, just to, to realize that this, this element of time, even if, even if uh, the decision had been pushed back by a matter of weeks, uh, that could have had significant consequences. Hmm. I'd say, too, uh, with respect uh, to the larger question, you know, we've already passed the Two Ocean Navy Bill. You know, regardless of what you do, uh, you know, having to do with, with an oil embargo in, in 1941, the Japanese are still aware that, again, the clock is ticking, and that sometime in late 1943, we are going to be given an absolutely insuperable writ of naval supremacy in this ocean, and their military options are going to be nil. So, you know, if you are going to go to war, the sooner the better. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me pursue another angle on this. Let's talk about the, the role the Philippines plays in, in Japanese decision-making also. You know, one of, one of the, the uh, things we talk about at the War College, we talk about deterrence, and we talk about one of the problems of deterrence is that the message you're trying to send is not only the one that, that gets received. And they talk about the fact that Marshall makes this big show about sending B-17s to the Philippines because he thinks that'll deter the Japanese from attacking when in fact it's more of a spur. It looks like we're increasing the threat. Was there, because there's some way that maybe, some way to make the Philippines seem less a threat, perhaps the Japanese at also. How, how do the Philippines factor into the Japanese decision making? Was there some way to maybe change that factor in what goes on? I don't think the Japanese were about to leave any potential enemy behind them. Um, if you talk about their access to, to oil, but the United States had 60% of the world's reserves, I think, at the time. The, the next big pump is Indonesia. The Japanese are looking for some way to replace uh, oil for military or economic purposes. They really have to take the Dutch East Indies as, as the, uh, the, the other alternative. Um, one of the things that's impressed me over the years, getting to know some of the Japanese military historians and, and Japanese military culture is how deeply affected they were by the German experience. Um, there is a huge Clausewitz club in Japan, even today, 
Rob Satino is in <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's still uh, I think we overlook the fact that the European military influence upon Japan is German and British, mm -hmm. sure not American, and um, certainly it would have run counter to either British or German strategy as it existed to leave uh, a potential force at your at your rear, which had some naval and air capability to interrupt uh, uh, your movement. I think we sometimes forget how few Japanese divisions, I think it's like six, you know, were involved in the move south. Um, certainly the Japanese were concerned about any losses at all to their, their naval forces. Um, one of the things that I think struck me in trying to do, you know, the history of the Pacific War from something other than an American perspective as to how, how anxious, neurotic, and almost hysterical most of the Japanese decision makers were in thinking about all the bad things that might happen to them if they didn't uh, plan to eliminate any possible threat. Mm -hmm. hmm. I, I was going to add to that, too, that, uh, you know, the classic answer around the question always does come down to the sea lines of communication, that the Japanese can't leave an unreduced enemy bastion sitting aside those, those slocks. There was a, an article uh, in uh, Morley's book talking about the role of the Japanese Navy leading up into the war, and a friend of mine just, just recently pointed this out to me. He said, you know, if you look, there's a series of war games that were conducted by the Navy just prior to the outbreak of the war, and in those war games, the Imperial Navy tried out various scenarios where, like, okay, let's just attack the Dutch, or let's just attack the British and see if we can get away with that, and yet, in every one of those scenarios, what inevitably ended up happening was that they ended up in a war with all three powers. And so having come to that conclusion um, in those pre-war war games, they then decided, you know, if, if we are going to go to war, we have to go to war to all, with all three of them simultaneously and therefore Pearl Harbor. Okay, let, let, let's move. For, okay, so that's war gaming, which obviously is not real, reality. It, did the... This kind of a two-part question, and we'll get into, Ian and I talked a little bit this, we'll get into the fact about no Pearl Harbor with this, but to start out, did the, could the Japanese have, a, did they have other options besides, we already talked, one of the implications of your panel was, you know, the, 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 the Navy, the, the Pearl Harbor didn't really affect the Navy's readiness that much. I mean, the, mm. the, the Navy probably couldn't respond a whole lot quicker with or without right. Pearl Harbor. So could the Japanese have accomplished their same objectives without Pearl Harbor? And everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. But but totally improbable given the strategic culture that existed at, at the time. I think the, when people make really big mistakes, they're almost invariably at the political strategic level, not at the operational or tactical level. And uh, I think Japanese first mistake was to assume the war with the United States was inevitable. Um, that an opportunity that it, it presented itself in 1941, which would not be there in 43 or 44, when the United States fleet would probably be expanded by a factor of two or three. Um, they knew what the building program was, and they could tell that they were falling behind. And, and uh, if, if you assume that war is inevitable, then you better go soon rather than later, which certainly seems to have been the consensus among the leadership of the Japanese Navy at the time. H.P. Wilmot made the point in one of his books that if the Japanese had been successful at Pearl Harbor and had sunk every single American warship in the harbor, and then had lost no warships between that time and, I can't remember the, the date, uh, actually, Leyte Gulf, that the Americans in that span of 36 months would have assembled a fleet that would have outnumbered the entire Japanese Navy even as it stood. You know, the, the Americans brought more destroyers to uh, the Battle of Leyte Gulf than the Japanese brought aircraft. So, <laughs> you know, those sort of statistics make it, make it pretty plain. Well, you have two classes of battleships that have already been authorized before the Naval <laughs> Act of 1940. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we fought most of the Pacific War with, with ships that were funded and laid down before 1940. Yeah. Um, most of the U.S. Navy, 
disappeared right. in 1943. We won the war with the Navy in some ways didn't even exist when Pearl Harbor uh, occurred. I think back to your your original question, though. You know, would would the Japanese have been able to accomplish their their mission without Pearl Harbor? Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, one of the uh, most prominent aspects of the the initial opening Japanese offensive is they really are sort of punching into air in, in a lot of ways. That that our preparations for war were terrible, as were the British, as were the Dutch, and uh, we were in no position to defend ourselves. And given the logistical difficulties of fighting in that neck of the woods, in any case, we were not going to be able to project power there effectively. And they still had to. We still they still had to go into the Philippines though. Right. So the Philippines still go, but they could have maybe left Hawaii alone. Philippines still go. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't attack Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> really makes no difference uh, to at least the first six months of the war. Probably the first year of the war. And um, it becomes clear when you just look at what it took for us to actually push a fleet across the Pacific. When we eventually did that, uh, you had to establish uh, advanced bases with the ability to service hundreds of ships. That capability did not exist in 1941 did not exist in 1942, did not exist in 1943. It really wasn't until early 1944, uh, with the establishment and the very rapid growth of these service squadrons, that we had the ability to set up in these remote mid-Pacific atolls, places like uh, Majuro, Inuitak, Kwajalein, uh, Ulithi eventually in the south, and uh, Manus uh, and uh, coastal roads. Uh, these huge floating naval bases, essentially, where uh, they were able to supply uh, the fleets as they came in with everything that they needed, fuel, ammunition, provisions, and, uh, and even conduct uh, repairs, including some pretty major repairs in floating uh, dry docks. Um, none of that capability existed at all at the beginning of the war, and really not until uh, the second half of the war. And so our ability to actually project naval power into the Western Pacific absolutely did not exist. And so destroying uh, battleships uh, in Pearl Harbor uh, really had no impact at all for the way the war would unfold uh, in, in the uh, first half of the war. Oh, wow. So, so we got a scenario here where Pearl Harbor was not necessary. The Japanese could have accomplished what they wanted without Pearl Harbor. Yep. So what's the world like without Pearl Harbor? What happens, let Ian start, because I know he had talked about it, he thought about that. What happens if there is, the Japanese, can, they attack south, but they don't attack Pearl Harbor? Yeah, so, you know, here we, we come to this, this issue of um, the military and the political. In Japan, you have the military essentially running the country. And, um, and so when we talk about the careers of these admirals and generals, these Japanese admirals and generals, we as Americans, this is true of the British as well, our instinct is to evaluate their decisions, their careers, in the same way that we would evaluate uh, the careers of American military leaders. But they were more than that, really, in Japan. They were the politicians, the statesmen who were making the major decisions, the foreign policy decisions. They were even making decisions about domestic policy. You had uh, generals and admirals running the education system in Japan, just as an example. So, you know, these people were politicians. They were uh, the circle of rulers of Japan who were making all of the decisions. So the decision to attack Pearl Harbor was uh, a military decision founded principally on this, this idea that we have to clear our, our left flank so we can go south. We have to score this, this victory in order to uh, essentially blunt the American response to what we're about to do. There was the secondary, and this was discussed in the earlier panels, this, this secondary uh, idea that you might be able to destroy American morale at the beginning of the war, and that uh, our government would then come hat in hand asking the Japanese for a truce. Um, it was that second assumption which was really just so badly flawed, because of course the, uh, the result was, as every school child knows, was exactly the opposite. The, attack on Pearl Harbor enraged and united the American people. Uh, and it was really all over at that point. Uh, the rest was simply had to be played out over a, a long and bloody war in which the outcome was not in doubt. FDR, prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, <clears throat> was very, very concerned about this scenario where the Japanese would go south, would scrupulously avoid touching the Philippines, Guam, any other American territory, avoid any sort of hostilities at all with any American forces, uh, not attack any American territory, 
but attacked the British and the, the Dutch uh, and with the, with the uh, goal of, of going and taking the oil fields in Borneo and Sumatra. And um, that's the counterfactual, I think, that would have caused the most uh, severe problems for the United States and, in fact, for the Allies. Uh, because it is very hard looking at the political situation in, in the United States in 19, fall of 1941 to see how the country could have entered the war united and determined. FDR perhaps could have asked for a vote, a declaration of war. That would have been a divisive issue. Uh, the isolationists in, in Congress who were very strong, strong in both parties, uh, would have opposed the declaration of war. He might have gotten a declaration of war through Congress. It would have been on a close vote. And at that point, the uh, American people would have been divided. And that is not the way that uh, we could have entered the war effectively. I think we still would have won, but it might have taken longer. Uh, and so uh, by attacking uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, a surprise attack with, with no declaration of war, uh, the Japanese essentially uh, solved this dilemma yep. for FDR. They solved his greatest political problem. It was one of the most extraordinary blunders, really, in all of history when you think about it. I was going to trot out the counter counterfactual that, okay, what, what happens if uh, the Japanese drive south, don't attack the U.S., but then in desperation, Hitler decides to declare war on the U.S. in hopes that the Japanese will follow him in? That's another possibility. Ooh. Who knows? Hmm. Yeah, that, that would be another one. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead I think what we've overlooked, however, is the influence of the Chinese nationalists and their peril and the enormous amount of support that the Chinese nationalist cause had in the United States. Uh, I'm old enough to remember Pearl Buck and the uh, Yuan Flying Boy of China and Luce and, you know, the, the, it's hard to um, recapture the amount of influence, particularly through the Protestant churches, that the Chinese nationalists had. And um, it had been tough to get aid to them both uh, politically, but mostly logistically. You just couldn't find a way to, to, to supply the Chinese. Uh, but we forget that um, the China lobby was a, was a real deal, and many of the leaders of American business and journalism were uh, dying to do something to help the Chinese nationalists. And so I think that, um, that that's a factor that, that needs to be considered in in looking for the amount of popular support that might have existed even without Pearl Harbor for doing more to help the Chinese if one could figure out a way to do it. Of course, another spin-off of that counterfactual, the counterfactual is what happens if Hitler doesn't declare war in the United States after Pearl Harbor? That's a huge problem for, a, for FDR as well, obviously. Um, Klaus Schmeider has just come out with a brand new book on Hitler's decision to to declare a war uh, from Cambridge, actually. It's a wonderful book, if anybody's interested in that. But there's a, the problem for Hitler is that he's operating under bad information at this point. He doesn't really understand at the time that he's formulating this decision to go to war with the US just how badly things are unraveling on the Eastern Front and other factors as well. But yeah, it would have been a terrible problem for FDR. Yeah, that goes back to Ian's point about if if, 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 this, if this clock gets delayed a month or two, how does that influence everybody? It's not just American decision-making, Japanese decision-making, but German decision-making as well. Yeah. So another point, if, if the Japanese had decided against the Pearl Harbor operation, uh, which of course um, many in the, in the Navy and in the regime were, were opposed to it, but they had gone south, they had attacked us, they had attacked Guam, uh, and they had attacked the Philippines. <clears throat> There's little doubt that uh, that they would have wiped out MacArthur's Air Force, as they essentially did, even when uh, uh, MacArthur had something like nine hours notice because of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So with no notice, that fiasco in the Philippines would have been even worse. At that point, of all the various things that would flow from that, one you could be certain of is that Douglas MacArthur would have been relieved of command because the, the anger of the American people, of Congress, of our government, <laughs> would have fastened itself on him rather than having been diverted to the commanders in Hawaii who were scapegoated. Uh, so uh, that alone, ending the career of Douglas MacArthur so that no one would remember him except a few historians, uh, think about the long-term implications of that 
uh, not only in the Second World War, but in the aftermath of the Second World War and in Korea. Hmm. It's, uh, yeah, that's what, we, what we, we'll, we'll see. We may talk about the Clark Field and some of the things that happened in the Philippines. But when we get, let's get on some tactical things. I, I'll just say that the, if you look in the dictionary with a picture of the, under the, the, the phrase, screw up and move up, Louis Brereton is there, who is yeah, the, their commander at the Philippines, who screws up there and then screws up in North Africa and then screws up at Market Garden and continues to move up somehow. Uh, let's 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 go. There are some things that came out of the the, the Pearl Harbor panel about the, both the Japanese and American uh, conduct of that attack that that I want to try to get into before we turn over the audience. And I was I was dig, doing some digging on timelines, and I found that one note that at 3:42 a.m. on the 7th of December, the minesweeper Condor reported a periscope, mm. which the ward responded to, but but couldn't find anything. But if, if that warning is taken seriously and the forces at Pearl Harbor have about four hours warning, how does that change things that happen on September 7th? Potentially, four, four hours warning. Yeah, potentially drastically. Um, <laughs> the first time I ever was on TV was uh, for Discovery Channel, and we got to war game that exact scenario out, that the fleet had gotten three and a half, four hours worth of warning, and that was sufficient time to raise steam. And, and get out of the harbor. And I was playing on that TV show, I was Genda, which was a great role to be. And my, my reaction to that was, <laughs> I am so delighted that they are in deep water. You know, that we now get to go after those American warships, uh, and if I sink them, that I sink them permanently. I'm here to tell you that uh, the American fleet was in no way prepared to defend itself against you know, a combined strike by Kido Butai and all of those planes being torpedo armed. They just, it would have been horrific. So at least that's how it came out on TV when I played it. Uh, we, we sank five or six American battleships and yeah, it, was, it was devastating. I think one of the things that you can't appreciate unless you've been to Honolulu is how narrow the exit channel is out of Pearl Harbor. Um, it's incredibly narrow, and, and if you get one battleship underway and actually gets jammed, there's no. It'd have to be that. sideways, though. Actually, the, it has to be sideways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But boy, it's it's uh, it's not. It's real. a wonder that anybody ever thought that they could get in and out of there with with some ease. Yeah. So if the. <clears throat> So that okay. So, so if there's one hour notice, say that the 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 the, the first the, a Catalina find, sees the first the one the ward eventually go after is 6:30. So mm -hmm. that gives them a little over an hour. So if they have a little over an hour notice, does that make any difference? I think it makes an incredible difference potentially. Um, if if you have let's extend it a little further. Do we have the some sort of coordination between the army and the navy in terms of how their air assets are going to be deployed? Because really the, the thing that we need at this point is to get uh, army interceptors up in the air as rapidly as possible. Uh, if we have some sort of uh, liaising system in place where we can actually alert those bases and get those fighters up in the air, that potentially takes a real bite out of the Japanese forces that are coming in. The other factor, of course, is um, any aircraft guns are fully manned. You know, that picture I showed in, in my presentation of what the, the second wave looked at as they were coming in, that's what the first wave would have seen as well. Um, they were, the Japanese were extremely impressed with how quickly we were able to man our guns. And, you know, uh, the, the volume of anti-aircraft fire that we put up was tremendous. Nothing that they anticipated. That, that reinforces, though, Rich Frank's point about the the condemnation for not setting up that better coordination for the Absolutely. air center. Because even, yeah. even if they had the warning from what he said, it probably wouldn't have a lot of impact because they didn't have the coordination set up to, to, to really take advantage of it. Yeah, I think you can make some you know, interesting arguments. You know, who had the best flak in the war? Was it, was it the Germans or the U.S. Navy? I come down on the side of the U.S. Navy. Certainly the 5-inch 38, I think, was the finest heavy anti-aircraft gun of the war. And not all of those ships had that. They had 5-inch 25s, but even so, uh, Navy anti-aircraft was very, very potent. So let, let's move to the, the second strike. We, 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 you took your shots at Genda and Fujita this morning. Yep. If the Japanese do have a successful, they come back for a second wave, what do they do with it? What do they accomplish with the second wave? If it were me, 
um, I'm going after those cruisers, and I'm also going after things like destroyer tenders and, and submarine tenders. Um, there's submarines. submarines, yeah, destroyers. There's plenty of warships to shoot at there, um, which uh, you know a 250 kilogram bomb would be very very effective in. Yeah. in there, there are 60 or six cruisers and 30 destroyers, not touched. Not touched. Yep. And not a single submarine. And not a single submarine. Yeah. They really like bombing battleships. You know. Yeah, they did. <laughs> They're also carriers, of course, too. If they've been there. Well, yeah, and, you know, that's the other counterfactual. You know, what happens if any of our carriers in the harbor? And the answer to that is very, very simple. I mean, 81 dive bombers against one or two carriers, that thing is going to burn to the water line. Um, we would have lost, you know, any carrier that was in there that was absolutely going to be destroyed. So then what's the, what's the long term? Let's play the counterfactual on that. If the, three, if the carriers get destroyed, the, the, the Enterprise and the... Yes, say an Enter Enterprise in Lexington. Lexington. So they get they get sunk. How does that influence the first six months of the war? Uh, I think you see uh, obviously ships like the Wasp are going to be moved in from the Atlantic a lot sooner than July of 1942, among other things. Um, uh, I think that limits our options tremendously in the first year of the war. I, I think it's very difficult to anticipate that that you would see a campaign like Guadalcanal, for instance. I, I don't think that it really has a long-term impact uh, on the war. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't see the, the early carrier raids uh, that were conducted. Probably you don't see Coral Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then you don't see Midway. And, and so then, then you get into the interesting question of would it actually have helped uh, the Japanese if you had had a situation where they had hit two carriers, destroyed two carriers in the attack on Pearl Harbor. The war would have unfolded differently. Yamamoto would not have insisted on that midway operation, and then the Japanese would not have lost uh, the majority of their carrier striking force uh, just six months after Pearl Harbor, as they did. So, you know, again, this is why counterfactuals are so controversial among historians, but. I think you can paint a scenario where if those carriers were in port, as they very well could have been, and destroyed, uh, it uh, would have worked to the Japanese benefit uh, over at least the first year of the war. Actually, I'll push back on Midway. Um, I, I'm just about to get an article published in the Naval War College Review. It should be coming out in spring. And I didn't realize this until I was having some conversations a few years ago with John Lundstrom that Nimitz was prepared to fight the Japanese at Midway at odds of two carriers versus five. And so it's conceivable to me that, you know, we still have Saratoga on the West Coast. We, you know, we get the York, or the, uh, the Hornet in there, the Yorktown as well. You, you still could have potentially had a Midway uh, scenario sometime five, six months down the road. Of course, then you've got less. So my point was just that the, the impetus for the Midway operation was so closely linked to the omnipresent threat of the American carrier raids occurring up and down the periphery of the Japanese empire in that early part of the war. And if those raids weren't happening or if they weren't happening in as big a way, you know, I mean, it really is, it gets in the realm of, realm of, of speculation, but, you know, would the, the Midway operation have seemed as important uh, to the Japanese in a way that would have allowed Yamamoto essentially to force the Naval General Staff to approve the operation? I would argue that it would, um, because another one of the goals that Yamamoto had, of course, was that he wanted to be able to capture Oahu eventually. Because if we do bring the Americans to the bargaining table, um, having Oahu as a bargaining chip is incredibly important. Um, you know, certainly the, there was even discussion before Pearl Harbor within the Navy as to whether or not it was actually feasible to invade Oahu. Uh, unfortunately for the Japanese, of course, their, their sea lift capability is a zero-sum game. And if you're going to attack in the south, which was the, the absolute priority, we have to have oil, then I do not have the sea lift necessary to bring what they assumed would need to be three divisions to Oahu to capture the place. Well, that, that gives me another avenue to go down, though. I, one do of the it. things, being in the, sitting in the middle of the Army's archive, like I am up at Carlisle, we have all kinds of neat stuff. And this is the, the telephone log from the 25th Infantry Division from December 7th, 1941, from Schofield Barracks. And the, uh, the first reports of Japanese paratroopers landing at the airfield comes in about 10 o'clock. And then by noon, they're getting reports that there are Japanese landing on the beaches. Uh, a lot of these are coming, actually, from... Uh, 
uh, you know, for instance, at 1140, parachute troops have landed on the North Shore and have identified wearing blue coveralls with a red disc on their left shoulder. And a lot of these are coming from actually civilian police that are sending in these reports. Could be airmen coming in, hard to tell, but sure. there are a lot of these reports. And all of a sudden you've got these, if you read through it, you have this, these uh, blue coveralls and red discs showing up all over the place. Almost like, you know, the, the, coming these guys from Mars coming down and landing all over the beaches. But, uh, but there really was this sense that they were coming ashore. And of course, you know, at the end of the day, you've got everybody out there with their, their spring fields lay on the beaches waiting to repel the invasion. If Understanding it's a zero sum, but if they do what, what if they did decide to actually land on Oahu and follow up with some kind of a, a take? Could could they have taken it? Could they have held it? Uh, if they've decided to do that, now obviously it's a major change in the whole operation. But if they, could they have actually done something like that at Oahu? I'm going to trot out my opinion, and then I'm going to go let Alan give his because he actually knows more about Japanese amphibious capabilities than I do. I have a very healthy respect for uh, the Japanese military in the first six months of this war when it comes to ground combat. And, um, you know, Oahu is a very defensible place. The terrain is great for defense, but I think that. At this point in the war, we were probably not prepared to play up against their sort of up-tempo smash-mouth football that they used against uh, people like the, the British in Malaya. I don't know that we would have defended ourselves terribly well, given the shock factor and surprise and all of that stuff. Alan, where are you at? Yeah, that's, a, that's a hard call uh, to some degree. Um, the Japanese amphibious capability was real but very small. and. Uh, they certainly could have, I suppose, put a regiment ashore, you know, at Bellows Beach or someplace up on the North Shore. Um, it had been an interesting test because most of the Hawaiian National Guard was made up of Nisi. I mean, it was a, um, a Japanese-American organization. Um, I think that they would have mustered sufficient ground forces probably to repel simply because of artillery and tanks mm -hmm. that were in the hands of, of American forces. But you do have a, a very strange and volatile uh, civilian home front environment that, that would uh, certainly have made any kind of defense difficult, I think. But um, mm. I, I don't think, the, my recollection is that the Japanese ever really thought Seriously, about no, they, that kind they of didn't thing. because they, they did recognize that it was a zero sum yeah. game, they just didn't have the sea lift. The one thing I'd say about tanks, um, if you look at the defense of Lingayan uh, Gulf in Luzon, you know, the, the Americans had two battalions of uh, M3 Stewarts there, it's a hundred armored vehicles, which, in terms of Pacific armored combat, that is a crap ton of armor, and yet we couldn't utilize it at all, because MacArthur, frankly, had no idea how to do combined arms. And so I, I guess my pushback to that would be, OK, we, yeah, we got tanks in Oahu, but I don't know that we know how to use them against the Japanese in any sort of effective manner. Yeah, I, I'm looking at these reports. 1535, the report comes in, landing parties off Kahahu Point, three transports, three Japanese transports landing by sampan. <laughs> It's I mean, been a bad day for that. Yeah, everyone's a yeah, little... Obviously, obviously, they had some intel problems at the, on the ground, yeah. too. Yeah, there's some problems there. Well, I got news for you. The surf is pretty tough on the North Shore and out on the, the windward side of the island. True. I wouldn't want to be wouldn't out there in some dinghy trying to get ashore. Well, that's why they're coming in by sandpans, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but let's talk about the population of Hawaii. That's an interesting question, too. The heavily, you know, it's interesting. Of course, we will, we will eventually, in turn, the... Japanese on the West Coast, but we don't do it in Hawaii. But there's a very large Nisei population there as well. What if they... Well, they put a thousand of them oh, they away, did. yeah. The FBI and the local police uh, uh, what, scoured what, the Oahu to put... What could they have away? done if they were less... If there were pockets of disloyal... Could, what, how could they have affected this operation if there was a, you know, this strong... This group that were disloyal that were working? Well, I don't think much because most of these folks were, you know, first generation the Issei, you know, born in Japan, and they were elderly or certainly middle-aged. Um, most of the people who ended up in the 100th Battalion and the 442 were, were young, born in the United States. They were American citizens. Many of them attended the University of Hawaii, which in fact has a dorm dedicated to one of the 
officers of the 442. Um, I think they had a, a, a group of NR ROTC students who were disarmed and continued actually to serve in security uh, functions. Um, I think that they, they'd made the transition. They were Americans and they would have fought to hold the island. And then you have a large Filipino population, a Mexican population, Puerto Rican, uh, Portuguese. Um, Korean Chinese. Yeah, Chinese. I mean, and, and many of them um, ended up in the American Armed Forces during World War II and don't get anything like the recognition of 442 veterans received. Yeah, there was a, a lot of concern about both spies and, and sabotage prior to the attack in the American military. Um, in fact, that, that became a major issue in the post-Pearl Harbor reviews. The um, uh, military commanders in part uh, said that their uh, the, what failures there were to prepare for the attack were partly because they were focused on this issue of sabotage and the potential threat of this large uh, Japanese-American population in Hawaii. Um, it is, uh, I believe, a fact that other than the Nihau incident, which is when a hear you pilot crash-landed his plane on this island that's way out in the western part of the archipelago, um, <clears throat> he uh, uh, was able to essentially convince or perhaps force at gunpoint uh, some Japanese Americans there too, I think, uh, to essentially support him. Other than that one incident, I don't think there was a single documented incident of a Japanese American resident of the islands uh, working for the Japanese. The um, Japanese spy who is, he came up in one of the earlier panels, I think Yoshikawa was his name? Yeah, that guy is how we refer to him, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> the Japanese uh, naval officer who was posted to the consulate there under diplomatic cover. Um, he and his uh, communications with his government said, you know, these Japanese Americans here, they're not gonna be of any use to us at all, uh, so don't depend on them. Uh, and then of course, again in California, uh, you know, to try to find, can you find at least a few examples of Japanese Americans who were working for the Japanese to justify retrospectively, you know, this disgraceful uh, policy that we had? No, you can't. Uh, and so that is a, uh, it tells you a little bit about, I think, what exactly the nature of the threat uh, was or wasn't. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say the FBI and both naval and military intelligence were all over people who had been uh, potential spies. In fact, they attributed all kinds of terrible motives to people who were utterly innocent of any kind of military um, information gathering. Okay, well, I, I think if you, I, I've got other, other questions that I could throw out there, but I think it's time to open it to the audience. I know there's been a lot of stuff building out there, so I, I will I'm open you to fire from this direction. Excellent. <laughs> Well, thank you to our panelists for an insightful discussion of what if. We're going to start in the back to your right, gentlemen. If the USS Maine doesn't blow up in Havana Harbor, do the Japanese attack Franco's fascist Pacific Fleet in Manila? Oh, wow. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> Yeah, the time frame was strictly November 41 to <laughs> August 42. Who knows? <laughs> Holy crow. That's well, a great question. I'll, I'll take that one. I've always wanted to talk Excellent. about Franco's Pacific Fleet. <laughs> but, um, let me answer what I, what I think I'm going to interpret as the subtext of the question. Um, is this all just a big joke, this, uh, this, this considering of counterfactuals? Uh, it is controversial, as I mentioned earlier, among many scholars who say, don't do that. Um, the keynote address will be given by Neil Ferguson uh, tonight. Uh, he um, edited a very good book. I think it's called What Ifs of History. It's a, a collection of essays by different historians considering counterfactuals from different periods of history, different eras, different places, different subjects. Uh, the best part of that book, I thought, was Ferguson's introduction, which is a very long discussion. It gets, in, gets into the philosophy of history. It's kind of dazzling, really. Um, and uh, he develops an argument which I thought was convincing, which is uh, 
Listen, you have to deal with counterfactuals as a historian because uh, they are linked to the issue of causality. If you believe there is causality in history, if one event can cause another, then you must also accept that it could have happened differently. If you don't accept it, it could have happened differently, you're saying there's no causality, and then what are you doing this for anyway? You're really just writing down what happened. Mm. Uh, so I think there is some role for counterfactuals. The problem with it, of course, is that it can quickly move into flights of speculation which are not useful. We'll go to your left about halfway back. Hey, this one's for uh, Pascal. Um, do you think that um, the Nevada would have done anything if it had managed to get out of Pearl Harbor, seeing as it is one of the only ships to really get underway, as in one of the only capital ships? Do you think it would have had any effect on the uh, Japanese carrier force at all? I can't anticipate that it would have. No, what is it going to do? It's it's not fast enough to catch Kitabutai. It's never going to get within gun range of Kitabutai. Uh, frankly, it was also a, already in a semi-sinking condition because of that torpedo hit during the first wave. I think that Nevada was, again, lucky to have beached herself where she did because she could have been in bigger trouble if she had actually exited the harbor. Who knows, you know, what if she runs into one of the Japanese submarines that's lurking around out there? She could have been the recipient of, of badness, so. To your right, halfway back. Is there any chance at which the Get Japan First movement would have won? I'm looking at, uh, I've, I've been talking a lot here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a, and I'm, I'm not being smug here. I'm, I'm really telling you what a great number of Japanese strategists yeah. had concluded, that if there had a, any chance for a military victory, it had to come then, in 1941-42. The time was working against their use of force, if that was necessary to get what they wanted from the United States. It, it's really kind of hard to imagine what kind of events would have uh, turned the war around. I think what we, we are interested in is why did it last as long as it did, or why didn't you know it uh, be resolved sooner, later? I mean, there are plenty of contingencies in there that, that can be you know, dealt with, and uh, I think they might affect the casualties, they might affect the, the losses to the various forces, but I think in terms of an outcome, it's really pretty hard to imagine it's been very different. I think that it's hard for, for us, at least those of you and I who are, remember the wartime period, to generate the tremendous hatred for Japan that Pearl Harbor and the subsequent uh, events caused. Now, some of it was simply anti-Asian racism, but but um, you didn't have to um, work up much of a sweat to be very uh, uh, unhappy with the Japanese. Uh, a couple of times in my life I've slipped and talked about the Nips, you know, which dates me as a World War II kid. Um, but it was a fair representation of how we felt about the Japanese. I was actually just going to ask back to the questioner, are you referring more to would we have pivoted to going after Japan first in lieu of Germany? Yes, sir. If Pearl Harbor hadn't have occurred, okay. do you think that would have been the outcome? Or would it have been worse? That's a really interesting question. I, I think you can make an argument. Um, you know, we gave lip service to a Germany first strategy during World War II, but uh, it's pretty clear to me that, you know, Ernest King never really paid any attention to that, really. And that that we, in, in King's mind, uh, Japan never receded to uh, the status of the power that we're gonna go after second. And in fact, if you look at uh, movements of troops uh, from the U.S. during the first half of 1942, the majority of those troops are actually designated for points in the Pacific rather than uh, points elsewhere. So, uh, in King's mind, he was fighting a parallel war, and, and Japan was always going to be on the top of the list, if for no other reason than the Pacific is the Navy's war to fight. So, 
Um, I, I think you can you can actually say that what you got kind of was uh, J Japan as as a co-equal uh, in the eyes of of the U.S. military uh, in in terms of the amount of effort that got put out to it, uh, at least in the first year. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, you know, the, the Pacific was not stable from our point of view in the first year. Uh, the Japanese were taking territory very rapidly, so there, I think you can say there's a greater emergency to be dealt with. Uh, whereas in Europe, um, our principal ally, Great Britain, has the English Channel as its safe moat, uh, at least for the time being. Germany's tied down in Russia. Uh, so I think that dictated a lot of those choices that um, really as in the first year of the war, quite a bit of our effort was going to trying to stabilize the situation uh, in the Pacific and to particular to secure Hawaii and to secure our sea communications to New Zealand and Australia, which were going to be the base for the, um, for the event, eventual counteroffensive. Just uh, to try to send this contemporary issues, about two years ago, I was invited over to do a, a conference with the Japanese about current strategy in the Pacific, and, and, and I felt like I was stepping back into 1944, looking at the, because the Japanese now are, they've, they've turned their focus now to China, but we, we, you talked this morning about Japanese overextension. Mm -hmm. They've got the same dilemma. They, they're talking about defending a different set of island chains, but now from a different direction, but they've got the same problems. How do you, how do you reinforce them? What, what do you put on the islands? Um, how do you coordinate operations? How do you avoid getting bypassed and set us? I mean, the, 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 their problem set, is, I, like I said, I, it was deja vu all over again, walking into the, to try to deal with them. So that the city, you know, and, and the Americans are dealing with the same thing with some of the talk about defending Guam and some of those things. You've still got the same, yep. the Pacific is still a theater of distance and, and sea power and air power and, and the, 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 to say that the dynamics of war in the Pacific today are the same as they were in, in the 1940s. I, I think that we don't appreciate the vastness of that part of the world. I mean, I mm -hmm. was somebody who went to Europe fairly often early in my career, and then I did a flip-flop and ended up going to Asia a lot. And my body will tell you it's a lot longer <laughs> to get to <laughs> China and Korea in Japan than it is to Great Britain. If I go to Europe now, it's like, uh, I guess I'll stop at Atlanta momentarily. I mean, don't even think about it. But I can sure tell you that you think a long time about how you get to Tokyo or Beijing or Seoul. Hmm. My solution was to stop in Hawaii for R&R &R and then go on. <laughs> and then on. continue on. <laughs> but, but unless you really do it and, and appreciate the distances, you can't understand the Pacific War. Next question is to your right, halfway back with Connie. This may be a slightly modified version of the uh, Dutch and British first. Assume uh, the fleet stays in San Diego, that they're not moved to uh, Pearl Harbor, that the Japanese bypass the Philippines and Guam, make no attack on the U.S., and declare the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere is done, they guarantee the future security of Australia and New Zealand. Do we attack them? Uh, so we're assuming they do attack Great Britain and they take uh, Malaya and Singapore. Yeah. Good. Connie, the microphone, please. <laughs> panel looks at each other. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, that they get their southern uh, initiative completed, which does not include Australia and New Zealand. They get the oil yeah. that they want and declare, we're done. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're peaceful now. Do we attack them? I think FDR still has to try for a declaration at that yeah. point. I, can, I, I think he has to look at that and say, you know, we're, we're, we're on the slippery slope at this point. And we we got to stop. I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a political question, really. It's, uh, you know, what does FDR do? What does the U.S. Congress do? What, how do the American people react to that? What's the press do? It's the... It's one of the, it's the burden of being a democracy, right, that you've got to have uh, some consensus to, to go to war. Um, I think it's an immensely difficult problem. 
for, for FDR, for the Allies, uh, for Americans who at that point foresaw that inevitably we were going to have to get into this global conflict and, and settle it in a way that was satisfactory uh, for democracy. Um, and I think it's just very hard to speculate what happens uh, in that case. I think it takes longer uh, for the United States both to declare war and to actually fully mobilize. Uh, I think it's a longer war, and um, I think we win it uh, in the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, you could easily see it going to 1948, perhaps. Uh, again, that's just guesswork. Uh, I think informed speculation, I guess, is the polite thing to call it. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a political problem. And uh, it's a very good book by Lynn Olson called Those Angry Days, which is about the, the great debate uh, between the isolationists and the interventionists uh, leading up to the Second World War. <clears throat> and it really does just remind you, as bitter as our, and polarized as our politics are today, they were bitter and polarized uh, in that era as well. Uh, FDR's opponents uh, really hated him with a will and a passion. And, uh, and all of that fed into this debate over what to do before Pearl Harbor. I, I think the Japanese are cooked anyway, if you look at it, largely because the opposition to war in the United States was largely among traditional isolationists, which would include Scandinavians, German Americans, Irish Americans. Unfortunately, I think racial bias and lots of other factors made the Japanese perfect targets. You can't find anybody from the ACLU jumping up and down saying, oh, we can't do this to the Japanese. The truth is that most Americans could have cared less and they thought that you could do anything to the Japanese that was okay. Um, I think the Japanese uh, totally misread uh, the depths of American racial distaste for them. Um, ironically, the Japanese officers who had come to the United States to be students, including Yamamoto, uh, had a better feel for that. You know, the, right. the, that um, you couldn't uh, assume that the Americans were really going to puke out, or they, you know, would somehow be deterred from a war of nasty racial revenge. I mean, that certainly was part of the deal. Yeah, there was, a, there was a poll after Pearl Harbor. I think it was 11 percent of the American public thought the Japanese should be eliminated as a race in the, from the poll. Yeah, 11 percent, I think it was. Yeah. If you'd let Bill Halsey run occupation policy, God knows what it would look well, like. Yeah. Gentlemen to your far right in the front row, please. Um, Mr. Um, Toll, your previous answer, thank you. Um, is a segue into what I was going to say. I always assumed that FDR was uh, relieved uh, for the attack for Pearl Harbor, and I know that Churchill was certainly thrilled because he said he went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved. What if there hadn't been um, the attack? How would uh, FDR, if you'd expound what you were saying, get us in the war, and how long would Britain be able to hang on? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think we've, we've addressed that, that question a little bit in some of the previous answers, but uh, I mean, cer certainly it, it would have been an immensely difficult political problem uh, for FDR to convince the uh, uh, Congress to declare war and the American people to essentially get behind an effort that required, you know, not just going to war, but really just transforming the entire economy uh, in order to win it. And so, uh, uh, I, I, I just think it would have taken longer, and uh, the the anger and the will of the American people to go and fight and win this war would have taken longer to, to build. Uh, and um, I, I know that's not a particularly satisfactory answer, but but I think it is in, uh, a question that, that you know counterfactuals become difficult at, at this point. Um, I, I'll just since you've asked, I'll just I'll just read this quickly. Um, uh, this was uh, Robert uh, Sherwood was a, an American playwright who was brought in to the White House as a speechwriter, and he wrote a very good book about a dual biography of FDR and Harry Hopkins called Roosevelt and Hopkins. <clears throat> and after discussing this dilemma leading up to December 7th, 1941, uh, he wrote this. There was just one thing that they could do, they, the Japanese, could do to get Roosevelt completely off the horns of this dilemma 
And that is precisely what they did at one stroke in a manner so challenging, so insulting and enraging that the divided and confused American people were instantly rendered unanimous and certain. Uh, so it really is remarkable that the Japanese dis, uh, acted in a way for, for mil primarily military strategic reasons uh, that essentially at one stroke solved this, this political problem uh, in literally overnight. And, um, and of course FDR died in office, did not leave a diary. It's very often hard to, to, to uh, determine what he's thinking. Uh, but many of his aides did comment immediately after December 7th that he seemed to be relieved in a sense. I, I was just gonna add a, a, a point there too. I, we're talking a lot about you know what happens if, if we don't get into a war against the Japanese. We're not talking about what happens vis-a-vis uh, -vis Germany. I, I think almost certainly we're gonna be in a shooting war with the Germans because of some sort of escalated U-boat attack in the North Atlantic. We've already lost a destroyer. Uh, we're involved already in a de facto shooting war against the Kriegsmarine uh, at this point in time. I just, I don't see how we get out of a war against Germany at some point in the next well, uh, you know, six months. A spin-off spin question on that, if I can jump in, is what happens if Germany and Japan have a real alliance and really work together? I mean, you've got You've got American Lend-Lease stuff going right by the northern tip of Japan into Vladivostok, and the Japanese don't touch any of it. Yeah. What happens if they have a if the Germans and the Japanese actually work together? The the problem for the for the Germans and the Japanese in terms of coordinating their strategies is that uh, the timing of of their respective windows of opportunity really don't line up very well in 1942. Um, and two, the, the assets that they had available to them, Japan is primarily uh, a maritime power. The Germans are, are, of course, completely focused on what's going on in, in Russia. So it's, it's really difficult uh, to see how they were going to effectively coordinate those assets. And the only reasonable theater seems to be, you know, somewhere in the Mideast, some kind of a link up. Um, in, you know, Mesopotamia or something like that. But it's, it's really difficult to see how the Germans are going to be able to, you know, drive through the Caucasus. They tried that, and it didn't work out real well. So I, I just don't, the coordination issues, I think, are a real hindrance, even if they had a better intent to do it. And the uh, follow-up to that was on Great Britain. How long do they hold out if the United States is not involved? I feel like Great Britain's in a very stable position, actually, that they're, they were already beginning to win uh, the war against the U-boats, and uh, I don't see them as, as being a candidate for any sort of an effective invasion by the Germans. Yeah, and that's, and that's especially true while the war on the Eastern Front is continuing. So, um, you know, the, the, the real test for Britain was in 1940. They'd already passed it. Agreed. Um, the next yeah. question in the center here towards the front. Good afternoon. Um, I've attended every conference that we've had here at the museum, and I gotta tell you, this is um, the best panel we've ever had because we've always wanted to ask the what if question, and we have <laughs> consistently been told that's counterfactual and we shouldn't talk. To hear you all up there asking yourselves questions like what ifs is really heartening to the to the historian geek in me. Jeremy, take this down. <coughs> well, I'm, program. I'm, Nothing I'm but actually, counterfactuals. I'm gonna suggest to Jeremy and Stephen that we have an entire conference on <laughs> what ifs, <laughs> and we just line up every historian up here, and we let you go at it in the morning and the weekend. And I'll the be afternoon. washing my hair that day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. no, you could just, well, you, well, you could just show uh, time. you could just show the man in the high castle up on the big screen. <laughs> so anyway, my, I've wanted to ask this question for years. Max Hastings, the distinguished um, historian, he, he's very big on um, the idea that in Europe, and I'm going to make this about Pearl Harbor in a second here, but about <laughs> Europe that the Russians really won the majority of that war, which I always thought, well, we landed in Normandy on the 6th and Saipan on the 16th, two, two um, fleets that were able to land troops uh, in halfway around the world. So I've always thought if we weren't fighting the Japanese and we would have applied all of our resources to Europe, 
how quickly that outcome would have happened. And so that you can answer this question in the genre, here's, here's the way I'm gonna ask the question is, what happens if the Germans attack Pearl Harbor? <laughs> <laughs> We've officially well, jumped the shark. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, 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 you got it. One of, the, one of the things you have to do when you do counterfactual analysis is to figure out what counts and what doesn't. Or, you know, to think about the relative likely influence of events and their connectedness. Um, the Hastings argument is quite common by people who want to denigrate the American contribution to World War II. The United States is the only belligerent that plays a major role in defeating all three Axis powers, period. Now, it's the body count school that argues that, you know, it's really the Russians who won the war. The Russians killed a lot of Germans. No doubt about it, no question. A lot of Russians died, you know, the question then is, was it really worth it? But figuring out why the war turned out the way it did is more than doing a body count. And then you have to take a look at the home front industrial production, you have to look at food, you have to look at morale. I mean, there are all kinds of factors that, that begin to explain why one side in the long run did better than the others. Does, does Max consider the fact that societies that made the greatest use of women in service and war work tended to win, and those that were gender insensitive didn't do so well? I don't think so, you know. I mean, the, the process of being a historian is to try to be as inclusive as possible and to figure out what really counts and what doesn't in a relative sense. And anybody that grabs hold of one kind of factor and beats it to death is, I think, um, whether they realize it or not, intellectually dishonest and shouldn't be taken seriously. I, I, and I, I know I, Max, I think he's a good historian. He still suffers angst from being kicked out of the parachute regiment when he was a kid. Uh, <laughs> you know, we all have little stories, uh, but uh, uh, you know, people do develop uh, biases and everything else. John McManus knows that I know that the Army participated in the war against Japan, but of course six Marine divisions won the war. So <laughs> minor help from the Navy and, you know, you have to sort of figure out what, you know, is moving people to take certain kinds of positions and, and judge, judge the evidence. I mean, an event that we sometimes miss that happens, I think it's the day before Pearl Harbor is when, is when FDR directs the building of the atomic bomb program. He directs the atomic bomb. I think it's the 6th December is when a directive goes out for the atomic bomb programs. I was just going to say, um, if, if we end up in a conflict where we're only fighting the Germans, though, we've made some bad decisions. You know, at, at that point, you can look back at the two ocean Navy bill and say, well, that's a waste. I don't need aircraft carriers to fight the Germans. Um, what am I going to do with that scale of a Navy in a war that now is oriented primarily towards air power and ground power? Um, I would look at my Army force structure and I would say 100 divisions? Man, I need more like 250. If you're going to play with the big boys, you know, they're deploying hundreds of divisions on the Eastern Front. We certainly have the capability of helping to get the war over much more quickly, but it's going to require us to retool our approach to strategy and to force structure to better configure our forces to fight the new war that we would end up fighting, which would be much less reliant on naval power, in my opinion. Yeah, the, the victory program, which was you know, a war department exercises, mm -hmm. exercise exposed, released in the summer of 1941, had a force structure of over 200 divisions, 60 of which were to be motorized. How were we going to motorize 60 divisions? And where were they going to fight? Texas? Arizona? Yeah. I mean, you know. Gentleman to your right with Connie, please. Um, so what if FDR hadn't run for a third term? How do you think that would have changed things? Hmm. It's an interesting question. That's a great question. question. Who would it have been? A great question that I can't answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, uh, you know, you, 
the next question is then who who does win? Who's the president? Wilkie. Uh, is, it, is it Wilkie? <clears throat> um, you know, Wilkie uh, seemed to have the soul of an internationalist, even though he ran on largely an isolationist platform in uh, 1940. So, uh, I, you know, I think this is one of these questions where all of the critics of counterfactual speculation seem to have a point. I think it's hard. It's hard to speculate in that, uh, in that situation. If you had a real diehard isolationist elected in 1940, then yeah, I, I do think uh, that, uh, you know, attack on Pearl Harbor, naturally that isolationist president is gonna change his stripes very quickly. We are gonna declare war. But are we gonna mobilize with the same kind of energy uh, that we did? Maybe not. And so a longer war then is the scenario, a longer war in which we have more of a half-hearted kind of start to it, uh, which limits our ability to kind of mobilize as energetically with the sense of united purpose that we had. Uh, and, uh, and maybe that leads to a, a longer war, which we still win in the end. Gentlemen in the center aisle here, please. Uh, here's the setup. The Japanese pull their million troops out of China. They attack Pearl Harbor. Then they immediately build a ring of defensive positions around Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, maybe Iwo Jima and Okinawa, maybe even the Marianas. They immediately go on to defensive and make the U.S. come after it. Could the Japanese have inflicted so much pain and so much casualties on the U.S. that one, we might have, FDR or his successor might have invited those fun-loving Ruskies to invade the northern Japan, or two, they, that the U.S. would have had to build more nuclear bombs and just drop maybe 10 or 15 nukes on Japan just to get the war over. Really tough to say. You know, one of the problems, of course, with counterfactuals is you're dropping a pebble in the water. And as the, as the, the ripples of time get further and further out from the event, it's, it's like the Battle of Midway. You know, I, I feel safe in prognosticating a day or two after the historical battle, but we're now projecting five years in the future what's going on after this non-event happens. That's really, really tough. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I mean, could, yeah, could, could, could the, ja the Japanese just, there's no way they were going to pull out of China. There's just too much, they're just locked in there. Too yeah, much. I mean, if they pulled out of China, then, then we would have been like, thank you, you've pulled out of China, so I guess we don't need to embargo the oil anymore, and here you go, and the taps are on again, and everybody's happy, right? I mean, that's, that's what one potential scenario. The other thing I would say, though, is this whole business of we're going to build a, a string of defenses around our new empire neglects the fact that the Pacific is nothing but ocean. You know, you can put a lot of airplanes on a place like Wake, but not that many because it's the size of a postage stamp. And so the, the Japanese never really had the ability to erect a series of defenses that would have been sufficient to beat off an American attack, I don't think, at least not in the long term. That said, I'll go, and, and this is something that Rich Frank and I have talked about on some occasions, you know, I said very glibly in my presentation that as long as the Americans maintain the political will to be in this war that we're going to win, I actually think there's a danger point towards the end of the war when we're, we're tired of the kind of combat that we're running into in places like Okinawa and so forth, that it's arguable that if we had gone into Japan and pulled an invasion that had resulted in very, very heavy casualties in Japan, that we might have been inclined to uh, negotiate. I don't know. JCS thought, JCS feared that. There's a, uh, yes. Casey Brower's book talks about the, the JCS fears that the American public was losing will in 45. It, yeah. You know, they're not helping out in the, with the, the ships are coming back from the kamikaze raids. Right. They can't get people yeah. up to fix them. And that people are, the people are trying to change back the civilians, you know, the yeah. industrialists are trying to go back to building civilian goods. We demobilize and, a lot yeah, the of fifth bond drive here. doesn't go well. So there is a sense that JCS feels that that's one of the reasons they push for stronger actions against Japan is they're afraid the American public just is losing the will to, to last much longer. One of the things that, that we overlook sometimes is the American servicemen who were being killed at the end of the war were younger than the ones who were casualties earlier mm -hmm. in the war. And we were going into the 
the teenage casualty uh, environment, which was a serious morale problem. Well, you'll notice the program says 415, but we sort of built that in as cushion because we knew this would have a lot of questions. The next one's going to be to your left with Connie, and we'll get a couple more in. Do we get overtime, Jeremy? <laughs> Just ask. Here, you want some more free? I agree. You should. <laughs> Here's one that uh, may be a little easier for you. If Enterprise makes her scheduled arrival into Pearl Harbor and is, in fact, burned to the waterline, what implications are there for the Doolittle Raid and possibly later Coral Sea and Midway? Yeah, I think Ian actually already touched on that pretty well. I, I think you see, you know, not a lot of carrier raids going on around the, the periphery. I think uh, it's pretty hard to anticipate Doolittle yep. uh, coming off. One carrier, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think the overall effect they is... They no air cover. They've got just the B-25s on, on one flight deck, right? Yeah. And no, and no air cover. I don't no see air cover. Do, I don't see them trying it. No. no. I, I think what that does is it, it puts us into more of a defensive stance than, than we were. Um, in, we were on the defensive in, in 1942, but, but people like Nimitz were constantly looking for opportunities to act aggressively to turn around this train wreck of a war. Um, but if we've lost one or two carriers already at the outset, that, that means that we have to be a lot more careful about how we're going to risk those assets. To your right, halfway back, gentlemen. What would be the possibility if the U.S. fleet had stayed in San Diego? What would have been the willingness, capabilities, and desire of Japan to attack the west coast of the United States? They did not have the logistical capability, I think, to reach that far. Um, it was actually a real surprise to me in the last few years. One of the things that I got wrong um, in Shattered Sword was sort of um, poo-pooing uh, Japanese underway replenishment capabilities. And actually, there was a really interesting article that came out a few years ago by a gentleman named uh, David Fuque at uh, the Naval War College that illustrated that, in fact, the Japanese had much better underway refueling capabilities than, than I was aware of at the time. That said, I just don't think that they have the reach to go all the way to the West Coast, um, despite all the, the panic mongering that occurred, you know, in the next few months. Um, and certainly from what I read from the Japanese perspective, I mean, they never had any intention of, of doing anything of the sort. That, that really would have put the fleet kind of off the, off the map at that point. Yeah. To your I, Please go. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to agree with, with what John said, so maybe, I, maybe it's not that useful. But, you know, just as a, as a kind of a, a reality check, look at the fleets that we assembled uh, to take Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the Philippines, look at the size of those fleets. And you realize that if the Japanese had those kinds of fleets, not just the Navy, but the, the uh, troop transports and the logistics capability, the, all, everything it took to push a fleet across the Pacific and land significant amount of ground force on a hostile shore, even if they had had that, once they landed their troops, they'd be on a continent. Uh, fighting against uh, all of the forces that we could muster to meet that beachhead on a continent. So um, the scenario of the Japanese um, invading the west coast of North America was never feasible. It was never remotely feasible uh, that uh, they could mount a successful invasion on the continent. Yeah, I think, I think you can think of Kitabutai was a pure raiding force. It could project power in distinct pulses over a very short time schedule, but it never had the ability to actually sustain itself in the field, unlike the carrier forces that we brought to the party in mid-1944, which not only are going to come smash your island bastion, but then we're going to park off of here for however long it takes to reduce that bastion through a physical invasion as well. The Japanese never had that capability, not even in their, their wildest dreams. Yeah, so no, no Red Dawn scenario in 1941? Yeah. No. <laughs> Patrick Swayze coming ashore? Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Last question is going to be to your far left. Halfway back, please. Given that the United States would develop the atomic bomb when it did and it would become available, 
If we extended that war, or if the war was extended with Japan for another two to three years, how do you think the atomic capability would have played in? I've got the numbers on that. that, I, I, that we're, we're developing, probably would have had about 15 bombs by then, but by then you would have had millions of Japanese dead from starvation. We were going to destroy the right, in January of 46, we were going to start putting chemicals to destroy their rice crop. Yep. We we're going to use poison gas on the beaches. I mean, it would have been, my God, Japan would have been destroyed. Yeah, and just did the conventional bombing, the size of the conventional bombing campaign, the, uh, you know, just how quickly that was growing at the end of the war in August. I think the estimate was that if the war had continued by January 1946, in that month, we would have dropped more bomb ton tonnage on Japan than we actually did drop on Japan in the entire war. The other thing I'd say in that uh, respect is that we often lose sight of what was going on throughout the rest of Asia, that if the war had uh, prolonged, you would have seen whatever the Japanese body count would have been, it would have probably been 3x or 4x larger in the occupied areas in China, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Um, there, it, that would have been a, a tremendous humanitarian tragedy. Uh, tens of millions more people killed, not just in Japan. Well, the Japanese believe that they would have disappeared as a people and a culture, mm -hmm. that um, there would have been famine, illness, that the Russians would have invaded or continued to invade the home islands, um, that there would be untold catastrophe, which would... And, and a, po a post-war political situation that might have looked very much like Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it goes back to, I've told this story here before, I, I gave a presentation about the firebombing of Tokyo in Tokyo, and at the end of the presentation, uh, the senior Japanese historian got up and said, in the end, we must thank you Americans for the firebombing and the atomic bombs because you made us surrender in August, right? and therefore that avoided the Soviet invasion of Hokkaido in September, and it prevented 10 million Japanese from starving to death in the winter because MacArthur had time to get food in to feed us. So there's all kinds, it, we, every month, you, you, yeah. get, you play these counterfactual games. We've started out early with it. Every month of delay changes something else, and the ripples could have had massive implications for the history of the world. Yeah, and the common denominator would have been a, a, a lot of civilian bodies. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is a great way to wrap up our Pearl Harbor pre-conference symposium. Thank you all for your questions. Thanks to John, Ian, Khan, and the 2004 recipient of the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize, Alan Millett. Uh, we are now going to uh, ask you all to exit the ballroom so that we can go enjoy the book signing and the reception that will officially kick off the 14th International Conference on World War II proper. So thank you for a great day. You can leave your stuff here. The setup will be the same for the rest of the weekend. But uh, have a great reception, and we'll be back in the ballroom for the 6 o'clock presentation. Thank you. Get behind the bar. Show, show. Okay.
knowledge because it was, I had locked it on, you had it so on all the it, time. it wouldn't. Uh, right. Yeah, somebody wouldn't start talking and it was off.
Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way into the Arcadia Ballroom. Thank you. <laughs>
get 30 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can ask you to please find your seats. Thank you very much. All right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Stephen Watson. For those of you I have not yet met, I have the privilege of being the president and CEO here at the National World War II Museum. And when I say it feels good to say welcome to our 14th International Conference on World War II, I mean it. So I know all of you are glad to be here, too. I think you all can do a little bit better than that. So uh, it feels good to be back for our 14th International Conference on World War II. Um, I think we all needed this, right? I know I did. So it's really our, our pleasure to see you all here in the Madeline and Paul Hilliard Conference Center here at the Higgins Hotel. And it's been great to visit with old friends today, uh, meet some new folks that are here for the first time um, as attendees at the conference. Um, also, uh, pleased to welcome our viewers that are joining us online tonight and those that are watching on C-SPAN. Uh, we appreciate your interest and support in keeping the story of World War II alive. We have already, I think, had a fantastic day today. I know about half of you participated in our Pearl Harbor at 80 Symposium, and I would just like to take a moment to recognize and thank all of today's speakers for what I think was just a tremendous start to this year's program. So please stand and be recognized. The next segment is uh, partially the Paul Hilliard exercise segment. This is when we ask our World War II veterans home front workers, and Holocaust survivors to stand and be recognized for your service. And of course, Mr. Hilliard, thank you, sir. I know just about everybody here has had a chance to meet Paul, but if you don't know, um, Paul is a longtime museum trustee, former chairman, was actually the chairman of the board of our museum when COVID uh, set in last spring, and when I tell you we could not have had a wiser, uh, 
and better leader to see our museum through one of our most difficult times. I, I mean that sincerely. Um, he's also a temporarily unassigned Marine looking for employment. Um, so he's even got a sticker on the back of his car to prove that. But Paul has attended every single one of our international World War II conferences. And if I, my memory serves me correctly, I think even some of the early events that took place in the Eisenhower Center back in the 1980s and 90s. So he has been a part of our museum and our family for a long time. And of course, we thank him and his wife Madeline for sponsoring this beautiful conference center that we have here at the Higgins that allows us not only to put on this event, but student programs, teacher programs, and a really uh, what will happen in the future, even more conferences and symposia. So thank you, Paul. I'd also, of course, like to thank all veterans and active military for your service to our country. And please also stand in so we can appreciate your service. Thank you. We also have uh, several of our current and past trustees of the museum here. Uh, Mike Bylan, I'm glad that you and Con Crane have finally finished your what if session. I think it just wrapped up a couple of minutes ago, but thank you. Mike also has attended, I think, all 14 of these International World War II conferences. Bob Hayes, thank you, sir. Deborah Lindsay, um, Robert Lupo and his wife Mary, and uh, early trustee Jack Weiss. Uh, this museum is the museum that it is thanks to the leadership and the commitment of our trustees. So I thank you all sincerely. <laughs> Bear with me here. I've got a few more folks that I need to thank. That's my job at these conferences. A um, few other people that I think really uh, we need to take a moment and recognize. And first, I want to recognize my predecessor, Nick Mueller, um, now our founding president and CEO emeritus. Um, it was Nick, along with a small group of key advisors, and I'll, I'll recognize those in a moment, that formed the idea for this international conference. And as I reflected on that today, I think one of my memories of our first conference was it was sort of, uh, in a way, the rebirth of our museum after Hurricane Katrina, when we had our first international conference in 2006. We had come off the back of a really tough period for the museum. I, I would say it wasn't an exaggeration to say that the, the expansion and the future of what is now the World War II Museum really hung in the balance. But in spite of all of that, uh, under Nick's leadership um, and his perseverance and determination, uh, he believed in this conference. Um, and I would say that as we stand here today, you know, almost 16 years later, that it feels very similar that the 14th International Conference on World War II, I think, in a way, feels like an important part of the rebirth of our museum coming off of what has been a difficult two years. But Nick, thank you for all you have done, not only to help create and nurture this wonderful conference, but uh, we would not be here today not for your leadership. So thank you. <laughs> And uh, alongside Nick on this journey uh, for many of these conferences has been a great group of advisors, our conference planning committee. Um, some of them you've already met today and many of them you will meet over the next couple of days. And I want to recognize each of them by name. Dr. John Morrow, who gave a great presentation this afternoon and you'll hear again from over the next couple of days. Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, Rick Atkinson, Dr. Gunter Bischoff, who I see in the back there. Dr. Con Crane, Rich Frank, Dr. Don Miller, Alan Millett, Dr. Rob Satino, our very own Samuel Zamuri Stone senior historian whose title now fits onto a business card as opposed to a placard, as you heard this morning. Um, and last, but certainly not least, a gentleman who is unfortunately not with us this year at the conference, uh, as Rob said this morning, the Dean of World War II historians, Dr. Gerhard Weinberg. So let's give all of them a round of applause for their work. And a, another very 
tough casualty of, of COVID has been the only thing that our conference planning committee have asked for over these years is that we feed them a good New Orleans meal as part of their service to the museum. And uh, Jeremy, you've got some makeup to do because a Zoom meeting to help prepare for this year was, I think, sorely inadequate. So we'll have to do something really special to make up for that. Um, of course, want to thank all of our speakers. You know, this conference, I think, is great because of our speakers, our attendees, um, and speaking with several of our speakers today. And I think you heard it from Dr. Morrow earlier. Um, being here for many people is the first time that they have gotten on a plane and traveled in the last two years. And I think that shows their commitment and interest in this event and helping us keep this conference going. So I want to thank all of our speakers for your support and your participation. Okay, and I think if you are a regular here, you know that this conference simply would not be possible without the support of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, which is now in its 10th year as the presenting sponsor of our International World War II Conference. Their longtime commitment to this program has made it what it is today. It's helped us secure our speakers. It's helped us really enhance the on-site experience for you, our participants. And in the last several years, it's really helped us tremendously grow our virtual audiences. Our virtual audiences for some of these sessions now can be as much as two and a half, three thousand 3,000 viewers at any one time. And in addition to their sponsorship of this uh, signature event, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, led by Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, has provided critical support to many museum initiatives, most noteworthy, the digitization and access to our more than 10,000 personal accounts, our, our World War II oral histories, which are the most precious assets that we have here at the museum. So they are true partners in every sense of the word, and uh, we are just very grateful for their support. We have two great members of their team here with us today. I want to recognize them briefly. Uh, Karima Cruz, a program manager at the foundation who has been working with us for many, many years, and this is her first trip to the museum. So welcome, Karima, and thank you for all of your support. And the gentleman you'll hear from in just a moment, Roberto Bravo, the senior director of the museum and library. Thank you for being here today as well, Roberto. So with that, I will turn it over to Roberto to make a few remarks. Thank you. Um, before my scripted remarks here, I just want to uh, make note that it is a great feeling to be in a room full of people with a like-minded goal and interest. Um, I remember saying in a meeting with my staff at some point that I remember the days pre-pandemic when we were happy and we didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> and it's great to reclaim that happiness. Um, as you know, my name is Roberto Bravo. I'm the senior director of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and I'm here with my colleague, Karima Cruz, from the foundation. And I'm delighted to be with you here tonight in celebration of the 14th International Conference on World War II. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library, through the Pritzker Military Foundation, has been a proud partner of this conference for many years, as well as a number of other projects with the National World War II Museum, as Stephen just uh, pointed out. In the last year um, of all years, the museum and library has expanded its mission to better, repre better represent our work, activities, and the vision of our founder, Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, to increase the public understanding of military history, military affairs, and national security by providing a forum for the study and exploration of our military's past, present, and future. With this more encompassing direction, we're building new relationships and reaching those who may not have previously known about the stories, sacrifices, and values of our citizen soldiers. 
We're happy to partner with exceptional institutions to further the understanding about those who continue to apply the lessons of service to better civilian life, preserve democracy, and safeguard our nation. Earlier this year, some of you will remember receiving a copy of our latest publication, Drawing Fire, the editorial cartoons of Bill Malden. This was the first part of a multifaceted project surrounding two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning political and military cartoonist Bill Malden, focused on explaining his work and story to those that did not already know the, the impact of his cartoons on our nation. In May of 2021, we launched the exhibition Drawn to Combat, Bill Malden on the Art of War. This retrospective of Bill Malden's provocative work about our nation's time of war, civil rights, and social justice has been our most visited and successful exhibit to date. It exposed a diverse audience to military history from a new and fresh perspective. Next month, we're excited to offer the exhibit nationally through our first virtual tour. And looking ahead to spring 2022, we invite everyone here and virtually to visit us for our new exhibit focusing on prisoners of war. In addition to those projects, we've begun working on our expansion to Summers, Wisconsin, just about a north from our building in downtown Chicago. We've broken ground on a state-of-the-art museum archives facility. Although the facility won't be complete until 2023, with this expansion, we'll not only be able to better care, store, and catalog our collection, but it will also afford us the opportunity to move our library to the new facility, opening an entire extra floor in downtown Chicago for our museum space. With this extra space, we're excited to start making strides on our education initiative through offering virtual classrooms, as well as continuing to provide great visitor experience with our engaging exhibitions and works with citizen soldiers. This project also includes a Cold War Veterans Memorial, sponsored by the Museum and Library, which is currently in its second phase of an international architectural design competition. Now, we have four finalists from Milan, Italy, Amman, Jordan, Kyoto, Japan, and Los Angeles, California. This has been an exciting endeavor. Please keep an eye for the selected design of this competition to be announced in March 2022. In the meantime, I encourage you to visit our website to see the four finalists. There is a lot to look forward at the museum and library as we grow, expand, and reach our new audiences next year. We're bringing on new staff to help capitalize on the new mission and the activities that come along, like a chief military historian just appointed today, and associate director of education. But most importantly, new leadership that will help our organization ride smoothly in this new direction. The museum and library is proud to sit at the heart of a network of like-minded organizations and fellow travelers, travelers in the field of military history. We are pleased to join with the National World War II Museum to tell the story of the World War II, ensuring that scholarly research on the Second World War has a platform and audience for study and debate. When an understanding of the military and military events is needed, whether to reflect on what has happened what is happening or what might happen, it will be to the dedicated scholars and organizations included today that people will inevitably turn. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy all the wonderful things that we're going to, about to experience through this conference. Good night. Well, thank you, Roberto. It's wonderful to hear all the progress that you're making, not only in downtown Chicago, but in Wisconsin. And uh, please send our deepest gratitude to Colonel Pritzker, to Susan Rifkin, and all of our friends in Chicago. Um, and if you have not had a chance to visit the with TV miniseries, we can all hope to, to get the TV miniseries rights on this. His latest book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, was published this past May. He's also an award-winning filmmaker, having won an International Emmy for his PBS series, The Ascent of Money. Some of his other prizes include the 2010 Benjamin Franklin Prize for Public Service, 
the 2012 Hayek Prize for Lifetime Achievement, the Estro Global Issues Distinguished Book Prize, and the, uh, and the Ludwig Erhardt Prize for Economic Journalism. He writes a syndicated weekly column. You can find that in the London Times and the Boston Globe, um, particularly if you don't speak German. Uh, his other scholarly affiliations include serving as a trustee for both the New York Historical Society and the London-based Center for Policy Studies. And Dr. Ferguson's an accomplished biographer as well. Uh, he's published The High Financier, The Life and Times of Sigmund Warburg in 2010. But he's currently writing a second volume of his biography on Henry Kissinger. The first volume, some of you may know, published in 2015, won the 2016 Council on Foreign Relations Arthur Ross Book Award. So we look forward to that next volume. Now, as, as such, uh, from this bio, uh, I'm, I, I'm sure you join me knowing that Dr. Ferguson's eminently qualified to deliver this keynote address tonight as part of the George P. Schultz Forum on World Affairs, speaking on the lessons of World War II for the 2020s. With that, please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Neil Ferguson. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Bell. It's a great pleasure to be here. I only just made it. Uh, flying via Dallas-Fort Worth is always a little akin to Russian roulette. <laughs> I was really delighted to hear the name of my old and dearly missed friend and mentor, George Schultz who never tired of reminding me and other younger Hoover fellows that never having served in the Marine Corps, we were doomed forever to the lowly status of raw recruits at best and at worst rejects who'd failed the medical. <laughs> I want to begin with a quotation from a great man of an earlier generation. The multitudes remained plunged in ignorance, and their leaders seeking their votes did not dare to undeceive them. So wrote Winston Churchill of the victors of World War I in The Gathering Storm. Churchill bitterly recalled, and I quote again, a refusal to face unpleasant facts, desire for popularity and electoral success, irrespective of the vital interests of the state. An American audience may find at least some of Churchill's critique of interwar Britain uncomfortably familiar. Britain's state of mind was the product of a combination of national exhaustion and imperial overstretch, to borrow a phrase from my old friend at Yale, Paul Kennedy. Since 1914, the nation had endured war, financial crisis, and in 1918 to 19, a terrible pandemic, the Spanish influenza. The economic landscape was overshadowed by a mountain of debt. Though the country remained the issuer of the dominant global currency, it was no longer unrivaled in that role. A highly unequal society inspired politicians on the left to demand redistribution, if not outright socialism. A significant proportion of the intelligentsia went further, embracing the extremes of either communism or fascism. Meanwhile, the established political class preferred to ignore a deteriorating international situation. Britain's global dominance was menaced in Europe, in Asia, and in the Middle East, the system of collective security was crumbling, leaving only the possibility of alliances to supplement thinly spread imperial resources. The result, as you all know, was a disastrous failure to acknowledge the scale of the totalitarian threat and to amass the means 
to deter the dictators. In the end, after the years of procrastination that we call appeasement, Britain had to fight. Victory came at a terrible price in lives and treasure. The war ended Britain's primacy in the world. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask a sobering question. Can Britain's experience in the mid-20th century help us understand the future of American power? My fellow Americans, I've noticed, and you'll forgive me for speaking as an immigrant from the old country, that you prefer to draw lessons from the history of the United States rather than from anyone else's history. But it may be more illuminating to compare the country to its predecessor as an Anglophone global hegemon. For I believe America today does, in many ways, resemble Great Britain in the interwar period. Now, like all of these sort of historical analogies, this isn't perfect. The vast amalgam of colonies and other dependencies that Britain ruled over in the 1930s has no real American counterpart today. And this allows Americans to reassure themselves that they don't have an empire, even after withdrawing their soldiers and civilians from Afghanistan after a 20-year presence. Despite its strikingly high COVID-19 mortality, of course, America is not recovering from the kind of trauma that Britain experienced in World War I, when huge numbers of young men were slaughtered. Nearly 900,000 died. 6% of males aged 15 to 49, to say nothing of 1.7 million wounded. Nor, it's true, is America facing as clear and present a threat as Nazi Germany posed to Britain after certainly 1936. Or so we're told by scholars such as Joseph Nye at Harvard or Arna Westad at Yale. Even the idea that we face a Cold War with China, Joe Nye has recently called, and I quote, a bad idea, bad on history, bad on politics, bad for our future. The Cold War metaphor, although convenient, is lazy and potentially dangerous, which is a little bit of a slap down for me as I've been using it for the last three years. <laughs> Still, the resemblances between America today and Great Britain a century ago are striking, and I think they go beyond the failure of both countries to impose order on Afghanistan. It is clear, I came across this quotation in The Economist from February 1930, after premature uh, modernizing efforts had triggered a revolt. It is clear, The Economist wrote, that Afghanistan will have none of the West. Plus ça change. It's not just that China's ambition to end Taiwan's de facto autonomy and democracy pose a threat to the stability of the Indo-Pacific region. In the short run, I think I'm more concerned by the escalation the Russian government appears to be contemplating in Ukraine. And nor should we forget the very real danger of a nuclear arms race in the volatile Middle East. Of course, so many books and articles predicting American decline have been written over decades. The declinism itself has become a cliché. But Britain's experience between the 1930s and the 1950s is a reminder, I think, that there are worse fates than gentle, gradual decline. Let's start with the mountains of debt. Britain's public debt after the First World War rose from 109% of GDP in 1918 to just under 200% in 1920. 
1934. Now, America's federal debt is different in important ways, but it is comparable in magnitude. It will reach nearly 110% of GDP this year, even higher than its previous peak in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And the Congressional Budget Office estimates that on present trends, it could exceed 200% by 2051. Now, an important difference between the United States today and the United Kingdom roughly a century ago is that the average maturity of American federal debt is quite short, 65 months, whereas more than 40% of the British national debt took the form of perpetual bonds or annuities. And that's, this means that American debt today is a great deal more sensitive to any upward moves in interest rates than Britain's was. Another key difference is the great shift that has been in fiscal and monetary theories, thanks in large measure to John Maynard Keynes's critique of Britain's interwar policies. Britain's decision in 1925 to return sterling to the gold standard at the overvalued pre-war price condemned Britain to eight years of deflation. The increased power of trade unions meant that wage cuts lagged behind price cuts during the Depression, and this contributed to job losses. At the nadir in 1932, the unemployment rate was 15%. Yet Britain's depression was mild, not least because abandoning the gold standard in 1931 allowed the easing of monetary policy. Falling real interest rates meant a decline in the burden of debt service, creating new fiscal room for maneuver in the 1930s. Such a reduction in debt servicing costs seems unlikely for America in the coming years. A few economists, notably the former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, correctly predicted the inflationary risks of the current fiscal and monetary policies, where British real interest rates generally declined in the 1930s. In America, they're projected to turn positive, perhaps from 2027, and to rise steadily to hit 2.5% in the coming decades. Now this brings us to the crux of the matter. You military historians, and I guess a majority of you would consider yourselves military historians, are by and large not terribly interested in financial history. But financial history is interested in you. Churchill's great preoccupation in the 1930s, remember, was that the British government was procrastinating. That was the underlying rationale of appeasement, which was not a naive policy, rather than energetically rearming in response to the increasingly aggressive behavior of Hitler, Mussolini, and the militarist government of Imperial Japan. A key argument of the appeasers was that fiscal and economic constraints, not least the high cost of running an empire that extended from Fiji to Gambia to Guyana to Vancouver, made more rapid rearmament impossible. It may seem fanciful to suggest that the United States today faces comparable threats, not only from China, but also from Russia, Iran, and let's not forget North Korea. Yet the mere fact that it seems fanciful illustrates the point. The majority of Americans today, just like the majority of Britons between the wars, simply do not want to contemplate the possibility of a major war against one or more authoritarian regimes coming on top of the country's already extensive military commitments. And that's why the projected decline of American defense spending as a share of GDP from 3.4% last year to 2.5% by 2031 will cause consternation only to Churchillian types. And those Churchillian types can expect exactly the same hostile reception, the same accusations of warmongering 
that Winston Churchill had to endure in the 1930s. A relative decline compared with other countries is another point of resemblance. According to estimates by the late economic historian Angus Madison, the British economy by the 1930s had been overtaken in terms of output, not only by Americas as early as 1872, but also by Germany's in 1898, and again after the disastrous years of World War I, of hyperinflation and slump, again in 1935, and Britain had also been overtaken by the Soviet Union in 1930. Now, it's true that the British Empire as a whole had a bigger economy than the United Kingdom, especially if you include the dominions, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, perhaps twice as large. But the American economy was even larger, and it remained more than double the size of Britain's despite the very much more severe impact of the Great Depression on the United States. Fast forward again to today. The United States today has exactly the same problem of relative decline in economic terms. On the basis of purchasing power parity, which just allows for the fact that stuff is cheaper uh, in the Chinese domestic market than it is in the US, the gross domestic product of China caught up with and overtook that of the United States in 2014. On a current dollar basis, the American economy is still bigger, but the gap is projected to narrow. This year, China's current dollar GDP will be around 75% of America's. By 2026, it will be 89%. It's no secret, ladies and gentlemen, that China poses a bigger economic challenge than the Soviet Union once did, as the latter's economy was never more than 44% the size of America's during what I'm going to call Cold War I. Nor is it classified information that China is seeking to catch up with America in many technological domains with national security applications, from artificial intelligence to quantum computing. And the ambitions of China's leader, Xi Jinping, are also well known, along with his renewal of the Chinese Communist Party's ideological hostility to individual freedom, the rule of law, and democracy. Now, American sentiment towards the Chinese government has markedly soured in the past five years. But that doesn't seem to be translating into public interest in actively countering the Chinese military threat. There's some recent polling by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs suggests I could be wrong. I suspect that if Beijing invades Taiwan, perhaps as early as in 2023, many Americans, perhaps even most Americans, will be tempted to echo the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who notoriously described the German bid to carve up Czechoslovakia in 1938 as a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. And now we get to a really, really painful comparison. A crucial source of British weakness between the wars was the revolt of the intelligentsia against the empire and more generally against traditional British values. Churchill recalled with disgust in the gathering storm the famous Oxford Union debate in 1933 that had carried, voted for the motion, this house refuses to fight for king and country. As Churchill noted, and I quote, it was easy to laugh off such an episode in England, but in Germany, in Russia, 
in Italy, in Japan, the idea of a decadent, degenerate Britain took deep root and swayed many calculations. I always want to do those quotes in Churchill's voice because they do sound much better. Take deep root and swayed many calculations. <laughs> There's more later. I might, not be, I might not be able to resist the temptation, especially with this great acoustic. It's like being in the House of Commons in 1938. But this, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely how China's new breed of wolf warrior diplomat, diplomats and nationalist intellectuals regard the United States today. In the 1930s, Nazis, fascists, communists alike, all had good reason to think that the British were succumbing to a kind of self-hatred. I did not even know that the British Empire was dying. George Orwell wrote of his time as a colonial policeman in his essay, Shooting an Elephant. That was based on his experiences in Burma. Uh, and one reason that I accepted this invitation and wanted very much to come here was that it was in Burma that my grandfather, Tom Hamilton, served in World War II in the Royal Air Force. And I want to just honor his memory now, please. <laughs> No one had a bigger influence on me when I was growing up. Nothing impressed upon me more the importance of historical study. And my grandfather's recollections of his experiences in Burma and in India, the photograph albums that showed him an almost skeletal figure at the end of the Burma campaign, and the stories that he would tell me of how narrowly he had missed the fall of Singapore He'd been on a troop ship that was destined for Singapore and was still on board the ship when Singapore fell. That shaped me more than almost anything I can think of and sent me in this direction to be a student of war for the reason that I'll come to in just a moment. Now, not many intellectuals attained Orwell's insight the Britain's empire was nevertheless, and I quote, a great deal better than the younger empires that were going to supplant it. Many, unlike Orwell, embraced Soviet communism with disastrous results for British and for American intelligence. Meanwhile, an equally shocking number of members of the British aristocratic social elite were irresistibly attracted to Hitler. And even ordinary people, readers of the Daily Express, by the 1930s were more inclined to make fun of the empire than to celebrate it or want to defend it. There was this character, Big White Carstairs, in the Beachcomber column, who was an even more absurd caricature of the British Empire than David Lowe's Colonel Blimp, with whom I'm sure you're all very familiar. Now, America's empire, and I'll call it that because I'm among friends, doesn't manifest itself the same way. No dominions, almost no colonies, no protectorates. But the perception of international dominance and the costs associated with overstretch are actually quite similar. Both left and right in America today routinely ridicule or revile the idea of an American imperial project. The American empire is falling apart, gloats Tom Engelhardt, a journalist who writes for The Nation. But on the other side of the political spectrum, the right-leaning uh, economist Tyler Cowen sardonically imagines in a recent piece, quote, what the fall of the American empire could look like. 
At the same time as Cornel West, the progressive African-American philosopher, sees, and I quote, Black Lives Matter and the fight against U.S. empire as one and the same, two pro-Trump Republicans, Ryan James Godudsky and Harlan Hill, called the pandemic, and I quote, the latest example of how the American empire has no clothes. The right still defends the traditional account of the Republic's founding as a rejection of British colonial rule against the woke left's attempts to recast American history as primarily a tale of slavery and then segregation. But few on either side of the political spectrum pine for the era of global hegemony that began in the 1940s. And let me give you a recent example which caught my eye this week. In an intervention on social media, the journalist responsible for the New York Times' 1619 project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, declared, and I quote, they, meaning the Truman administration, dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, quote, when they knew surrender was coming because they'd spent all this money developing it and to prove it was worth it. Propaganda is not history, my friend. Well, I've been unable to locate any discussion by Miss Hannah Jones of Pearl Harbor, the focus of much of your discussions here earlier today. I suppose we may as well assume that it would also be lifted from the pages of Howard Zinn's scurrilous people's history. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have to contend with these days is a willful presentation of propaganda like that as history. Many self-styled historians, some of them employed at venerable universities I could name, believe that it is their role as activists not merely to chide the people of the past, for their shortcomings, judging them according to the norms of 2021 for their sexism or racism, but also to misrepresent them in the way that she misrepresents the motivations behind the dropping of the atomic bombs. And this, of course, extends to denigrating Churchill himself. There are now conferences in the United Kingdom, held at Churchill College, in which supposed historians line up to condemn Churchill for his alleged racism. I find it contemptible. This is not the way of the true historian. Writing in 1939, on the eve of World War II, the great Oxford philosopher of history, R.G. Collingwood, made the case for the true historical method very succinctly. Allow me to quote him. True historical problems, he said, arise out of practical problems. We study history in order to see more clearly into the situation in which we're called upon to act. Hence, the plane on which ultimately all problems arise is the plane of real life. That to which they are referred for their solution is history. For Collingwood, the study of history was in essence, and I quote again, an attempt to understand the present by reconstructing its determining conditions. And this is the approach that I like to call applied history. It's the exact opposite of the approach that seems fashionable in so many history departments today. So, Britons in the 1930s had fallen out of love with their empire. I believe that they wouldn't call it an empire that most Americans today are nevertheless in a similar state of mind. They feel a kind of revulsion against the burdens 
of being a great power. But ladies and gentlemen, the lesson of World War II for the 2020s is not the one Howard Zinn wanted us to learn in his awful book. <laughs> As you know, Zinn's argument is that the United States was and is just another empire actuated by base economic motives. That's his account of Pearl Harbor. It's a response to a challenge to American predominance in the Asia-Pacific commodity markets. That's the motive for the American response to Pearl Harbor. Now, I have actually spent a large part of my career paying very close attention indeed to the economic motives that lay behind the decisions of both the aggressors and the allies in World War II. The critical point is that these economic motives were not paramount. World War II was one of the greatest disasters in all history, and by no stretch of the imagination was it a natural one. In a book that I wrote 15 years ago, The War of the World, I argued that the extraordinary violence of the mid-20th century was a very puzzling phenomenon. People in the major combatant countries were better off than ever. Per capita income, life expectancy, the rate of chronic illness, the amount of time available for leisure, all of these things had reached unprecedented levels. True, there had been population growth, the development of more lethal conventional weapons, there had been a depression, there had been the rise of extreme ideologies, but all of these things were universal. They were everywhere. Whereas the most lethal violence of the mid-20th century was very concentrated in comparatively few highly lethal locations. In particular, the rough triangle between the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, and the Balkans, and a similar Asian triangle between Manchuria, Indochina, and the Solomon Islands. In the book, I propose three variables that I think together helped explain the timing and location of mid-20th century violence. First, economic volatility. It was at times of economic volatility, when growth or prices were fluctuating very sharply, that conflict was most likely to break out. That gives us some timing. Secondly, ethnic disintegration. The worst violence happened in regions of highly mixed ethnic settlement, and it was the result of ethnic disintegration. And thirdly, empires in decline. It was when empires declined and fell that the most violence happened. The East European empires after 1917-18, the West European empires after 1941, and the Axis empires after 1944. Now, in my account, radical ideologies played their own malignant role, and so too did psychopathic dictators. But a central argument of the book was directed at the perennial opponents of empire. And my message to the perennial opponents of empire was this. Be careful what you wish for and understand, as Orwell understood, that not all empires are the same, that some, though not perfect, are a great deal better, a great deal better than others. As I said, like Britons after World War I, Americans in the 2020s have fallen out of love with the burdens of great power, and it's a fact that the Chinese have noticed and relish. And yet, the great power remains, even if we don't use the embarrassing E word. Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa. I know, by British standards, it's a pretty paltry list of possessions. But the American military presence is almost as ubiquitous as Britain's was in the interwar period. There are American armed uh, forces personnel in more than 150 countries. There are probably around 200,000 American service personnel deployed outside the borders of the continental 
USA. The acquisition of such extensive global responsibilities wasn't easy, but it's a delusion to believe that shedding them will be easier. And that's the lesson of British history to which Americans need to pay much more heed. The problem, as the debacle in Afghanistan perfectly illustrated, is that the retreat from global dominance is rarely a peaceful process. However you phrase it, announcing you're giving up on your longest war is an admission of defeat, and not only in the eyes of the Taliban. China, which shares a short stretch of its vast land border with Afghanistan, has been closely watching, and so has Russia. It's no mere coincidence, in my mind, that Russia intervened militarily in both Ukraine and Syria just months after President Obama publicly renounced global policing in a nationwide television address. Let me draw my remarks uh, to a conclusion. Churchill's argument in The Gathering Storm was not that the rise of Germany, Italy, and Japan was an unstoppable process condemning Britain to decline. On the contrary, Churchill insisted that war could have been avoided if only the Western democracies had taken more decisive action earlier in the 1930s. When Franklin Roosevelt asked him, as you all know, what the war should be called, Churchill at once replied, Does nobody have the answer? What was Churchill's term? The unnecessary war. The unnecessary war was what Churchill called World War II. Now, in just the same way today, there's nothing inexorable about China's rise, much less Russia's, while all the lesser countries aligned with them are economic basket cases, from Belarus to North Korea to Venezuela. China's population is aging even faster than anticipated. Its workforce is already shrinking. Sky-high private sector debt is weighing on its growth. It teeters on the brink of a financial crisis in its real estate sector. And its mishandling of the initial outbreak of COVID-19, mishandling is putting it politely, has greatly harmed its international standing. Notice that China also risks becoming the villain of the climate crisis as it clearly can't kick the habit of burning coal to power its industry. Did you know that 93% of the increase in global coal consumption since Greta Thunberg was born in 2003 is due to China? 93% and two-thirds of all the increase in carbon dioxide emissions. So China is not inexorably going to take the world. But it's just too easy for me to see a sequence of events unfolding that could lead to another unnecessary war, most probably beginning over Taiwan, which President Xi covets and which America is ambiguously committed to defend against invasion, a commitment that unfortunately increasingly lacks credibility as the balance of military power shifts in East Asia. In particular, the growing vulnerability of American aircraft carriers to Chinese anti-ship ballistic missiles, such as the DF-21D, is just one problem, to which, as far as I can see, the Pentagon lacks a good solution. If American deterrence fails, if China gambles on a coup de main, on an invasion, then the United States will face the grim choice between fighting a long, hard war, as Britain did in 1914 and again in 1939, or folding, as happened over Suez in 1956. Churchill said that he wrote The Gathering Storm to show, and I'll give you some Churchill now since you've been patient, <laughs> to show how the malice of the wicked was reinforced by the weakness of the virtuous, how the structure and habits of democratic states, unless they're welded into larger organisms, lack those elements of persistence and conviction, which can alone give security to humble masses 
how even in matters of self-preservation, the counsels of prudence and restraint may become the prime agents of mortal danger, how the middle course, adopted from desires for safety and a quiet life, may be found to lead direct to the bullseye of disaster. It's an amazing passage. And he ends the volume, it's really worth rereading, with one of his many, many, many pithy maxims. Facts are better than dreams. Facts are better than dreams. That's, that's my motto as an historian. American leaders, I've noticed, and many American voters in recent years, have become rather too fond of dreams from the fantasy of a benign arc of history so dear to President Obama's speechwriters, to the dark nightmare of American carnage conjured up by President Trump's. As another global storm gathers, as I believe it is, it may be time to face the fact, the fact that Churchill understood only too well the end of empire is seldom if ever, a painless process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ferguson. If there are questions, wherever they are, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. We will start to your left, sir, towards the back. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous talking in such a big group. Um, do you think part of China's um, memory of the war impacts some of what you've just been discussing as well, especially our complicated help but not help only when it was good for us sort of relationship and does that carry over into the modern politics of this it matters a huge amount i don't know if anybody here spends or has spent much time uh in the people's republic of china over the past 10 or so years but if you do and i did as a visiting professor at tsinghua for five years you can't help but notice how much Chinese television and cinema drama revolves around the war. Uh, but it's the war as understood in the uh, propaganda of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it, it's a war in which the CCP are the heroes, the Japan Japanese are the arch villains, the forces of the Republic of the Chinese Republic are the corrupt, nearly villains, and you will scarcely see any sign whatsoever of Western, of American support. It's an, it's an all Asian World War II that you see in these dramas. The other thing that's shocking about these uh, war dramas is how, how violent they are. I know that sounds like a slightly stupid observation, but their, their battle sequences go on and on and on in a way that a Western audience would actually find hard to take. So, to answer your question, an integral part of the propaganda of the CCP uh, depends on instrumentalizing a memory of the war that fits into an, a, harrit, an, a narrative of a hundred years of humiliation going all the way back to the, to the 1840s. And in that narrative, uh, there's barely any sense of, of the United States as an ally. On, on the contrary, it's almost absent from, from the script. The final point I'll make is that the Chinese leadership knows that Marxism-Leninism is an obsolescent ideology which it's extremely hard to revive amongst modern day Chinese. The theory itself tells you that they have a problem because if you believe Marxism-Leninism, then it can't be good to have created the largest bourgeoisie in the history of the world, which is what they've done 
since the 1980s. And the bourgeoisie, as Marx understood, and, and they know, always wants property rights. It may not care about democracy, but it wants its property to be protected from arbitrary confiscation. So the Chinese leaders know that there's a contradiction in their position on the basis of their own theory. And that's why nationalism becomes fundamental to maintaining the legitimacy of the regime. Because they've understood that the middle class, while it doesn't believe in Marxism, and it certainly doesn't believe in an egalitarian distribution of wealth, does believe in nationalism. So part of the challenge that we face as scholars of this extraordinary conflict is that there's an entirely different version of it being taught to a fifth of humanity. Entirely different. And we're partly at fault, because I think for many years, those who wrote about World War II neglected the China theater, underplayed the importance of Japan's initial incursion uh, into China uh, in 1931. And in writing War of the World, I tried to change that by giving almost equal weight to the war in Asia and arguing that, in fact, World War II began in Asia. But we have a long, long way to go before we find any common ground with our Chinese contemporaries. I will always be struck by the fact that whenever I get onto this subject, even with highly educated Chinese academics, there's a total non-meeting of minds because they have been taught from the very earliest age to think about the war in a way that is completely different from the way we think about it. Thanks for that excellent question. Next question to your right, towards the back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've been in the investment management business for over 50 years, and I've been witnessing uh, my own growing storm of concern for some of the points that you brought out. Uh, number one is the explosive debt that's been growing both in this country and around the world. Uh, number two, something that again makes people's uh, eyes roll, is the demographic trends around the world. And, and also, without insulting, I, I've had a career of fortunately uh, managing money for educated people, but I would argue at all levels of society, and I don't want to insult, insult people in this room, is that financial illiteracy is a growing crisis that is affecting all of the items that you talked about, and that we're in a period of historically low and, and constricted uh, interest rates that will not stay this level. And so again, all of these things combined, unless we at all levels, regardless of your political affiliation, unless we understand and become more economically and financially literate and understand uh, this and combine that with demographics that are unfavorable. You can't have growing debt and fewer people. So these are things that are, these are my growing storms uh, that I am very concerned about as a society. I share your concerns, but financial illiteracy is not really the fault of the financially illiterate. We've collectively taken the decision not to teach our kids about finance. We'll teach them about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but not the difference between nominal and real wages. Uh, we will teach them about anti-racism, but we won't teach them about uh, interest rates and what they signify. So we've decided to graduate people from high school in a state of almost total financial ignorance. And then we expect them to make decisions about mortgages, to make decisions about bank accounts even, with almost no understanding of the system that they find themselves in. That's what motivated me to write the book, The Ascent of Money. I had this sense that as the financial crisis approached, it would hit people completely uh, out of left field because people had no real understanding of the problems that were brewing at that time in the undercapitalized banks. I said earlier, military historians don't, don't like financial history. And I, I, I'm reminded of a conversation with the late Michael Howard at the time when I applied to be the Chichile Professor of the History of War at Oxford. And Michael, who was a great historian and a great military historian, said, but Neil, you're not really a historian of war. 
meaning you're not a military historian. And I said to him, you can't possibly write the history of World War II, or for that matter, the history of World War I, or for that matter, the history of the Napoleonic Wars, or for that matter, the history of any war, without understanding how the finances worked. Napoleon would have laughed at the idea that you studied war without regard for the sinews of war. And it seems to me that we're at another of these moments in our history when we need to recognize that there's a completely inseparable interdependence between our financial strength and our military strength. Years ago, when I was writing a book called Colossus, a book about American power on the eve of the Iraq war, I realized that there was a kind of simple rule. And the rule is that when any great power or empire is spending more on servicing its debt than on defense, then it's in trouble. This was a very uh, clear sign of the Ottoman Empire's impending decline. And there are many other examples that one could cite. Britain, by the end of World War II, was in a position uh, of clear fiscal dominance, where there were simply no resources available to support overseas commitments as the debt had reached such a colossal size and much of it was held by foreign creditors. The United States is in a much more financially vulnerable position today than Britain in 1938. And that is because Britain in 1938 had accumulated very large overseas assets. Its net international investment position was massively positive. In other words, the world owed Britain a lot more than Britain owed the world. That is not true of the United States today. Its net international investment position is very strongly negative. So the United States is in fact highly vulnerable, as you said, sir, to any really quite modest rise in interest rates because of the short maturity of the entire federal debt and the heavy reliance we have to finance ourselves on a combination of the Federal Reserve and the kindness of strangers. And this is, if I achieve anything tonight, what I want to achieve, to, to make the historians of war understand that the movements of armies, the movements of planes and of battleships cannot be understood separately from the movements of gold, of bonds, of the price uh, of equities. These things are part of the same story. World War II was total war. World War I was the first total war and World War II was the second. And in total war, all of society is at war. You made the point about demographics. The only consolation I can offer you when I think about this question is the population of China is shrinking very fast. It is destined to fall by between 20 and 50% by the end of this century. The one-child policy will undermine China's power and there's nothing they can do about it. Whereas the United States has a superpower, which is that it imports talent. And as long as the United States continues to import talent, it will win. That's, that's the crux of the matter. Legal immigration, the attraction of talent to this great country, I'm just one of the lucky beneficiaries of the fact that you, can't, you can become an American citizen no matter where you were born, no matter how funny your accent is, no matter what strange things you may believe about the history of World War II, you can become an American. Who wants to become a Chinese citizen in any given year? Fewer people than would fit into this room. Who wants to become an American citizen? A vast proportion of the people in the world would love to become Americans. And that's why the demographics will turn out okay. Next question. I find your comparison of the old British Empire and the American Empire to be fascinating and disturbing. But a hundred years later, there's a major military factor that wasn't existing then and I'm talking about nuclear weapons. If Churchill had managed to rally the rest of Europe to oppose Hitler moving into Czechoslovakia, it's well documented. There were a group of German generals that were going to arrest him. 
and they were left helpless when uh, they caved in. How, how do you see that? I, I don't see that kind of thing happening with China or Iran or anybody else. How do you see the nuclear weapons as playing into this with all of this great economic insights you've given us? The fascinating thing about nuclear weapons is that we only use them once. The oddest thing about the Korean War is that we opted not to use them when we could have won it. That was MacArthur's great objection and the reason that Truman fired him. The United States successive presidents were so horrified by what Hiroshima and Nagasaki looked like after the bombs were dropped that a, a restraint formed. And that restraint has bound us till this day. Writing the biography of Kissinger took me to read his extraordinary 1957 book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, in which Kissinger says, we have to have some way of using these weapons in a limited nuclear war, because otherwise the choice is between Armageddon or capitulation. And in the end, that became NATO doctrine in Europe. That was what all those tactical short-range and intermediate-range nuclear forces were for. If there had been a war over Europe at any point, for example, in the early 80s, if it had happened at any point really after, let's say, uh, the era of, of brinkmanship in the early 1960s, we would have tried to fight it with limited use of nuclear weapons. But I have no idea, and nobody else does, if it would have succeeded. Nobody to this day knows if a limited nuclear war is possible. And we have the same conundrum now as China rapidly builds its nuclear arsenal. China used to have a pitiful and small nuclear arsenal. It will be very, very quickly in a position to match American capability, just in the way that the Soviets caught up. They're building nuclear silos and missiles at a frightening rate. And that means that we find ourselves, soon will find ourselves, in exactly the predicament that the United States found itself in uh, in the 1960s, with the Soviet Union gaining ground and the risks of nuclear war proportionately rising. When I said Cold War I has been followed by Cold War II, I'm inspired by the fact that we call World War II World War II. I mean, World War I and World War II were different. We all know that. But it's completely intuitive that we call them World War I and World War II. The phrase, the First World War, was used before the Second World War broke out. We're in Cold War II now, I have no doubt. Joe Nye is raving, with all due respect to the great Harvard professor. We're in denial that we're in Cold War II, just as we were in denial in the early part of Cold War I. Let me give you an example. In 1945, the phrase Cold War was used for the first time. Can anybody tell me who used it? Who was the first person to coin the phrase Cold War? It was not Churchill. It was not Eisenhower. It was Orwell. A prize to the man who got the, uh, got the answer Right, first drink at the bar to you, sir. <laughs> because most people don't know that. Some people think it was Walter Lippmann. It was Orwell, and it's in an essay in 1945 in the Tribune. And he defines Cold War as a peace that is no peace. It's an incredibly brilliant piece of writing. It, it became the basis for 1984 later. Almost nobody accepted the point. And when Churchill came to Fulton, Missouri and made his famous lecture about the Iron Curtain, the New York Times criticized him as a warmonger. Can you believe that? We forget. That speech was not popular when it was first given. The coverage in the American media was negative. They thought Churchill was just coming to try and drum up support for the British Empire and another war. So, we are in the same predicament now. We don't want to believe that we're in Cold War II. We are. It began some years ago. It's been China's policy, certainly since Xi Jinping became leader, and it creates, because of nuclear weapons, exactly the same problems of the early Cold War, the first Cold War. Namely, 
that war risks far greater devastation than it did, even in 1914, even in 1939, even in 1941. I'll do short answers from now on. <laughs> we'll get to a couple more before the end of the program. Uh, Neil, I've read your early books uh, as an Anglophile. I was uh, disturbed uh, of many of the things you said about the place that I thought had done such importance for the world. But following you for a number of years, I know that you've, you've hit it right down the middle. So, the kind of dark cloud that you've exposed tonight that sits upon America, how does America get out of it? Is it something that we can do gradually, or does it take a cataclysmic act at some point to awaken the nation? That is the question. That is the key question. Do we have to suffer? another Pearl Harbor, or another 9-11, or some other cataclysm of which we can't quite imagine. Imagine a cyber cataclysm. My great fear is that the next war will be a war between the United States, some of its allies, and China and Russia. And we won't be sure that it's a war because the internet will go down and the cell phones will stop working and the critical infrastructure will crash, but there'll be no war. Everything will just stop working. And we won't even be able to communicate with one another to say, what kind of a cataclysm is this? That's, that's my fear. And I think, for that reason, to avoid a cataclysm, we need urgently to learn the right lessons from what went wrong last year. Because I see us learning the wrong lessons. The right lesson, and this is the central argument of my most recent book, Doom, is that our public health bureaucracy failed in the way that our financial regulators failed in 2008, in the way that our national security system failed after 9-11. We have a problem of public sector bureaucratic failure. 36-page pandemic preparedness plans produced 2018, certified as the best in the world in 2019, disintegrated on contact with the novel pathogen in 2020. That's the story of, of the last two years. And somewhere, I'm absolutely sure, in the Pentagon, there's a 36-page cyber attack preparedness plan. And I'll bet you it works just as well. <laughs> so we need to... We need to take a leaf out of Churchill's book. What was noble about Churchill was that he applied history and he was unafraid to be, unafraid to be unpopular. We need leaders with that commitment to the lessons of history and that readiness, that courage to say what people don't want to hear. I used to play my students at Harvard recordings of unpopular Churchill speeches. Churchill's speeches from 1938 when he would be heard out in silence. The speeches when Nancy Astor would interrupt to shout rubbish, even although Churchill was saying things that turned out to be entirely right. So we, we need a different kind of leadership. We can't risk the questions of national security being left to people with no values, no sense of history, and a belief that ultimately politics is a kind of reality television show. This is not a partisan point because I see the same phenomena on both sides. <laughs> my hope, and I'll say one last thing, my hope is that somebody with a military background, somebody who served in those long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, those wars that have left us with such a bitter taste in our mouths, somebody with that experience of public service comes forward soon and brings us the kind of leadership that we seem entirely to lack at the moment. And I see that coming. I see it in Congress. I see a new generation of American leaders, Democrats and Republicans, and it gives me hope. It's why events like this matter. 
We're not studying World War II because we're deeply interested in the hardware that the Wehrmacht deployed on the Eastern Front, though I know some people who do find that kind of interesting. <laughs> we're studying World War II because it is the most important lesson that this country can learn. The lesson that Britain failed twice to deter the Germans. Failed twice to deter them from taking an enormous strategic risk that ultimately destroyed Germany, but also caused massive destruction around the world. And I sense that the real analogy here, the one I'm trying to convey to you, is that the United States is where Britain was, and China is where Germany was. And a Cold War would be a good outcome. That would be a good result. The fear I have is the hot war. The fear I have is that we end up in the hot war, just as we did in 1950. People forget that the Cold War was hot. And we fought China over Korea in 1950. And by the way, going back to the point about propaganda, that is central to a lot of Chinese popular culture today. And the language of the leadership increasingly echoes the language of the Korean War in the early 1950s. Shall I take one more question and then we're all going to need a drink? That was something that Churchill also believed in, by the way. He was once asked, this is one of my favorite lines from Andrew Roberts' brilliant biography, which you should all read. A young American asked him late in his life, Mr. Churchill, uh, if I want to go into politics, what, what advice would you give me? And Churchill replied, drink steadily. <laughs> Which is a great line. To your right, halfway back with Connie. Yes, sir. Uh, to what extent do you think pandemics alter and or increase a developed nation's tolerance for total war? That is a very good question. I think this pandemic, not so much, because unlike almost every pandemic I've studied, this was an ageist pandemic. It discriminated against the elderly. That's very strange. We've never seen anything like that before because the great influenza pandemics of the 19th and 20th century were as likely to kill the very young as the very old. And some of them, like 1918, 19, killed people in the prime of life. I'm sure you all are familiar with the fact that the 1918-19 so-called Spanish influenza killed more people than World War I itself and killed more American servicemen than combat did. So I think COVID-19 is not a pandemic that has in any way steeled us for conflict. On the contrary, it's created, particularly among young Americans, a rather strange sense of fragility. This is what some of my friends call safetyism. I see this uh, all around me at the Stanford campus. Young people, vaccinated, cycling around with masks on. And I ask myself, what possible good is that mask doing, given that this virus is almost never transmitted outside and you're on a bicycle? <laughs> so I have a sense that in a weird way, despite the mind-blowing numbers, five million dead worldwide. The Economist says it's four times that number, so let's call it 19 or 20 million dead if you buy the idea that there's been a great deal of underestimated death. Despite these very large death tolls, A, we're talking about 0.2 something percent of global population, even if it's 20 million people. B, they were mostly elderly. C, it's not something that young people have interpreted in any way as they were supposed to. You might remember, this is an appropriate note on which to end. At the beginning of the pandemic, a number of leaders, including Boris Johnson, who claims to know about Churchill, <laughs> tried to argue that it was a war and we needed the spirit of the Blitz or the spirit of, of the war to combat the pandemic. And that didn't work. It actually didn't work with the public in the slightest. In a funny way, I think it's exposed a new kind of vulnerability in our societies. 
If one looked at polling data, it was young people who were more risk averse and more in favor of lockdowns than old people who were more vulnerable to the virus. And I still struggle to understand why that was. I asked my mother, she's 84, and she remembers World War II. She was a little girl when her father, uh, my grandfather, was gone for years, somewhere in Asia, occasional letters. So I said, well, why, why, how do you think about this? And she was so impatient with lockdowns, so impatient with the restrictions imposed in her life, despite the fact that at 84, she was clearly a good deal more vulnerable than I was, and certainly than her grandchildren. And I came to the conclusion that the generation that went through World War II had a pretty low opinion of COVID-19 as a disaster. They really didn't rate it. Kissinger, who fought at the Battle of the Bulge with uh, courage, was very reluctant to believe me when I told him that a pretty bad pandemic was happening and he probably shouldn't go to New York. So this is the thing that I'm left with. Those who fought in the war, and there are a few still left who remember, have a completely different sense of risk from those who've been born more recently, who regard hate speech in college, outside the safe space, as requiring a trigger warning. I mean, how pathetic have we become? And that's why I say that the Chinese watch the decadence that's on show in our universities. They look at it and they think, these people are finished. And that was exactly what the Germans thought after the Oxford Union debate of 1933. We proved them wrong, but we proved them wrong in the most expensive way we could have. And my message to the United States is, don't make that mistake Deterrence, credible deterrence, beats war all day long. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Ferguson, thank you for that. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, a very sobering lecture. No wonder we need to take up drink because uh, after that, I think uh, we're, we're sobered by that. Uh, what it leaves us with this incredible uh, sense that we need to really dive in and understand the Second World War, but the post-war international order uh, that resulted from that and the dangers to that, and that the, the war itself, uh, the war years provide us, uh, even if it's imperfect, and uh, a framework for understanding, to understand the dangers, uh, to understand the responsibilities we have, and to determine are we uh, much like uh, Great Britain in the 30s at an inflection point uh, that, uh, that if we don't take action uh, will be uh, 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 dangerous for the, for the Republic. So a very cautionary tale. Thank you for, for that. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, Great food for thought for the group here uh, as we move forward, uh, not only with this international conference, but also as we move toward the future. And, uh, you know, I think that's part of our responsibility as well. You know, what does the war mean and how do we preserve that uh, for future generations? Uh, after we conclude here, I would invite all of you to join uh, Dr. Ferguson uh, at the bar, I mean at the book signing uh, station. <laughs> outside in the ballroom. Uh, you know, for the folks, uh, check your programs uh, for tomorrow's schedule. Uh, you'll notice we, we kick off tomorrow at uh, 0830. So, you know, synchronize your watches. You know, that'll be, we'll cross the line of departure then, uh, but at a different time each day, just, uh, just to keep everybody on their toes. Uh, but uh, with that, you know, please join me in an extremely warm thank you to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, for this, this evening.
and so to everyone, uh, I, can't, I can't mimic the Churchill voices, but uh, Godspeed uh, and good night. Thank you very much.